Honourable members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Order. At the previous sitting, the first two divisions deferred in accordance with standing orders 133 were called on the questions that the members for Moncrief and Cowper be no longer heard. I do not propose to proceed with these divisions as they are redundant and otiose, given that they have no effect. The member for North Sydney. On indulgence, Mr um, Speaker, uh, this il illustrates the farce that was Friday's sittings, given that the members would have been entitled to continue speaking, given that the divisions are not being put. Order. In accordance with Standing Order 133, I shall now proceed to put the question on the motion that the member for North Sydney be no longer heard, on which a division was called for, <laughs> on which a division was called for and deferred in accordance with the Standing Order. No further debate is allowed. The bells shall now be rung. If the leader of the Nationals is seeking the call, I will allow him to come to the dispatch box and seek a clarification. I'll ask the question on the record then uh, as to why this one is being uh, put to the vote when the two previous ones, I think quite wisely, you decided not to do so. It is obvious right, that— The uh, leader of the Nationals resume his seat. I thank him for the question. The reason, that, the reason that those divisions are otios is that the time allotted for the suspension of standing orders, being the 25 minutes, has well and truly expired, whereas this motion was, regrettably for me, based on a motion dissenting from a ruling from the chair, which does not have such a time limitation.
don't know, are the bells ringing? <laughs> It's Lock the doors. The question is that the member for North Sydney be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Riverina and Ryan tell us for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 79, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. In accordance with Standing Order 133, I shall now proceed to put the question on the motion that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard, on which a division was called for and deferred in accordance with the Standing Order. No further debate is allowed. The bell shall now be rung for one minute. Uh, I appoint the same Tellers. Members must remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber. Well, they did not vote in the previous division or they are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question before the House is that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. Members must have remained in their seat unless they were changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they should have reported to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is ayes 75, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Order. In accordance with Standing Order 133, I should now proceed to put the question on the motion that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from, on which a division was called for and deferred in accordance with the Standing Order. No further debate is allowed. The bells shall now be rung for one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina Tallers for the ayes, and the honourable members for Werriwa and Shortland 
tell us for the nose. One less here, Corporal walked out. Yeah, head up. Order. The result of the division is ayes 57, noes 75. The question is therefore negative. Order. In accordance with Standing Order 133, I shall now proceed to put the question on the motion that the member for Moncrief be suspended from the service of the House, on which a division was called for and deferred in accordance with the Standing Order. No further debate is allowed. The bells shall now be rung for one minute. The The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, uh, on indulgence. On Mr. indulgence. Speaker, just to provide clarity for the Hansard recording of this moment, the member for Moncrief was, I understand, suspended from the House under section 94F. Uh, and in fact, it was the uh, uh, one of our own members that moved, that pointed out that the member should be named. And I do point out that in this case the member for Moncrief and, uh, and the member for Cowper are, under Farcical Friday rules, effectively Order. being suspended from the House for 48 hours, 48 hours because in deference to the Speaker they left the chamber at the appropriate time on the Friday have served 24 Order. hours, the, have not come back in. The honourable member will resume his seat. Order! Lock the doors. The question is that the member for Moncrief be suspended from the services of the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Werriwa and Shortland tell us for the ayes, and the member for Riverina and Ryan tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 79, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member is therefore suspended from the services of the House for 24 hours under, under Standing Order 94D. Order. In accordance with Standing Order 133, I shall now proceed to put the question on the motion that the member for Cowper be suspended from the service of the House, on which a division was called for and deferred in accordance with the Standing Order. No further debate is allowed. The bell shall now be rung for one minute. I appoint the same tellers. Members must remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber or they did not vote in the previous division or they are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. The member for North Sydney. Again, on indulgence, Mr Speaker, in deference to you. The member is effectively serving a 48-hour penalty uh, under a 24-hour provision. Indicates what a farce the Friday was. Members should have remained in their seats unless they are changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they should have reported to the tellers.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 79, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member for Cowper is therefore suspended from the services of the House for 24 hours under Standing Order 94D. The Leader of the House. I ask the House to move a motion relating to business prior to 2 p.m. for this sitting. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Leave I move the, the government business orders of the day have priority prior to 2 p.m. for this sitting. Order. The question is that government business orders of the day have priority prior to 2 p.m. for this sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Amendment 2008 Measures No. 1 Bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Order. With those members leaving the chamber, do so quickly and quietly, and those remaining in the chamber, do so quietly. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Member for Kalgoorlie in continuation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, previously, I had pointed out uh, the justification for this bill and the realistic need to close the gap between the standard of education achieved by Indigenous children in community schools versus the standards achieved by mainstream students. And the reasons for this bill are quite obvious. There exists a huge gap, a great disparity. But why is it so? Is it to do with the quality of teachers? Is it to do with the availability of teachers? I suspect not. I suspect it's much greater than that. And in fact, this bill being, is, is being put up as an attempt to better resource education facilities in communities when in fact that is not the great problem. Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the real problem is the fact that we are trying to put a square peg in a round hole. The quality of education achieved by community children is poor because they simply don't attend those educational institutions. And the primary reason for that, I believe, is that they see no justification for gaining an education because there is no example set for them of the benefits of employment, the benefits of an enhanced self-esteem that comes through financial independence as a result of holding down a job. They see no example of what we loosely term the Christian work ethic these days. And why is that so, you might ask? Well, I will assert that it is simply because in mainstream Australia, we are so well accustomed to the connection between place of residence and employment. We live where we live because we can be employed in proximity to where we live. And we gain that self-esteem through the employment, the wages we receive. When you cast about regional and remote Australia and observe the location of indigenous communities, the commonality there is that they are not located adjacent to industry, sites of industry. Unfortunately, on so many occasions, they are not enriched with resources, mineral deposits, petroleum, etc. So we have an artificiality right from the start. We have this Australian parliament, this current government, putting up a bill to improve the teacher resource in institutions where there is, on the most basic concept, almost no justification for education. Certainly, most certainly, that is the perception of Indigenous parents. Why send my child to school 
when the education it receives will be meaningless because there are no jobs. Now, in Indigenous Business Australia has been established for a very long time, and a number of Indigenous businesses have been resourced with seed funding, created with all of the, uh, the boxes ticked in relation to the formation of a business, uh, projected cash flows, etc., etc. But how often do we see an abject failure in the business proposed? How often do we see that the targets theorised about are never met? How often do we see that the administration process is put in place for the running of that business fail? How often do we see that heads are turned when it comes to the failure of that business? So I say to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we are trying to put a round peg in a square hole because we are talking about the level of education being produced by community schools without looking at the major reason for education not being valued in communities. And we must, we must therefore question the whole issue of the existence of communities where there is no justification for them. And some of you may say shock horror is the member for Kalgoorlie proposing that there are today communities being funded that should not be funded or there's no justification for funding. Yes, I am. And I ask the question, is this government prepared to constantly go to the taxpayer of this nation and say, we are going to keep pouring your tax dollars into communities that cannot be justified? And there is no end point in sight where that funding can be justified in communities where there is no number of inhabitants that will create meaningful service industries, where the community is located so far from any source of genuine employment, where the community as it is at the end of the track, wandered by no one except lost tourists and the people that live there. Now, the purists will say that everyone has the right to live where they want to live in Australia. And that is the case right across my vast electorate in Western Australia. Remember, it's 2.3 million square kilometres. I see it all. And there are so many, many communities that cannot be justified except that people are being funded to live where they want to live. But even that base statement I question. So often the members are, of those communities are not living where they want to live. They are living where they have been coerced to live because of a particular community leader who is wanting to bolster his numbers to justify his leadership in the community and the cash flow from government that allows him to maintain his or her leadership. And what so many members of communities, remote communities that are unsustainable, really want is jobs. They want a future. They want a future today, tomorrow, for themselves, for their children. They want sustainability. They want employment. They don't want to be seen to be living in a remote location with their families, but to gain the self-respect that comes from employment, having to travel hundreds of miles to employment on a temporary basis, leaving their families be behind able to be predated by, on by those who would create the, it, 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 carry out those acts that have been so clearly demonstrated in Little Children, a sacred report. So, Madam Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I put the proposition that this bill, which of course I support in principle because we do need more teachers everywhere, but I put it to you that this is but a tiny step. And I say to you that it is almost a misplaced step. Because the, one of the major reasons today that in these unsustainable communities children are not attending school, as I've said, is because their parents don't value education because there is no employment. But worse than that, 
So many children enrolled in these community schools do not have a condition that is conducive to attending school. They are often malnourished in the true sense of the word. They are sleep deprived. There is no home environment that encourages them to take part in the educational system. And I refer to something that mainstream accepts as a norm, homework. Imagine, if you will, a student from a community school being allocated homework and going home to their residence and even having the remotest expectation that they might get parental guidance in an environment that was conducive to doing homework. It's out of the question. And yet we talk about imposing mainstream values, conditions and achievements on Indigenous community schools. If we really wanted to solve the problem, if this government was prepared to go genuinely to the taxpayer and say we are going to represent this percentage of the population ad infinitum with your dollars and create high standards of education comparable with those achieved in mainstream across Australia, then the first thing that ought to happen is that we ought to put in place some control as we would have in normal mainstream communities. And I refer to effective law enforcement. It's not done. The only presence that might be vaguely referred to as effective law enforcement may visit on a six-weekly basis overnight. And everyone in the community knows when that's going to occur. And if you can suggest to me that this is effective deterrent for some of the abhorrent acts that are carried out in these communities that we all know about or are supposed to know about, there's a very valid report being printed, then uh, I will take much more convincing than that. The truth is that, uh, especially in the areas of uh, uh, child sexual offences, that the perpetrators go bush when there's any law enforcement going to visit the community. And those that have, the acts have been perpetrated against, if any adults do know of the, uh, of the uh, illegal uh, act, uh, they, are, they are frightened into silence because of the retribution that will be carried out by the perpetrator once that 24-hour period is finished and the law enforcement agency has moved on. So if we're fair dinkum about making a change in the standards of education achieved in remote communities, the very first thing this government ought to be doing right across Australia is calling on their state governments of a similar political conviction to join with them in solving this problem to achieve the outcome. Resource these remote communities in a manner that sees an effective police presence in a sustainable manner. And that means at least two people at any one time. It means accommodation for those persons and their families. It means communications and transportation and an environment that is reasonable enough to expect members of the police force to live in with their families. There are schools, and we're talking about a $7 million plus per annum simply for another 50 teachers in the Northern Territory. $7 million. If we really wanted to solve the problem, we'd spend $7 million in one jurisdiction on creating some houses that could accommodate a police force that was effective, that could maintain social order, that would see children sleeping in their beds at night instead of hiding elsewhere away from their home. They would see them well fed and well clothed. They would see them enjoy a home environment that was conducive to carrying out homework and those normal activities that we associate with the students in mainstream Australian schools that do achieve a reasonable level of education. Now, I pointed out that I, uh, I have uh, a very large electorate and uh, you could correctly assume that I have a very large number of uh, remote communities. I visit them. I see these things. And for members of this House to be ignorant as to the conditions that exist in those communities. Uh, I invite them 
to uh, contact me and I will arrange visits. But we do need, before we go off on a tangent, focusing our efforts wholly on more teachers for these existing schools, we need to focus on all of the other problems. And I've raised the question whether the schools, the communities themselves, ought even be there in the long term. Because what so many people in these communities want is to be elsewhere where they can enjoy the whole experience of being Australian. And they certainly cannot do that today living in these communities. And there are so many forces brought to bear upon them to make sure that they live in that community. But they are torn. They are torn between, in many cases, wanting a future for their children because they have had a sniff of mainstream life in town where jobs, where, where relatives have employment, but they're dragged back to the community in every sense because the leader of that community needs the numbers residing in that community to attract the funding from government so as to maintain their position of authority. And if you seriously ask yourselves why these people live where they live, it is simply because somebody has told them that that was their country, that they have an attachment to it naturally, and they ought to come back and occupy that country because there is such a thing called native title. And one day they will all be very, very wealthy because they have gone to the trouble of returning to country. I might add often very little personal effort because there is these days a great support from the government to get people back onto country. But I suggest to you it's a philosophical ideal and it's not very practical. And when we have something that is based on romantic philosophy, and then we recognise the pitfalls of it in practice. We then cast our mind in an opposite direction and say the standards of education achieved in these artificial communities are not up to scratch. We have got to get millions of dollars and put into that community to lift the education standard. Why? There's no jobs. Are we going to turn out university professors? Are we going to build a university in the community so that they can all be lecturers on language, for instance? It is, it is a practical nonsense. We are trying to throw money at a problem in an effort to solve it with no concept of what the real problem is. And the justification of fixing the problem is surely because it's sustainable. Well, it's not sustainable. If you want to build these communities in an environment where they're real, you have to have jobs. So the philosophy ought to have been find a justification for industry, for productivity, create job training to put people into jobs, then look to the success of those individuals because those individuals will have a full life in an environment that is sustainable rather than an artificially sustained situation simply with the input of taxpayers' dollars via government. I call the member for Fisher. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to commend the Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie for his uh, very erudite and thought-provoking speech in relation to Indigenous education in remote parts of Western Australia and, more specifically, his electorate of Kalgoorlie. I'm pleased that right across the parliament we do have this uh, sense of wanting to do something about the plight of our Indigenous people. And while I don't always agree with the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, I do commend her for the comments that she made uh, in her speech when she said we have to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. And then she referred to the Prime Minister's uh, commitment uh, with respect to closing the gap in life expectancy and educational achievement. Uh, and employment opportunities, uh, a commitment to halve the gap in literacy, numeracy and employment outcomes and opportunities for Indigenous uh, Australians uh, within a decade and also the Prime Minister's commitment to halve the gap in infant mortality rates and life expectancy within a generation. It seems to me that we have collectively thrown money at the problem over the years. It's almost as though uh, we 
are focused on process at times rather than outcome. It's almost as though we're trying to solve the nation's collective conscience by throwing money at the problem instead of looking at improved outcomes for Indigenous people. The opposition doesn't oppose uh, this bill, which is before the chamber, as was indicated by the shadow minister. However, we do have some concerns about it. We do worry because it appears to be a piecemeal approach. And while, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, 50 extra teachers was obviously a step in the right direction, I would ask the Deputy Prime Minister, who I think is deep down is a very reasonable person, to consider the point made by the member for Kalgoorlie in a bipartisan way when he referred to uh, a lot of these communities which don't seem to have any real purpose for existence. I'm not sure whether the member for Kalgoorlie is right or not, but I do think that it's something I do think that it's something that really ought to be looked at because we have finite resources, we want to redress indigenous disadvantage as much as we can. And quite some time ago, when I was chairman of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Family and Community Affairs, we sought from then Minister Wooldridge uh, a reference into Indigenous health. And I thought it was appalling that the gaps between the life expectancy of Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians were so wide. And 10 years down the track, or more, the gap has not reduced. And so we've spent lots of money uh, on Indigenous affairs, and I don't begrudge the money we're spending, but I do regret that from the point of view of the community, particularly the Indigenous <coughs> community, we don't seem to be achieving the outcomes. Now, I do, uh, I'm aware that this bill uh, is to uh, partly uh, uh, bring in uh, an election promise that was made uh, by the then opposition, the now government, and I do commend uh, the fulfilling of election promises, because I think that one of the problems we have in Australia is this sense of lack of alienation or, or lack of association, a sense of alienation from the political process where people think that politicians are cynical people who are prepared to do anything and say anything to crawl into office, and then once they get elected, uh, they seem to lose the commitment to their promises. And I do commend uh, the government on bringing in this particular uh, bill, uh, but I am wondering whether uh, it was necessarily a well thought out promise. Uh, and I would hope that the government looks at what the previous government has done because neither side of politics, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, has a monopoly on good ideas and common sense. Uh, no one uh, has a monopoly uh, on good intentions. No one has a monopoly on doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And I'm not for a moment suggesting uh, through you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Deputy Prime Minister is suggesting that she does have a monopoly on compassion. But what we need to do, of course, is, is to do whatever has to be done to redress Indigenous disadvantage while at the same time making sure that the Indigenous community actually achieves, um, uh, achieves positive outcomes. I believe that uh, uh, there was, uh, prior to the Howard government's election to office, uh, a move away from focusing on outcomes uh, towards focusing on process, and that so often we gave to Indigenous groups uh, the ability to self-determine how funding would be spent or where it should be spent. But we we're all appalled by many of those stories where unscrupulous non-Indigenous bureaucrats came in, uh, spoke uh, and, and made decisions for people who weren't, uh, didn't have adequate experience, regrettably, to make these sorts of decisions, with the result uh, occurring that uh, there was a vast uh, waste of money. And that then created the political environment for someone like Pauline Hanson to come into the political uh, scene. She spoke about waste, she spoke about theft, she spoke about fraud, and she did for a while obtain strong support from some sections of the community. We ought never, while wanting to empower Indigenous people, lose sight of the fact that what we need is an improvement in Indigenous outcomes. By all means, have your self-determination on the way through if that is a better means of attaining outcomes, but I would hate to think that we are spending huge amounts of money on the one hand 
uh, focusing on process and in doing so forgetting the real purpose for these programs. The real purpose of these programs is to, uh, is to remove Indigenous disadvantage. I would love to see an Australia Deputy Prime Minister where Indigenous and non-Indigenous are absolutely sort of equal in every respect with respect to opportunity, with respect to success in business, with respect to education. And I know that's uh, an aspiration uh, obviously shared by all of us. And where we differ at times is on the way that we actually get to that very desirable outcome. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, the, uh, the former government uh, did quite a lot in relation to Indigenous education, in particular uh, the upskilling of uh, teacher aides uh, to become fully qualified teachers. And the purpose uh, we wanted to achieve that, of course, was to uh, give uh, increased uh, educational opportunity. And my understanding is that the former government gave uh, up to $30 million to the Northern Territory government for this purpose. Uh, and we're not quite sure at the present time uh, whether the current government will uh, continue uh, that process, particularly given uh, the fact that the, former gov that, that the current government uh, is now uh, reviewing its former pledge to uh, abolish uh, CDEP. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, this, uh, ma this uh, bill before the House is, uh, is fair enough as far as it goes. And I do hope that those 50 teachers, at a cost of over $7 million, uh, will assist in educating and upskilling Indigenous uh, children in remote communities. I would reiterate my request that the Deputy Prime Minister consider the point that was made quite reasonably uh, by the member for Kalgoorlie, that we really ought to look at whether these communities, or some of them, uh, ought to exist. Obviously many of them should and maybe there are a few uh, or some that shouldn't. And I think that's something that the government ought to look at and I know that the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, being a reasonable person, uh, will in fact consider that because, let's face it, we simply can't go on as we are. Uh, we've been in this country now for more than two centuries. Uh, uh, we find that uh, uh, Indigenous Australia is probably as badly off as it ever has been. The former government, of course, had lots of very positive policies in the area of practical reconciliation, but I just think that we need to move forward uh, as a parliament, as a community, to try and erase uh, those uh, elements of Indigenous disadvantage which continue. We need to focus on outcome rather than process uh, and uh, as a small step uh, towards uh, a successful outcome, the Coalition does support the bill currently before the Chamber. The Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Education. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I won't take long in uh, summing up this debate, and the matter before the House uh, can be uh, therefore dealt with before question time. Uh, obviously, the opportunity has been taken by some members to raise uh, issues further afield and broadly on uh, matters associated with Indigenous Australia during the course of the debate. Uh, I'm sure members will reflect on those contributions. But the uh, purpose of this bill, and it is an urgent measure, it is an immediate budget measure, is to ensure that we can fund additional teachers in the Northern Territory. Uh, as members of the parliament would be aware and members of the public more generally, uh, one of the things that has happened as part of the Northern Territory emergency response is that a number of measures have been put in place to increase school attendance. That is to ensure Indigenous students who have never been enrolled in school are enrolled in school and also to ensure that Indigenous students who have only intermittently attended school attend schools more regularly. And it would obviously be a great tragedy uh, if those uh, Indigenous students were to come to school and not be met with the resources that are necessary for their education. And there is no more vital resource than a teacher being there, ready to receive, ready to teach and ready to facilitate the learning of those Indigenous students. And so, Mr Speaker, this bill is before the House to accomplish that purpose immediately, and I commend it to the House. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading. A bill for an act to amend the Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Act 2000 and for related purposes. Order. I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General recommending in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution 
an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Is there any objection to leave being granted for the third reading to be moved immediately? There being no objection, the Deputy Prime Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. Lucky guess. Order. <laughs> the question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Act 2000 and for related purposes. Being a risk taker, the member for North Sydney. <laughs> Just please, On indulgence, um, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, well, to assist the chair with uh, this. Um, Don't sing, issue. Danny Boy. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm just wondering if the uh, leader of government and business in the House could give us an indication on the new sitting schedule uh, sometime earlier than Friday, uh, given that a number of members. A number of members will probably have to change Order. flights. And, uh, the uh, Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, it's uh, intended that the motions to change standing orders would be put on notice uh, today so that the opposition would have uh, the full ability, the full, uh, ability to uh, peruse them. Um, included in, in, in that uh, tomorrow will be the new uh, sitting schedule. But all the arrangements will be that which was outlined in writing by myself to the Leader of the Opposition in a very well written letter last Friday. I saw that letter, it was a very good one. Order. Order. I inform the House of the death on Saturday, the 1st of March 2008, of Siegfried Emil Sid Spindler, a former senator. Mr Spindler represented the State of Victoria from 1990 to 1996. As a mark of respect to the memory of Mr Spindler, I invite honourable members to rise in their places. I thank the House. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask Leave of the House to make a ministerial statement relating to uh, Australia's ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. Prime Speaker. Minister. Today marks an important step forward in building a modern Australia ready to face the challenges of the future. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges that Australia faces for the future. It's one of the greatest challenges that the world faces for the future. It's an immense economic challenge. It's an immense environmental challenge. It's an immense moral challenge as well, with its greatest impacts falling on those who can least afford it. No individual nation can solve the immense challenge of climate change alone. It requires the hard work of international engagement and cooperation. Mr Speaker, from today, Australia officially becomes part of the global solution on climate change, not just part of the global problem, because from today, Australia's ratification of Kyoto enters into force. After being sworn in as Prime Minister on December 3 last year, I signed Australia's instrument of ratification as the first act of the new government. I handed that instrument of ratification to United Nations Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon on December 12 in Bali. Under Kyoto rules, there's a mandatory 90-day waiting period before it comes into force. Those 90 days have passed. Australia's ratification of the Kyoto Protocol has now come into force today. Australia is now sending a clear signal 
to the world that we are taking responsibility when it comes to our global responsibilities, our national responsibilities on climate change. Ratifying Kyoto has put Australia back on the map. We have a full seat at the table. For the first time, we are a full negotiating partner in all key international forums. Mr. Speaker, one of the government's obligations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is to submit a report that demonstrates how Australia is able to measure the reductions in emissions that are required under Kyoto. The deadline for this report is 12 months from the date of ratification, that is 11 March 2009. The government is pleased to announce that we are submitting Australia's initial report under the Kyoto Protocol today, 11 March 2008, one year ahead of its deadline. I am tabling this report in the House today. The initial report outlines the measures we are using to calculate our emissions levels, and it also outlines the critical role of the national carbon accounting system in measuring emissions from land use, land use change and forestry. We have taken this step by announcing agreements to share this technology and system regionally and globally, all part of taking responsibility to help shape a global solution. Last week I visited our regional neighbour, Papua New Guinea, and discussed the challenge of climate change with Prime Minister Michael Samari. As part of the government's new Pacific Partnerships development, we will be embarking upon a PNG Australia forest carbon partnership. This will also involve assisting PNG in developing their carbon monitoring and accounting capacity to underpin participation in global carbon markets. Australia's national carbon accounting system will be an important element of the forest carbon partnership. The government has also announced a partnership with a range of international organisations, including the Clinton Foundation, to take the national carbon accounting system global. This reflects the kind of te technical leadership that Australia can provide in tackling climate change on a global level. Mr Speaker, I am also tabling a second report today, the Tracking to Kyoto Target 2007 report. This report reflects the fact that the policy commitments of this government will begin to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. By increasing the use of renewable energy, we will trigger much greater emissions reductions in the longer term than had been forecast in 2006 under the previous government. This report shows Australia's greenhouse gas emissions under this government's policy settings are now projected to be 108 per cent of the 1990 levels over the period from 2008 to 2012. This is equal to Australia's Kyoto target. Under the previous government's policy settings, the projections showed that Australia would be around 6 million tonnes off our target. This is equivalent to the annual emissions of around 1.2 million cars. We recognise that ratifying Kyoto was just one step, the first step, and much more needs to be done. The Australian government has a comprehensive plan for, reducing, uh, for responding to climate change based on three pillars reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, adapting to climate change that we can't avoid, and helping to shape a global solution. We will implement a system of emissions trading which will place a limit or a cap on the emissions we will allow to be produced. Emissions trading will make us responsible for the greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. We have also announced that 20 per cent of Australia's electricity supply will be sourced from renewables by 2020. But the COAG Working Group on Climate Change and Water is working to bring together state and federal renewable energy targets. A nationally consistent renewable energy target would stimulate much needed investment in clean energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We are committed to working towards a post-2012 agreement for addressing climate change and reaching an agreement on long-term global goals for emissions reductions. To support our efforts in the UN negotiations, the government is also working through the US-led major economies meetings process the climate change forums under the G8 and engaging in strategic bilateral dialogues with key countries. Mr Speaker, confronting the challenge of climate change is the challenge of our generation. It is an immense challenge. But with decisive action, we can turn challenge into opportunity. We've made a start, but there's a long way to go. We can be leader in our response to the threat of climate change, and by getting on the front foot, we can build a modern economy that seizes the opportunity of new low-carbon energy industries and technologies. Ratifying Kyoto was just the first step. This government is committed to taking responsibility by tackling climate change. Being part of the global solution to climate change is an important step forward in building a modern Australia.
capable of dealing with the challenges of the 21st century. And I present a copy of the report. The Leader of the House. Brendan. Brendan, is it you? Sorry. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion to enable the Leader of the Opposition to speak for six minutes. Is there any objection to leave being granted? Same to me. There being no, there being no objection, leave is granted. They give me the document. Minister. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition speaking for a period not exceeding six minutes. Yeah. Order. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, on behalf of the alternative government, the Opposition, I welcome Australia's formal ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, which comes into force uh, today. Climate change is real, it is important and it is fundamental. In that context, climate change presents us with two great challenges. Both are major but achievable challenges. First, to allow the poor of the world to develop and achieve the benefits of a modern economy and to encourage the continued improvement of health, freedom and prosperity in the already developed societies. The second is to progressively shift from a high emissions to a low emissions economy. Managing climate change will be one of the great challenges of our time. Indeed, it already is. It represents an important economic shift and will require a portfolio of responses. In Australia's case, we are moving toward the progressive pricing and the cost of carbon into the way our economy operates, and this will be essential to any agreement beyond 2012. This is big history in the making, as uh, the member for Flinders has observed perhaps the most significant economic decision in a generation. With such a profound change, we need to make sure that we get our policy responses right. For businesses and for households, the impact of climate change will be far-reaching and will present both major challenges and opportunities. By ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, Australia has committed to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to 108 per cent of 1990 levels by 2012. We are on track to meet the, this target thanks to the practical coalition government programs to fight climate change introduced over the last 12 years. These include the $500 million Low Emissions Technology Demonstration Fund, which leveraged over $3 billion in private sector investment for significant projects, including the world's largest carbon capture and storage project. More than $1 billion was invested to promote renewable energy, including nearly $18 million under the Advanced Electricity Storage Technologies Program, to look at more efficient ways of storing electricity from renewable power sources and an $8,000 rebate for Australians to install renewable solar energy in their homes, a very important and practical measure. On energy efficiency, the previous government led the world in announcing the phase-out of inefficient incandescent light bulbs that will produce greenhouse gas emissions by an estimated 4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year by 2015. The ratification of the Kyoto Protocol is important, but it will be meaningless if we do not also redouble our efforts to create a truly inclusive international agreement on climate change, one that commits all countries, developing and developed, to cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Australia's annual emissions are around 560 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, or around some 1.5 per cent of the total global emissions, which are around 40 billion tonnes every year. It's forecast that on current trends, Australia's emissions will be 1 per cent of global emissions by 2050. The develop developing world at the moment is 50 per cent of global emissions forecast on current trends to be 75 per cent by 2050. To put this into perspective, by 2050, China and India, without any change at one-third of total global emissions, will exceed that of the United States, Europe, Russia, Japan, Brazil, Canada and Australia all combined. We in Australia have an important role in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and preparing for the challenge of climate change. 
But any real solution to climate change must be global, and it must take in the world's biggest emitters, including the United States, China and India. Carbon does not respect borders. I urge the government to take seriously the damaging impact of deforestation on global greenhouse gas emissions. Deforestation in developing countries accounts for around 20 per cent of global greenhouse gas emissions. The Global Initiative for Forests and Climate, launched by the coalition government last year, was designed to immediately and practically reduce global deforestation and promote reforestation in developing countries in our region. I call on the government to commit to continuing this important program and provide practical steps to protect the world's great forests. A carbon trading scheme, as I said, is essential, an essential part of our post-Kyoto framework. The government uh, has also expressed concern about effectively addressing climate change, but ironically has refused to sell uranium to India, one of the largest and growing emitters of carbon throughout the world, needed, uh, needed for the development of its domestic power industry. Australia alone cannot save the world from climate change, but if we make the wrong decisions, we will cause irreparable damage to our children's economic and environmental legacy, and we have a responsibility to the next generation to know precisely what it is that we are signing them up for before we move further beyond Kyoto and the agreements beyond 2012. Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister really understand the anxiety that he and his government is causing to vulnerable carers? Will the Prime Minister give a guarantee to the 400,000 Australian carers that the annual lump sum payments will be delivered in the budget? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I give an absolute guarantee that those carers will not be a dollar worse off as a result of the budget. The, the member for Blair. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. What is the government doing to begin the important job of reducing the level of binge drinking in Australia? The Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for Blair for his question. Mr Speaker, binge drinking imposes a huge toll on the community. Uh, in any given week, studies uh, indicate that one in ten, that is 168,000 uh, young people aged 12 to 17, are binge drinkers and drinking at risky levels. I notice that the former Minister of Health thinks this is very funny, and given his remarks earlier today, I would suggest he regards this as not a marginal or minority Order. concern, but a real concern for the mainstream community. Order. Commonly defined as seven or more drinks for males and five or more for females, binge drinking is becoming a matter of widespread and legitimate concern in the Australian community. Order. Among 16 and 17 year olds, one in five are drinking at risky levels. Furthermore, young people aged 18 to 24 years have the riskiest drinking pattern, with almost two thirds drinking at risky levels for harm in the short term. Some may ask why is this necessarily a concern, given that we have drinking problems across the entire community. The answer lies in the fact that with adolescents, particularly in the age bracket 14 to 17, studies show that a drinking profile of this nature can result in considerably increased physical harm, which can be irreparable. Therefore, it is a legitimate matter of community concern. In addition to the objective evidence on the costs of binge drinking, there is the untold impact on families and communities across the country. The government is determined to work with the wider community and with parents and with young people themselves to tackle this problem. Strategy won't fix the problem overnight, but it's a solid first step. This will initially involve three measures to tackle binge drinking among our young people. First, I want to work with sporting and other non-government organisations to affect the environments that shape the culture of binge drinking among young people. The government is committing $14.4 million towards a grants-based program focused on binge drinking and to reduce it at the community level. I see this supporting particularly sporting codes and clubs in educating and informing club members about the harms associated with binge drinking. 
Second, the government will invest $19.1 million to support innovative early intervention and diversion programs to get young people under the age of 18 back on track before more serious alcohol-related problems emerge. These early intervention initiatives will involve a new emphasis on personal responsibility. They will target young people under the age of 18 who have been involved in an episode involving alcohol. Interventions supported could include requiring young people to participate in educational and or diversionary activities and allowing police to confiscate alcohol or provide formal warnings. When young people involved in binge drinking present to hospitals or fall foul of the law, the personal responsibility approach needs to be triggered. The government will endeavour to have at least one pilot project in each state capital operating by the end of 2008. Pilots would require community buy-in from states and other local governments, community and health organisations and local police. Third, the government will invest $20 million in a targeted television, radio and internet-based campaign to confront young people to confront young people with the costs and consequences of binge driving. This campaign will go through the appropriate approval processes of the new government to make sure that it is advertising not of a political nature but of a public health nature, a practice not engaged in by those who preceded us. Consistent with the government's election commitments, the public information campaign will be evidence-based and non-political. Mr Speaker, I welcome the positive community reaction to these initiatives, and today I inform the House as the next step I'll be taking to, I will be forming uh, very soon a uh, collaborative activity with the heads of, heads of sporting codes across Australia. This morning I spoke with Andrew Demetrio from the AFL, Prime Kate Minister Palmer from Netball seat. Australia. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Mackalla with a point of order. Mr Speaker, I would refer you to page 554 of the practice, which indicates, as you know, that although there is no specific power under the standing orders to require the minister to conclude shortly, there is discretion in the chair, which has been exercised by your predecessors, uh, where ministers are advised to wind up their uh, answers, because this is properly a statement that should be made after question time, and this rests in your hands, Mr. Speaker. I would ask you to, I would ask Order the you would, uh, of the House. ask him to shorten Order his answer. The honourable member will resume her seat. Chamber. The honourable member will resume her seat. Prime Minister will continue. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to next steps, uh, today I've held discussions uh, with the heads of the major sporting codes in Australia. I've spoken to Andrew Demetrio from the Australian Football League, Kate Palmer from Netball Australia, David Gallup from the National Rugby League, John O'Neill from the ARU, Ben Buckley from the Football Federation of Australia and James Sutherland from Cricket Australia. I've convened a meeting this Friday to discuss with them how the government will work with peak sporting bodies across Australia to tackle together the challenge of binge drinking, which is affecting young people. I've been joined in those discussions by the Minister for Health and the Minister for Support. Millions of Australian kids play sport. We believe that by engaging the peak sporting bodies in this fashion, we have a real opportunity to turn the corner on this problem which is confronting so many families, so many communities right across Australia. Order before calling the member for Warringah. And with fear and trepidation that I might affect Irish-Australian relationships in doing this straight after that question, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Irish Minister for Transport, Noel Dempsey, and the Irish Ambassador, His Excellency Martin O'Fainan. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The member for Warringah. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, will the Prime Minister give a guarantee to over two million seniors that the annual lump sum payment will be delivered in the coming budget. And I further ask, does the Prime Minister really understand the uncertainty and the anxiety he is causing to older Australians Order. by refusing to guarantee this bonus payment? The Prime Thanks very much, the Mr Prime Speaker. Minister in response to the Honourable the Member's question, I can guarantee that pensioners, when it comes to their one-off bonuses, will be no worse off under this budget. The member for Chisholm. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Will the minister explain the health impacts of binge drinking 
and why the government is taking action to combat it. The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for this question. I know that uh, the member for Chisholm, along with many others on this side of the house, and I must say, having listened to many of the first speeches on the other side of the house, I think that our concern for young people and the trends of binge drinking that so many of us have watched worryingly increase will be uh, something that many people across across the whole house will be worried about. And uh, the Prime Minister has taken the House already through the initiatives that were announced yesterday, but I think it's important that we spend a little bit of extra time just on the sort of impact that this can have on young people, because the binge drinking that we are talking about, we're not just talking about young adults here, we're talking about children in some instances, people be aged between 12 and 17, um, reporting that one in ten in this age group are regularly binge drinking. So this is hundreds of thousands of children and adolescents and young adults who are repeatedly causing this damage to their own bodies, uh, to their future health, and causing quite a lot of uh, cost and worry within the community. Of course we know, of course we know. Well, it's, it's appropriate for the interjections to be raised about middle-aged drinking as well, and it will be something, if the member wants to wait until I complete my answer, I will be able to deal with the questions that have been raised. We regard this as a very serious issue. We know that uh, alcohol, tobacco and obesity are the three biggest risk factors for three of the biggest killers in the country. Uh, whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, whether it's car accidents, whether it's increasing the race, rates of diabetes. And all of us in this House could do well to think about the way we might not only set good examples for young people, but also encourage other interventions which will help, which will help tackle this serious problem within the community. Now, we know that uh, some of the immediate health effects can be, of course, uh, loss of consciousness, fits, um, alcohol poisoning. We know the much more common diarrhoea, nausea, vomiting. But a lot of people don't know. Order. A lot of people are not aware of the long-term damage that can be caused to the small bowel, to the central nervous system, to the liver and the brain. This is a serious health problem. And for some reason, we have seen a massive increase in the number of young people who have taken this binge drinking on as their form of entertainment. We all need to be involved in finding the solutions. The government can do a certain amount. The communities who are already actively engaged and parents who fundamentally need Order, to be involved the member, in the you. way that we take and member, handle this issue. You. Mr Speaker, I have to say it staggers me that members opposite would think that this is an opportunity for derision. This is a serious health risk to many hundreds of thousands of young people Order. in the member, in the member for Hume's seat, in the shadow dejecting. minister's seat, in others. Order. Order. Oh, from you. Mem the minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Members opposite clearly are not aware that 72,000 hospitalisations every year occur as a direct impact of overconsumption of alcohol. That's not taking account of the presentations that result from the long-term effects of excessive consumption of alcohol. So let's understand how serious this problem is. The Rudd Labor government has committed three initial steps which we believe will make a difference. We want to work with parents and community leaders to help bring about change. And we are also going to work with states and territories to talk to them about the areas that they have responsibility for. And we uh, further in the coming weeks will announce our preventative health care task force, which has been tasked with prioritising the excessive consumption of alcohol, tobacco and obesity to look at the long-term changes we need to our health system to make sure that we are sending the message not just to our kids but to the whole community that this is a serious problem that needs to be dealt with. The member for Macpherson. Member. All right, the member for McPherson. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No. Second. Order. The member has Mr. the Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, can you confirm that your office has received seven letters from Mr. Ashley Norman of Walkerston regarding the carer's lump sum payment? 
Prime Minister, can you also confirm that your office has lost all seven letters? <laughs> Prime Minister, can you also Order. confirm that when Mr Norman phoned the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs Office on Friday, a senior adviser confirmed that the carer's bonus and allowance had been scrapped. Can you also confirm that when Mr Norman was put through to your office on Friday, one of your senior advisers confirmed that the carer's bonus and allowance had been scrapped? The order. The Prime Minister has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, on the first part of the honourable member's question, I'm unaware of that correspondence. I will seek Order. to see what correspondence has arrived. On the second, I have absolutely nothing to add in terms of my earlier answers. We would not have indicated to uh, a Order. constituent that these um, bonuses Order. were uh, under risk of being scrapped. That is not the case. To. Government policy is, government policy is as I have stated it. What is it? What is it? The member, the Order the member for North Sydney. The member for Blacksland. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the latest economic figures and what they say about the need for an economic agenda focused on productivity? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do thank the, uh, the member for his question. The December quarter national accounts released last week show that growth eased in the quarter, but it still remains very solid. Growth was 0.6 per cent in the December quarter, and it was 3.9 per cent over the year. And domestic demand continues to grow strongly. It's driven by strong growth in consumption. Domestic final demand rose by 1.6 per cent in the quarter to be 5.7 per cent higher for the year. Australia's net exports continue to weigh on growth, reflecting ongoing weakness in export volumes and strength in imports. This strong growth in imports is further evidence that domestic demand continues to outpace domestic supply, highlighting the importance of the government's supply-side policies. Mr. Speaker. Now, while domestic demand has been growing strongly, it has not been matched by increases in the economy's productive capacity. The national accounts show that productivity growth in the last year of the Howard Costello government was zero. Zero in the last year of the Howard Costello government. Now, Mr. Speaker, this reflects a pattern of long-term decline in Australia's productivity performance, with average productivity growth over the last five years lower than in any other equivalent period in the last 16 years. And, Mr. Speaker, this was precisely Order. at the time, precisely at this time, Order that Australia's productivity down. growth was declining, declining, underlying inflationary pressures in the Australian economy were building. Now, Mr. Speaker, these figures paint a valuable portrait of the economic landscape that we inherited. An economy Order. with strong demand, Mr. Speaker. Order. An economy with strong demand, but shackled by poor productivity growth and capacity constraints in the economy, Mr. Speaker. Now, these figures underscore the, the need member for to MacArthur, modernise the Australian the economy, Mr. Boothby. Speaker. These numbers underscore the need to modernise the Australian economy and to the lift for our productivity, to the lift the productive Dixon capacity of the Australian economy. And, Mr Speaker, this is absolutely the case when there is international uncertainty in the wind. So the Rudd government is prepared to modernise the economy, to make the investments in skills, to provide the political leadership when it comes to infrastructure. But we do acknowledge the challenges, Mr Speaker, and sadly, sadly those opposite Member don't acknowledge Casey. the challenges. The coalition has lost its way. On Sunday, the Leader of the Opposition said that the economy was first rate. Is that right? Is that right? Is that right? Order. Yesterday, the member for North Sydney said it was heading Order. for recession. Three the days later. For North Sydney. Three days Mem later, Mr. The Treasurer resumed his seat. Treasurer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the member for Wentworth can't agree with himself. 
He's been out there criticising others for talking down the economy. And this morning on Neil Mitchell, he said as a, a recession is a possibility. Mr. Speaker, the member for Wentworth, Order. the member for Wentworth will say anything and do anything. Say anything and do anything to get a headline. Because he has one job in mind, that's the leader of the opposition's job. No policy to deal with inflation, no policy to do with productivity. This is a government that is facing up to the challenges. They're a divided rabble. The member for Warringah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, again to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister uh, if he won't guarantee that carers' lump sum payments will be paid uh, in the coming budget, will he alternatively guarantee that carers' payments will be increased uh, by an equivalent amount of $31 a week fully indexed? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I guarantee that carers will not be $1 worse off as a consequence of the budget. Furthermore, furthermore it is time that when we looked Order. at the challenges uh, of carers and pensioners Order. long term, rather than a series of one-off payments made year after year Order. after year by those opposite, including incorporated in so many of their statements leading up to the last election, we, the government, by contrast, are examining ways in which you can place payments to carers and pensioners onto a more secure long-term footing. But I repeat what I said before. Order. Carers do a fantastic job across the nation. Order. Carers do a fantastic job across the nation. And when it comes to this upcoming budget, they will not Order be one dollar worse Sydney. off. And in contrast to those who have preceded us, we are examining ways by which we can place payments to carers on a more secure long-term footing. The member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. How is the government addressing the barriers to practical action to improve Australia's environmental sustainability by reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions? The Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank, you, uh, thank the member, I beg your pardon, for his question. Mr Speaker, everybody listening and everyone in this House knows that climate change is the greatest challenge that this and subsequent generations face. And most of the Australian community and most of us in this place are aware of the immensity of the challenge. And I know for certain that those members, neighbours of ours, those members of Pacific Island states continuing to experience the prospects of rising sea levels are amongst those. And fundamentally, this government understands that the basic point is that the cost of inaction on climate change is greater than the cost of action. That's the crucial point, and that's why we're taking action now. Committing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 60 per cent by 2050 on 2000 levels, adopting market-based instruments, including an emissions trading system, to be introduced by 2010, mobilising the tremendous willingness of households and schools and of the business community, all frustrated by a government previously who viewed any action on climate change as an overt reaction. Now, Mr Speaker, if there's any doubt about the genuine concerns in the Australian community about the challenges of dangerous climate change, those doubts were put to rest last November. The electorate sent a very clear message that 11 and a half years of denial and delay on climate change should be brought to an end. And in fact, Mr Speaker, I think the community realised then that the former government was actually light years behind the Australian public on the climate change challenge. I say light years, Mr Speaker, because if we cast our minds back to last September, and it's not that long ago, we had backbenchers of the former government disputing the scientific basis for climate change. Mr Speaker, it's the case that it was the former members for Solomon and Lindsay and the current members for Tangney and Hughes who incredibly disputed the validity of the scientific consensus that human activities are contributing to global warming, citing Order. evidence, and I quote, that warming has also been observed on Mars, Jupiter, Triton, Pluto, Neptune and others. That is, that is the case. They were, Mr Order. Speaker, lost in space. Order. 
light years behind the Australian community and the international community. As it was said at the time in this House, Mr. Speaker, they were definitely on another planet. And, but, Mr. Speaker, that was last September, and one would have thought that times had moved on, the times had changed. And in fact, they did, because a new government was elected, and its first official act was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And I note the comments made by the opposition leader that ratification is important. But, Mr. Speaker, I was asking this question about the barriers to practical action on climate change, and we were reminded of one of the biggest barriers to practical action from a speech given last week by the former Prime Minister when he said, and I quote, global warming has become a new battleground. The same intellectual bullying and moralising used in other debates now dominates what passes for serious dialogue on this issue. Mr Speaker, if we want to talk about serious barriers to action on climate change, it's the Liberal Party that for 11 and a half years dismissed a growing scientific consensus as alarmism, Order. as moralising, and now apparently in this form of revisionism by the previous Prime Minister as intellectual bullying. Mr Speaker, this was the party who in government demonised Vice President Al Gore. This was the, this was the government, this was the government formally who refused to put the issue of climate change on the agenda for the South Pacific nations. And, Mr Speaker, this is the former government that now has a member who made an interesting contribution, who made an interesting contribution in the House just last month. And I refer to the contribution by the member for Barker, who spoke on climate change in the parliament in 2008, and he offered a scientific analysis from which he concluded it follows that climate change cannot be attributed solely or even partly to human origins. <laughs> Well, Mr Speaker, let me take this opportunity to refer the member and other members to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1995, the balance of evidence suggests that there is a discernible human influence on global climate. In 2001, there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. There's more of this. And, Mr Speaker, just last year, most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely, due, very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Mr Speaker, is this intellectual bullying? Is it moralising? The fact is that there's been no greater barrier to serious action on climate change Minister than the remarks and the seat. thoughts— Minister will resume his seat. Minister will resume his seat. Member for North Sydney on a Mr. point of order. Mr Speaker, this diatribe has been going for more than five minutes now. I ask, him, ask you to bring him back to the question. He was not asked about alternative views. If he hasn't got a proper answer, we've got plenty of questions Member for over North here. Sydney, resume his seat. The minister was asked about barriers to greenhouse gas reductions. The minister Thank will you, bring Mr. his Speaker. answer to a close. Uh, the Minister. member for Barker, Mr Speaker, I conclude, went on to advise that the most sensible approach to climate change, and I quote, would be to adapt. Well, Mr Speaker, the Australian community adapted. They took the most sensible approach to climate change, and that was to elect the Rudd Labor government, a government that would take climate change seriously. The member for Warringah. Well, Mr Speaker, my question is uh, again to the Prime Minister. Uh, if the Prime Minister won't guarantee uh, that carers and seniors' lump sum payments will continue in this budget, and if he won't guarantee an increase in the basic rate of payment to carers and seniors, how will he ensure that carers and seniors uh, will not be a dollar worse off in the budget, as he has just assured the House? And I ask further, Mr Speaker, does he really understand the anxiety that his indecision and vacillation uh, is causing some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. As I said the other day, there's no <coughs> intention whatsoever on the part of the government to leave carers or pensioners in the lurch. The government, oh, the government, that, the I lead, has the government that I lead takes seriously the concerns of working families, takes seriously the concerns of pensioners, takes seriously the concerns of carers. In my Order. engagement with carers right across the country, the work that they do, hundreds and thousands of them right Order. across Australia, 
is to be admired and supported by the community and supported by appropriate payments from the taxpayer. And I confirm again, Mr. Speaker, for the benefit of the honourable member, that carers, when it comes to bonuses, will not be a dollar worse off as a consequence of this budget, nor will pensioners. The member for Bass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment, Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Will the Minister update the House on the timing of the implementation of the government's laws to end the making of Australian workplace agreements, a key part of Labor's fair, flexible and balanced industrial relations system? Yeah. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Bass for her question. Of course, as members of the House are aware, the government was elected on the basis of its policy forward with fairness, a new workplace relations system for the Australian nation. And the bill before the House, the transition to forward with fairness bill, is the first part of the government's plans to ensure that fair, flexible and balanced workplace relations system. It would, of course, end forever the ability of anyone in this country to make an Australian workplace agreement. And we know Australian workplace agreements have hurt Australian working families by taking away hard-earned pay and conditions. This matter is not only before the House, but it's before a Senate inquiry due to report on the 17th of March. Mr Speaker, it is the government's intention when that Senate inquiry reports to have the bill dealt with by both Houses of Parliament prior to the House rising before Easter. This will enable the bill to be proclaimed into law shortly after Easter and to deliver on one of the government's important election commitments to end the making of Australian workplace agreements. Mr Speaker, the Australian people voted for this at the last election. They know what they want. The Australian government, the Rudd Labor government, knows where it stands. We stand behind our policy forward with fairness. Unfortunately, the opposition has been unable to articulate a coherent position on Labor's bill, and I am concerned that their dithering and vacillation will mean that there is delay in dealing with this bill before the parliament. Mr Speaker, can I direct your and the House's attention to an article by Steve Lewis published on the 23rd of February. In that article, Mr Lewis reports that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition uh, said that when it came to defending Australian workplace agreements, her colleagues, the member for North Sydney and the member for Warringah, quote, went to water. Now, having read that article, I thought clearly the Deputy Leader of the Opposition stood firmly behind AWAs and firmly behind work choices. Now, one have, would have to give that points for bravery, Mr Speaker, a bit like the Black Knight in Monty Python. She was going to fight on. That election loss was just a flesh wound. She was going Order. to defend work choices. Then, of course, Order. Mr Speaker, Simba last Latrobe. week, this belief that the Opposition stood behind work choices and AWAs was further reinforced when the former Prime Minister gave a speech in the United States defending work choices and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition described it as an excellent speech. One could only conclude from that statement that they were going to fight on in defence of AWAs and in defence of work choices. Deputy Prime Minister, resume your seat. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Again, Mr Speaker, uh, my recollection of the question is that it didn't ask for alternative views. And I ask you to bring the uh, Deputy Prime Minister back to the question that was asked. Order. The question related to the up, an update on the timing and implementation of the laws. The Deputy Prime Minister will address her response to that, that aspects of the question. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am addressing the matter of timing because, of course, the timing is contingent on the bill going through the parliament, and whether or not quick passage of this bill is going to be facilitated depends in part on the position of the opposition. It is a material fact, Mr Speaker, to the question of timing. Then, of course, we got a different position from the opposition, hence the confusion and hence the risk to timing on the weekend when the Deputy Leader of the Opposition appeared on national television and said that the Opposition did not support but did not oppose the government's bill. Now, Mr Speaker, is this a riddle that we are supposed to puzzle out? 
did not support and did not oppose the bill. What is the meaning of this nonsense? By the standard of these contributions, Mr Speaker, the next thing we will hear from the opposition, and I'm surprised we didn't hear it today on climate change, is them wandering out telling age-old riddles like, if a tree falls down in a forest and no one's there, does it make a sound? That will be the next the quality resume. contribution. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. The Deputy, the Deputy Prime Minister will bring her answer to a close. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, on the question of timing, what we are seeking is a straightforward answer from the opposition to a very simple question. It's not a trick question. It's not a hard question. It's a simple question. And the question, Mr Speaker, is if a division, if a division on Labor's bill is caused in either House of Parliament. Will the, the opposition Deputy vote Prime for Minister the bill, debate against the, the bill, or try hiding in the corner, close. hoping that no one notices that they are still supporters of work choices? Right. It's, a key, it's a key question on the timing mm. of the bill. It's a question mm. the Australian Deputy, people who voted for Deputy, fairness and certainty in workplaces are entitled to. The member for Warringah. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, my question is. If it's the Prime Minister's position that someone must suffer in the fight against inflation, why has he decided that carers and pensioners should be the sacrificial victims? And if it was right to pay carers and seniors lump sum payments last year when the surplus was $12 billion, why is it wrong to do so this year with an even higher surplus? Will these lump sum payments be made, yes or no? The Prime Minister. Mr um, Speaker, in response to the Honourable Member's question from the New Party of Compassion opposite, um, <laughs> given, their, given their long, the long-standing long commitment that they uh, oh. have to um, uh, the bonuses to carers and pensioners, it's pretty interesting when you look at the actual Ford estimates produced in the last That's budget. Right. Um, Order. Where do you see any commitment on the part of the previous government to the payment of this one-off bonus next Order. year? The Minister for Trade. The year after? Absolutely. The one after that? The one after that? In fact, it's missing in action. It isn't there. In fact, if you go to the fine print of the government's, uh, previous government's position on this, it was uh, these one-off payments, we don't rule them out for the future, subject to economic circumstances. Such is the depth of the continued commitment of compassion on the part of those opposite. I return to what I said before. When it comes to bonus payments to carers and pensioners, they will not be a dollar worse off as a consequence of the upcoming budget. The member for Lyons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the call. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister advise the House on progress on the implementation of the government's election commitment to withdrawal of troops from Iran? And uh, what's communities from Iraq? Iraq. Oh. Order. Yeah, you didn't quite get there, did you? you? Didn't quite get there. Sorry. George had it on the agenda, but he didn't quite get it there. But all right. The the member for Lyons has the uh, call. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, withdrawal of troops from Iraq. And what community support is there for the government's actions? The the minister for foreign affairs. Well, thank you, the uh, member Mr. for Speaker. La Trobe will be sent somewhere. The member for foreign, Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm asked about the government's election commitment so far as troop uh, withdrawal from Iraq is concerned, and and Order. the community support for that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you would have members would of course be aware of the government's election commitment to withdraw the uh, combat forces, the combat troops from Iraq, the so-called Overwatch Battle Group, and to do that by the middle of uh, this year. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, members will also recall the fierce criticism—the fierce criticism—that that election commitment was subject to 
by the then government, by the Liberal Party, by the then leader of the opposition, by the leader of the opposition who was then Defence Minister. The fierce criticism that election commitment was subject to. There was a very stark contrast between the Labor Party's approach to withdraw troops and the Liberal and National Party's approach, who said that this would be a disaster, a disaster of mammoth proportions, that this would split the alliance. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to advise that the government is implementing this election commitment in consultation with the United States and uh, the United Kingdom, and that implementation is on course and going very smoothly. The Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence raised this matter when the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence visited uh, Iraq in December of last year. I raised this issue and spoke to the Secretary of State and other officials when I was in the United States in January, and recently the Minister for Defence and I, when we hosted the Osmin conference here, discussed the matter further with, uh, with the United States. And our approach to withdraw at the end of the current rotation, minimum disruption, has been welcomed. That approach has been welcomed by the United States. I'm asked about uh, community support, Mr. S Mr Speaker. There is widespread community support, widespread community support for the implementation of the government's election commitment in this respect. Widespread community support. So widespread, Mr. Speaker, so widespread, Mr. Speaker, it's spreading to areas previously unthought of. Spreading to areas previously unthought of. Despite his trenchant criticism, despite his trenchant Order. criticism of the, gov of the government's election commitment, recently the leader of the opposition, recently the leader of the opposition said, "Our position is that the combat troops would actually be withdrawn at the end of June." Also, the leader of the opposition, said, "Our position is Order. that the combat troops would actually be withdrawn at the end of June." Also. One policy before the election, different policy after. One position before the election, different position after. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we know that the Liberal Party and the Leader of the Opposition have lost their way. We know the Leader of the Opposition has lost his way. But there's one area, one area, Mr. Speaker, one area to which the widespread community support for the government's election has not spread. One area that it has not spread to. John Winston Howard. And in a speech recently in the United States, he said that the implementation of the government's election commitment was disappointing, was disappointing and could lead to a tragedy. Was disappointing and could lead to a tragedy. But Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Order. despite the fact, despite the fact that the overwhelming, the overwhelming and widespread community support has not spread to John Winston Howard, the government will persist. The government will continue. The government will not deter. The government will continue to implement its election commitment. The government will stay the course Order. in the implementation of its election commitment to withdraw troops from Iraq. Unlike, unlike the leader of the opposition, unlike Order. the Liberal Party, unlike the leader of the Liberal Party, unlike, unlike the leader of the opposition, there will be no cutting and running. No cutting and running. Unlike the Liberal Party, cutting and running from the previous position, cutting and running from the previous Prime Minister, cutting and running from John Winston Howard. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, I refer the Prime Minister to the case of Mrs Pat Stafford, who has motor neurone disease, and who says that the carer's bonus enables her and her husband to keep their 25-year-old car on the road. Is the Prime Minister aware that her husband, Henry, thinks that without the lump sum payment, Pat would end up in an institution. Is the Prime Minister aware that over the weekend Pat Stafford said that, and I quote, John Howard was the quiet achiever, but Kevin Rudd has turned out to be the quiet deceiver? End of quote. In the light of his failure, in the light of his failure to guarantee that carers' lump sum payments will be paid, will the Prime Minister have the decency to apologise to Pat and Henry Stafford? and the 400,000 carers who feel betrayed. The Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Order. Mr Speaker. In response to the honourable member's question, I would say to Mr and Mrs Stafford that uh, when it comes to the upcoming budget, they will not be a dollar worse off when it comes to their bonus payments. Um, and uh, that is our guarantee. And the reason it's our guarantee is that these are among the most vulnerable Australians. And therefore, therefore for, those, for those reasons, they need to have an assurance from the government and the parliament Patterson. that their payments are in order. It's not exactly the insurance that they order. had um, from the previous government in its election commitments when asked 
on this matter, the previous government's policy contained in the coalition government policy election 2007 on this very question says, if re-elected, the coalition will consider continuing to pay these bonuses. Wait for it, wait for it, Order. wait for it, comma, depending on the economic circumstances at the time. I take Order. it that equals a rock-solid commitment from those opposite. Mr Speaker, they have from this government a guarantee that carers, when it comes to their bonuses, will not be a dollar worse off. I stand by that commitment, and this underlines the hypocrisy of those who stand opposite. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion of censure against the Prime Minister. Is, is leave granted? Yes. 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 Leave is granted. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion of censure against the Prime Minister. I leave move that this House I move that this House uh, Order. The Leader I of the Opposition. Move that this House censures the Prime Minister and the Government for its plans to cut the benefits received by four hundred thousand carers and more than two million seniors, elderly and frail Australians. In particular, I move to censure the Prime Minister and his government for failing to guarantee that the carers and seniors bonuses paid in the last budget, when the surplus was $12 billion, will be paid in the forthcoming budget, when the surplus is expected to be much larger. For failing to detail any alternative means to ensure that carers and pensioners will not be worse off as a result of the budget as promised, and for leaving two and a half million Australians in a state of uncertainty over their future because this government does not understand how to manage the economy. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Liberal and National parties in government built a strong economy for Australia. Yeah, yeah. It was an economy of sustained and strong growth, an economy that delivered record low unemployment, an economy that delivered strong business confidence and investment. It was also a government that delivered surplus budgeting to Australia, which had been unknown when there was a change of government from the last Labor government in 1996. The Liberal and the National parties in government built a strong economy so as to give Australians confidence, confidence in ourselves and confidence in our future. But it also built a strong economy to, to enable this nation to care for its weak its vulnerable, its sick and its elderly. In its last four budgets, Mr Speaker, the previous government delivered, amongst other things, a $1,600 lump sum cash payment to some 400,000 carers, a carer payment and a carer allowance at a cost of just under $400 million. Disability and carers in those in support under the previous government over 11 and a half years benefited from a 75 per cent real increase in funding under the previous coalition government. There were in those carers, Mr Speaker, 400,000 recipients. And in fact, in 2005, Access Economics, in its study of the contribution of Australia's carers to this nation, estimated that they contribute 1.2 billion hours of care, which is equal to more than $30 billion of formal aged and disability care services. So, Mr Speaker, who are these carers? Some 400,000 or so. They are men and women who are frequently faceless, who neither seek nor or receive reward in any visible or public way for what they do every single day. They are men and women who are caring for frequently adult disabled children. They are caring for someone whom they love, who is in need of desperate support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are men and women who have adult parents who are in desperate need, who have children of all ages, who frequently juggle a job if they can afford to find any time at all to do it. They live across a 24-hour cycle on anything from one to three or four hours sleep 
and they do so seven days a week, uh, 365 days of the year. They are the unsung heroes of this nation. They are the real saints of Australian society. When we talk about an Australian community, these are the men and women who give real meaning to what it is to be a community, to give effect to the thing that we describe colloquially as mateship, to putting yourself out for someone else, to go the extra mile, to do the things that are important. And they do so with a limited amount of support and under this new elected government, even less confidence in their economic future. Mr Speaker, as I said to the Prime Minister last week, for God's sake, these are the real heroes of our nation, they are the real saints and they deserve our strong support. So, Mr Speaker, it was with a great sense of alarm when the Australian newspaper arrived on Friday with a headline that said, and I quote, Razor Gang slices out compassion as carer bonus is slashed, with a photograph of Mr Ashley Norman and his wife Pat in the outer suburbs of Mackay, whom I have subsequently visited. I might point out to the House Mr. Speaker, that the chairman of the Razor Gang, the chairman of the Expenditure Review Committee, according to the government's own online directory of government services, the chairman of this razor gang, responsible for a cartoon of our Prime Minister letting a man in a wheelchair go down the side of a mountain, the chairman of the razor gang is the Prime Minister. This is the man whose background as a public servant is now coming to the fore. The bureaucrat who in Queensland was responsible for the dismissal of so many working Australians who went from being working families to workless families. Mr Speaker, it's important for us to appreciate that the extent to which we reach out to and support carers and those whom they love and for whom they provide, the elderly and the frail, are the critical measures of a caring society and the critical measures of a caring government. The response to this headline, Mr Speaker, in this story was not for the Prime Minister and not for any one of his ministers to come out and say, no, it's not true, to, basic, to say instead that the lump sum payment is guaranteed. The Prime Minister may say that he hasn't got it in his budget for his so-called forward estimates, but I can sure as hell tell the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, that these 400,000 carers have got it in their budget. Yeah. When I went to Mackay on Saturday to visit the victims of flood, and support and thank the carers and volunteers and emergency services, I went to see Mr Ashley Norman and his wife Pat. They live in a modest, small dwelling in the outer suburbs of Mackay. Yeah. Ashley Norman is 73 and he's dying. He's oxygen dependent. He takes 20 medications a day. He's had major heart surgery. He's had at least two significant heart attacks. His lung capacity is down to 35 per cent. He has an abdominal aortic aneurysm which can rupture at any time. He has severe diabetes. He has peripheral neuropathy, which means he, for different reasons but like our Prime Minister, can't feel what's going on in his extremities. And his wife of 52 years, Pat, who looks after him 24 hours a day, and looks after him, as he described to me, as a baby. Of 52 years of marriage, that woman gives him support 24 hours a day. And without her, as he said to me, Brendan, I would be dead. D-E-A-D. -E and as far as that $1,600 is concerned, it may not mean much to a prime minister or a minister of a government with the incomes that we collectively earn in this place. But it sure as hell means a lot to Ashley Norman and Pat, and it means a hell of a lot to the 400,000 carers throughout this country. What's been the response of the Prime Minister? He said publicly yesterday, and it took it wasn't lunchtime Friday. We had an issue, another issue involving care recently, and the problem was sorted by lunchtime. 
We didn't have this one sorted by lunchtime. We didn't have it sorted by Friday night. It wasn't there by Saturday when we got up to another headline that said, now the Razor Gang, chaired by the Prime Minister, is going for seniors. Shame. Instead, he sent his ministers out to run some drivel about budget process. You sound like a bunch of bureaucrats being run by a bureaucrat. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean to someone struggling with a husband dying from motor neurone disease? What does it mean to an adult that's got an ageing mother with Parkinson's disease incontinent at three o'clock in the morning and desperately having to buy a new fridge? What does it mean to Ashley and Pat Norman and their family who haven't had a holiday for 20 years? What it means is that they cannot budget. The government's going through the process as it should of budgeting for our nation's finances. And we just hope they know what they're doing and that they get it right. But there are some things that rise above it. Whoever was the source of this story out of the Razor Gang, chaired by the Prime Minister, was trying to do something to protect these people. Because unlike our Prime Minister and our new government, they at least appear to appreciate what this means to everyday fair dinkum Australians. Yeah. These are not only people who are struggling with grocery prices if they can afford a 25-year-old car like Pat Stafford to be able to run it. These are not just people that are struggling with their credit cards. These are people, Prime Minister, who are literally struggling to survive, where life is a day-to-day -day struggle for survival. Those lump sum payments delivered by the previous government in the last four years were a consequence of delivering a strong economy. It was a consequence of tough decisions made by the member for Higgins as Treasurer, the former member for Benelong and everybody that was then sitting on that side. Decisions that were opposed by those who are now in That's government. Right. Right. And the first thing that we did when in government was to say, right, who's at the top of the list? Who are the people now that we've paid off the Labor government's debt? Now we've got interest rates down to a manageable level. Now we've got lots more working families because we had unemployment at a 30-year low. What was the group of people we put at the top of that list? At the top of that list, we put the Pat Staffords. We put Ashley and Pat Norman. We put the men and women of this country who are the most deserving people who are so desperately in need of financial support. And we delivered to them a $1,600 lump some payment. And we delivered it every year for four years. So I say, Mr Speaker, to the Prime Minister and the government, put aside your pride and embarrassment about being caught out on this. Put aside the fact that the all-controlling Prime Minister would not allow his ministers to sort this out and end the grief and distress amongst Australia's vulnerable carers, seniors, elderly and frail. And I say to the Prime Minister, notwithstanding the fact that we feel so strongly about this, that we are censuring the Prime Minister, I say to the Prime Minister, just get up. For God's sake, get up, stand in front of that microphone and say to the carers of this country, I, the Prime Minister of Australia, believe in you and will deliver you a lump sum payment in the budget. It is not that hard. We were lectured and told it wasn't hard to do some other things. And we on this side have gone through a process of supporting things which we believe are in the nation's best interests. This is not only in the nation's best interests, this is in the interests of men and women who feel that they have no voice. The reason why the carers have all been out and saying the things they have is not because they're political activists. They have different political views. Some of those carers who received that $1,600 and the seniors and the elderly who received the $500 lump sum payment from the previous coalition government, they didn't vote for us. That's not what this is about. This is about them. It's not about us. It's not about bureaucrats. What is it that the Labor Party doesn't get? that is so now occupied by former union officials and political apparatchiks that it has lost sight—and bureaucrats 
that it's lost sight of what government is about. The reason why the people in this gallery, the reason why the people watching this on television elect a government is they expect men and women of decency who understand and care for them to stand between them and the bureaucrats that could otherwise run the country. That is why this is so important. The Prime Minister said yesterday they won't be a cent worse off. He said it again today in the House, which is why we have had to run this censure, why we've had to censure the Prime Minister, a very, very serious thing. He said they won't be a cent worse off than they would otherwise be. He has refused to guarantee the lump sum payment. Now, for someone earning $250,000 a year, a lump sum payment of $1,600, you probably think, well, you know, what's that? You know, it's my credit card payment or whatever. Can I just say to the Prime Minister, having spent much of my professional life when I was practicing medicine working with these families, can I tell you, when you're with them at 3 o'clock in the morning and they haven't slept for 24 hours and they've got not one but two severely autistic children, I can tell you, Prime Minister, that a lump sum payment is everything. If you're hanging out for that lump sum payment, it is absolutely essential for your budgeting. It's the difference between sinking and swimming. And that's why the, ha the coalition government and the Liberal and National parties delivered it. And that is why it is so important, not for the political interests of the government, but so important for these men and women about whom this censure and this debate is about, that this has to be delivered. This morning I listened to AM. I also listened to Radio National. I listened to Fran Kelly interview Nell Brown. I hope the Prime Minister heard the interview. And if the Prime Minister did not hear the interview, could I just ask him to get one of his many helpers to actually get an audio out of the interview? Nell Brown has a daughter, an adult daughter in her 20s. She doesn't just have an intellectual disability, Prime Minister. She also suffers from schizophrenia. She was asked by Fran Kelly this question. There has been some talk about stretching over the course of the year. Would that help? So the question is, so would the payment, the $1,600, instead of a lump sum, if it was parked into about $30 a week parked into your payment, would that help? So she's asked that question. This woman's not some sort of political activist. For God's sake, she's trying to run a part-time job and look after her adult daughter. So what did she say when she was asked whether it would help, you know, to spread it over the year? which would be the Prime Minister's she won't be a cent off remark. After five days, I might add. Not on day one, not on day two. Five days. It took him five days to say anything, the same time he was overseas. So what did she say when she was asked this? She said, and I quote, no, not at all. And she went on to say, when you actually get a lump of money put in your hand, and so, if you are desperate for something, you can have it. Desperate. Desperation. These are lives that are lived in quiet desperation, with limited support. And imagine, Prime Minister, being in a situation where you have a child who has an intellectual disability and then compounded by developing schizophrenia in a young adult life. Then you find out what the, the services run by the states are actually like and how poor they are particularly in Queensland as a result of uh, a certain fellow known as Dr Death in an earlier government up there, that's when you find out just how lousy the services are. Desperation is the word. These men and women every day are desperate, and they desperately need a lump sum payment yeah. because there is a hell of a difference if you are struggling on $12,000 a year or $15,000 a year. There is a hell of a lot of difference between $30 a week and $1,600 coming, as it has under the coalition, Liberal National parties over the last four years. Now, that may not mean much to some people that earn high incomes. They may wonder what this is all about. My plea to the government and to the Prime Minister is walk a mile in their shoes. You don't have to spend a week with them. Just spend 24 hours with them. 
you have sent your members out to go and visit schools. We have had bread and circuses for three and a half months, which has passed for government. And one of the little things was to send all of the Labor backbenchers out to visit a school, you know, the education revolution. My challenge to the Prime Minister is send them out and go and spend 24 hours with a carer yeah. and ask the carers whether the $1,600 lump sum payment is important to them. That's what you actually need to do, Prime Minister. So, Mr Speaker, we believe Australians have been betrayed. Yeah. We believe that Australia's carers, their seniors, the frail, the elderly, we believe the Ashley and Pat Normans of this world have been betrayed. And it is absolutely essential that the Prime Minister redeem not only the confidence that they must have in the government of the day, but redeem himself by coming to that dispatch box now and saying they will receive a $1,600 lump sum yeah, payment yeah. so they can get on with their lives and literally live those lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, the motion, is the motion seconded? Uh, yes, sir. The member for Warringah. Um, I second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition of Censure and the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The problem with this uh, censure motion is just based on a false premise. The, char the charge is that, um, in relation to the bonus system, that the government won't guarantee that pensioners and carers uh, will be um, financially uh, worse off. We have made a very clear-cut commitment that, when it comes to the bonus system, uh, we have guaranteed that carers and pensioners will not be financially worse off as a result of the budget. That position was made absolutely clear by the government before Parliament convened. It's been made absolutely clear on the Hansard here in Parliament today that pensioners and carers, when it comes to their bonus payments, won't be a dollar worse off. But despite the fact that that assurance has been provided prior to coming into the Parliament, despite the fact that that assurance has been provided on at least four or five occasions in the Parliament in response to the various questions legitimately asked by those opposite, we're here to be responsible to those uh, who constitute the opposition. Despite Remember having said Bowman. that time and time and time again, because it's in the pre-positioning of the Opposition Tactics Committee to have a censure motion on this matter, off they go. The answer that you wanted and the answer that you wanted, the guarantee that you wanted provided, has been provided. And it has been done Order. in absolute Order. black the and Prime white Minister terms. Prime Minister seat. The Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence. This is a serious matter. The Prime Minister should be heard in silence. Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. So the guarantee is clear-cut when it comes to carers and pensioners and uh, the uh, impact of the bonus system on them. They will not be a dollar worse off. And beyond that, what we have said is that we need to work through ways and means by which those who receive these bonus payments can have payments made to them on a more secure footing into the future. And we believe that is a reasonable way to proceed. It does contrast with the position which has been taken by those opposite on this matter. Because when we went into the last election, what was the commitment of those opposite? First thing you look at to see whether a government has had a serious systemic commitment to making bonus payments to either carers or pensioners is to look for one Remember document. For and it's called the budget papers, and within the budget papers, to go to the Ford estimates and to go to the relevant entry under the sub program entry. And what do you find there? You find no commitment at all on the part of our predecessors, none whatsoever. So there has been no long term commitment by those opposite to these bonus payments in the past. That's simply a fact. The fact is reflected in the actual construction of the budget papers. Then go to the next point. Dealing with this in the election context, and here I quote from this colourful document, the Coalition Government Election 2007 Policy, Sydney. Better Support for Carers, Go for Growth. There you go. Minister. We flip over to page six. More financial support for carers. This is not ripped out of context. It is in the section entitled More Financial Support for Carers. Go to the relevant paragraph, neatly tucked up the end, because you usually tuck things up the end and you hope no one actually gets that far. Last sentence, last paragraph on the page, it says as follows. 
a re-elected coalition government will consider continuing to pay these bonuses, first qualifying clause, second qualifying clause, depending on the economic circumstances at the time. There has been no forward commitment by those opposite at all. None whatsoever. It is grossly misleading on the part of those opposite to put a view to carers and pensioners across the country that they were locked in to doing this were they re-elected. It is untrue. It is demonstrated by the document to be untrue. It's there in black and white. Then we go to, then we go to how these matters have been treated by the previous government in previous years. Member for Fadden. Every budget night, and I've attended a few when the member for Higgins would stand here and deliver the budget, if you look at uh, his statements, he says repeatedly, tonight I announce that, in terms of bonus payments for carers, I announce that, I announce this one-off payment. The member same the in 2004, the same in 2005, and I have here 2007, a one-off seniors bonus payment. These are one-off announcements. That's how you have described them, each budget that you have done them. Four previous budgets in the case of the carer's payment, one previous budget when it comes to the $500 Order. payment as it relates to pensioners. These are one-off statements, one-off announcements, and, and uh, described as such by the Treasurer himself. Therefore, where does the evidence leave us? The evidence leaves us as follows. First of all, Nothing in the Ford estimates on the part of those opposite, nothing whatsoever. Secondly, we have an explicit statement in the colourful document which says that they may consider this depending on the state of the economy. And thirdly, when you look at the way in which this has been handled in previous years, they are explicitly addressed as a series of one-off statements announced, repeat, announced on the night. And so what you therefore have on the part of the government uh, is something considerably in addition to what's been provided by those opposite. Member that for is, a guarantee is now. We're in March. The budget's not due till May. Previous government practice, if we're applying the same uh, standards, would be shut up, say nothing until, until budget night in May. Uh, then, the pre then the Treasurer stood up in the past and said, here is the one-off announcement. What we are doing in March is standing up and providing this guarantee to carers and pensioners now. That represents a significant departure on the part of uh, previous practice. Of course, on top of that, there are a range of other measures which we have embraced as well. And they, of course, go to what we can do uh, for utilities payments uh, for carers and pensioners. We're committed to a $4.1 billion program that will benefit over 3 million Australians. And this will go to 2.6 million aged income support recipients, 277,000 Commonwealth senior, seniors health card Order. holders, 700,000 disability support pensioners, 160,000 carer payments recipients. Over 3 million Australians, a $4.1 billion payment, and in each case, a quarterly payment of $125 when it comes to a utilities allowance. This is of real and measurable benefit, not just to pensioners, but also to those uh, who are providing services as carers, as recipients of the carer payments. What we have, therefore, is not only a guarantee when it comes to these bonuses, you also have a guarantee from us when it comes to these utilities allowances, four by $125. And the reason we have done that is because the bills come in regularly for people when it comes to electricity and rates and the rest. Not just an annual payment, not a biannual payment. A lot of these bills come in quarterly. Therefore, the, why, the reason we designed these payments on a quarterly basis was to ensure that carers and pensioners and others would have access to these payments to assist them as the bills rolled in the door. In fact, we were attacked for doing it on a quarterly basis, I seem to recall, by the former Treasurer, the current member for Higgins, who didn't think this was the right way to go. So you have from us, unlike our predecessors who treated this as a budget night one-off announcement, you have from us in March, two months before the budget, a clear-cut guarantee. Beyond that, you have a clear-cut guarantee on the question of uh, utilities allowance payments, which go to more than three million Australians, and on both those measures, radically in excess of any such undertakings on the part of those opposite in the lead-up to the last election. Of course, the question which arises, uh, Mr Speaker, is why are we having this debate in the first place when it goes to the other part of the censure motion on the question of the economy? Order. You know, the reason we are having a very difficult budget process at the moment is because we've been left with a very difficult Order. economic challenge. 
And I know Order. those opposite find it very difficult to confront some facts, but I think it's important that they actually go through Deputy facts Leader one by opposition. one that present themselves to the nation right now in terms of the economy we have been left with. Fact one. There is a suggestion by the um, leader of uh, manager of opposition business that this is not relevant to the censure Member motion. For the censure motion deals with the government's management of the economy. I would suggest that the manager of opposition business actually reads the censure motion before he inter interjects to say that he interjects to, to say that these remarks are somehow not relevant to the censure. They are. They are directly relevant to the censure. I read the censure motion Order, the when it was handed to me. Sydney. Why are we having a difficult debate about budget priorities and about expenditure? Because we have inherited a very difficult set of economic circumstances from our predecessors and from the uh, circumstances which now arise from the international economy. Fact number one. When our government was elected, inflation was running at a 16-year high and is now projected by the RBA to remain high until Order. 2010. Is that incorrect? Is that incorrect? Order. Members on my we inherited left inflation rejecting. running at a 16-year high. Is that incorrect? What's fact number one? No, no dispute from those opposite. Fact number two. When our government was elected, interest rates had risen ten times in a row and were the second highest in the developed world. That's fact number two. Any, any, any dispute? Fact number three. Productivity growth running at its lowest level in 15 years, and as the Treasurer said in Parliament today, now having ground down to zero. Fact number three. Fact number four. Order, Since 2005, Commonwealth spending has grown at an average of around 4 per cent real per year, more rapid growth than any other four year period in the last decade and a half. Now, if I recall the presentation of the Parliament the other day by the Minister for Finance, running the last financial year at 4.5 real. Simply understandable. That's fact number four. Fact number five. At the time of the election, despite the best terms of trade in 50 years, we've generated five and a half years of monthly trade deficits, the longest sequence in Australia's economic history, contributing to Australia's record foreign debt, tripling to a record of $570 billion. Fact number five. And I've got to say, if you put all these things together, what you have is a clear cut summary of the dimensions of the economic challenge that we on this side of the House, the government of the day, have been presented with in terms of the economic performance of those who preceded us. Well, it is a very uncomfortable and confronting fact and set of facts for those opposite to realise that they actually left Australia with a series of far-reaching economic problems. When it, on the inflation Order. front, on the interest rates front, on the productivity Order. front, on government spending out of control. All these are problems which now confront us and actually require a course of action to deal with them rather than pushing them all to one side. So framing a budget under these circumstances is a difficult set of circumstances, combined and compounded by the fact that the state of the global economy means that we have revised downwards growth projections for the United States economy, revised downwards projections for growth in Europe, revised downwards projections somewhat in Japan, and therefore difficult set of global economic circumstances. But I've got to say an economic legacy from those opposite uncomfortable, disquieting as they may find it, which frankly registers a fail mark against each of the five to six measures Thank I just ran through. So when it comes to priorities, our challenge, Mr Speaker, is this. How do we manage to maintain responsible economic management, draw government expenditure back under control, eliminate unnecessary spending programs and at the same time make sure that we are extending the hand of support to those who need it in the community? And front and centre to those who need support in the community are carers and pensioners. They are among the most vulnerable. What's been interesting in this debate today has been to listen to the faux expressions of compassion by those opposite. A political party in a previous government which, despite for 12 years not having lifted a finger to address the five to six key economic facts and challenges I ran before and instead squandered their inheritance, but on the compassion register. Look at work choices, look at the impact on working families, look at the impact on those who are struggling to make the family budget balance at the end of each week, and instead, minister after minister, standing at this dispatch box in the time of the previous government saying, not our problem, we're not faintly concerned about the interests of working families. But beyond working families and beyond those who need a decent and fair industrial Order. relations system, we go back to the core needs of those who are the most vulnerable in our community carers and pensioners. 
And I can't think of a more clear-cut commitment than we have given in terms of carers and pensioners for the future. We have a commitment when it goes to uh, them not being any worse off on the, on the question of the bonus payments to uh, carers and pensioners. We have a commitment when it comes to utilities, a commitment given on both cases which precedes the budget by two months, transcending anything which was ever provided by those opposite in previous budgets. I would suggest that those opposite take a long, cold, hard look at themselves against the record that they have left the government on the economy against also the record specifically in the documents I've referred to about the handling of this bonus matter and the time which they occupied the Treasury benches. Because what I fear is happening, Mr Speaker, is a government applying to ourselves on this side of the House a standard which they never, in 12 years of office, applied to themselves when they are the government of this nation. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government rejects the censure motion. And the core reason for doing so is it is absolutely predicated on a false argument that pensioners and carers would be worse off as a consequence of this upcoming budget on the question of the bonus payments. The member for Warringah. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think any uh, fair-minded Australian uh, listening to the Prime Minister's contribution to this debate would come to Order. the sad conclusion that this government is suffering from compassion fatigue after just three months in office. Anyone who is listening to the Prime Minister who now turns his back, uh, turns his back on the carers of Australia as well as on the opposition which is speaking for them, anyone who has listened to his contribution would conclude that as far as this Prime Minister is concerned, it's all about the economy, it's not about people, Mr Speaker. It's not about people, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister and members opposite have said, have said that they have inherited that they have inherited a difficult situation. Well, I say, what is so difficult about a $20 billion plus surplus? They have inherited a $20 billion plus surplus, and they won't commit. They won't commit to give any of it back to the carers and pensioners of Australia by way of these lump sum payments. Shame on you, Prime Minister. Shame on you, Minister for Families. Shame on you, Deputy Prime Minister, for abandoning and dumping the most vulnerable people in our society in this way. Mr Speaker, let's just make it absolutely crystal clear to a Prime Minister and a Minister who don't know what their policy is, exactly what it is, because it was stated in the Sydney Morning Herald last Friday, and I quote, the federal government faces criticism from carer groups after it decided not to match a $1,600 bonus payment made to carers by the Howard government in recent years. Now listen to this, Prime Minister. Listen to this, Minister for Families. A spokesman for the Minister for Families, Jenny Macklin, confirmed the decision last night, saying it was part of the government's plan to cut spending. Dumping, dumping the carers lump sum payment, dumping the pensioners lump sum payment is part of the government's plan to cut spending. This, Mr Speaker, is about the bonus payment that the Howard government has paid for the last four years. Will it or will it not be paid this year? Now, instead of guaranteeing that it will be paid, uh, this Prime Minister now trying to cook up uh, some kind of a fix uh, with the Leader of the House. I tell you what, uh, Prime Minister, if you want to get out of this mess, don't consult the Leader of the House, the author of, of the Manic Fridays, Mr Speaker. Uh, I tell you, this, this Prime Minister refused uh, to give uh, a guarantee that the bonus payment will be made, instead saying that they would not be worse off. And he said, uh, that this meant uh, that uh, they could all uh, relax and be reassured. In other words, what he tried to do in response to the censure debate today was to give the guarantee that he had refused to give in question time through a series of tortured evasions and circumlocutions and equivocations. I tell you what a guarantee would be. A guarantee would be a letter signed by the Prime Minister of this country saying to the carers and the pensioners of Australia, your bonus payments 
your lump sum payments are safe and will be paid in this budget because the surplus will be bigger than ever, our economy is better than ever and you deserve a dividend this year from economic growth as you have had in the last four years from the Howard government. Have the guts, have the guts to sign a guarantee and then people will have the credit, they will give you credit then for at least having the heart to accept that you and your government have made a mistake over the last four or five years. I tell you what, Madam Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, the cardboard Kev uh, that appeared in this Parliament last Friday, last sitting Friday, has the more heart minute, the than member this Prime Minister has shown in the course of question time uh, and the censure debate uh, today. Uh, now, let's, let's, to let's, let's, let's examine exactly uh, what the Prime Minister has said. The Prime Minister has said, and I'm quoting uh, from an AAP report of Did yesterday, Mr Rudd said Families and Community Services Minister Jenny Prime Macklin Minister. was investigating how the system could be improved, saying that one-off payments I'll and bonuses were an inadequate way to deal with welfare on a long-term basis. So here is the Prime Minister who now says that the one-off lump sum payment and bonus uh, is guaranteed for this budget, saying yesterday that it was inadequate. He went on to say yesterday, the challenge that Jenny Macklin and others have been wrestling with is how do we put all this onto a more secure, predictable basis for carers and pensioners into the long-term future, rather than having to deal simply with a series of one-offs. Well, Mr Speaker, Madam Speaker, I tell you what, the carers and the pensioners of this country can be trusted with money. They can be trusted to know what to do with $1,600 or $500, and that's what they would prefer, as has been made abundantly clear uh, over the last few days. But what we had in question time today was a Prime Minister who would not only guarantee uh, the lump sum payment, but he wouldn't guarantee any alternative way uh, of ensuring that these vulnerable people uh, would not be worse off. He comes in here and he piously says to this chamber they will not be worse off by one dollar, but refuses to describe a mechanism to ensure that that will be the case. And I say this, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, through you to the carers and the pensioners of Australia, these are weasel words that we have seen from this Prime Minister. You can't trust this Prime Minister, and these bonuses will not be paid until we have a guarantee in writing, signed by this man, that they will be paid. You know what we've seen today, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker? We have seen the Prime Minister reverting to type. Uh, last year we saw caring Kevin, we saw pious Kevin. Uh, we saw states the member for Kevin. I tell you what we've seen today. I tell you what we've seen today from the Prime Minister. The Prime the Prime Minister. We you. have seen him reverting to type, a heartless bureaucrat, a heartless bureaucrat who thinks that uh, people are something to be the object of government policy. And I have to say, uh, what the carers of Australia are going to find out over the next few weeks is precisely why this Prime Minister was called Dr. Death by the public servants of Queensland when they had to work with him, when they had to experience what uh, the Prime Minister's compassion was really like. But what we've also seen today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is a striking contrast between a heartless bureaucrat uh, who sees people as items to be moved around on a policy chessboard and someone who spent most of his ad adult life uh, as a doctor in general practice who understands that human beings are creatures of flesh and blood and they have to be dealt with uh, in decency and compassion by governments. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, I regret to say that uh, this government that was elected uh, with so much hope uh, by so many Australians, uh, to the disappointment, uh, admittedly, of people on this side of the House is already dashing their hopes. Right. 
It's one thing to sign up to Kyoto. It's one thing to apologise for the past. It's one thing to promise to change legislation, but it is quite another to consistently deliver decent benefits to the people of Australia. And the fact that members opposite think that it is more important uh, to deliver the mother of all budget surpluses than it is uh, to deliver benefits to the people of this country who need it most just goes to show the extent to which modern Labor has lost its soul. There are too many millionaires sitting opposite, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. There are too many people who spend their time talking to developers and the big end of town, because that is the only possible explanation as to why this government has completely forgotten the most vulnerable people in our society, the carers and the pensioners who are doing it tough uh, who, but for government benefits, entirely miss out uh, on the prosperity that this country has enjoyed in recent years, and who deserve better from a government which calls itself uh, a Labor government. Now, I tell you what, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, because of this Prime Minister's ineptitude, uh, because he is unable uh, to reconcile uh, the conflicting uh, demands uh, of his hairy-chested economic ministers, uh, and his backbench, who understand, I suspect, uh, just what this is going to do uh, to the carers and pensioners of Australia. We have had five days of vacillation and muddle. Five days of vacillation and muddle. And you know, John Howard, the former Prime Minister, uh, he was never one uh, to boast about his compassion credentials. Uh, he was never one uh, to strike his chest and say, look how good I am. Uh, unlike uh, the current uh, incumbent Prime Minister, he just delivered. That's what John Howard did. He just delivered four years, four years of lump sum payments to the carers and pensioners of this country. That's what he did. He delivered. He didn't boast. And what we have from this Prime Minister is a series of pious platitudes, a series of empty assurances not backed up by any specific assurances whatsoever. Now, Mr Speaker, um, what we have seen uh, from members opposite, in the words of one of their former leaders, is a circus of symbolism. The first time they are actually put on the spot, the first time they actually have to come up with a hard commitment, the first time that they are faced with a difficult choice, what do they do? They choose a bigger budget surplus over benefits, tangible, concrete benefits for the carers and pensioners of this country. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, I am confident, more confident than ever, uh, having watched the performance of the Prime Minister, the stumbling, halting, embarrassed, shame-faced performance uh, of the Prime Minister today, uh, attested to uh, by the shocked white faces uh, of the backbench behind him, who know he is getting himself into a hopeless muddle. I am confident, having watched that performance today, that the longer this government lasts, the better the Howard government will look. The longer, the longer we have a situation where members opposite are taking the $500 and the $600 and the $1,000 lump sum payments away from vulnerable people, the more the Howard government will look like a golden age of compassion and decency. A golden age of compassion and decency. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, this Prime Minister uh, was the person uh, who uh, uh, opined at great and pious length uh, in the monthly magazine at the end of 2006 about how all John Howard was interested was me, myself and I. I tell you what. John Howard delivered. John Howard gave the people of this country uh, the support that they needed. This was a Prime Minister who attacked, who attacked what he called Howard's Brutopia. Well, who's running a Brutopia now, Madam Deputy Speaker? Is it a Brutopia uh, to pay people uh, a $1,600 lump sum payment and somehow uh, it's a nirvana uh, to take it away. 
Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, there is something rotten. There is something rotten in this government's makeup. Uh, if this Prime Minister cannot find it in his heart uh, to give those decent, struggling carers and pensioners of this country the lump sum payments that they have been given over the last four budgets, the lump sum payments that they have increasingly come to rely on, and the lump sum payments that they deserve as a dividend from the economic prosperity of our country. Um, I say in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition had some very good advice uh, for this uh, L-plate Prime Minister. Stop talking to the bureaucrats. Uh, stop cutting deals uh, with the faction chiefs. Stop trying to bail out the debt-ridden state governments at the expense of the carers and pensioners of this country. He said uh, to his members, go and visit a school, go and visit a homeless shelter. Well, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, go and spend a bit of time with the carers of our country. Feel their pain. See their need. It doesn't stop. It's 24 hours a day. It's seven days a week. They deserve this payment, the and this payment should be paid. The member's time has expired. I call the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Service and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And if there's one thing that uh, I want to say at the outset, it is uh, that uh, we do have a very, very clear understanding of the enormous contribution that carers make to the people that they love. I know from my own family the enormous personal sacrifices that people made, make, and they do it because they love the people that they care for. We also know that there's been an enormous lifetime of contribution made by the senior members of this country, and uh, we recognise that and respect it. And that's why we want to make sure that, uh, that they're supported both uh, financially and with the provision of services as they grow older. We know that uh, for many, many carers, the uh, cost of the sacrifice they make is both deeply emotional and financial. It is a very, very tough task that so many people take on, and they take it on because they want to. Uh, because of the people that they care so much about. We also know that it is the case that for so many carers in this country, they earn a lot less than uh, other members of our community. In fact, one third of primary carers are in households that rank in the poorest 20 per cent of households in Australia. We do un understand that. We understand it a, as a government. We understand it from our own families. We also know that for many, many of these people, they have very significant additional costs, whether it's for that special medication, whether it's for the equipment they need to help care for their loved ones, whether it's for the additional transport costs they have, the visits backwards and forwards from hospital. All of these, uh, all of these issues do impose an extra financial burden on so many carers in this country. We also know that for many carers there's often a very significant cost to their own family lives. The pressure on other members of the family, whether it's uh, children. In fact, uh, as one uh, woman said to me, the hard thing for her uh, is not only having to care for the individual child that she has to take on a regular basis to the hospital, but recognising the impact of those many hospital visits on her other children, uh, who often don't have their mother uh, to care for them as much as uh, other children have. So these are very, very significant issues that so many carers do face. Enormous personal sacrifices, enormous financial sacrifices, that each and every one of us understand very deeply. And we do have right at our core, right at our core, an unshakable belief, an unshakable principle that all Australians should share in the economic prosperity that this government is ex that this country is experiencing. We think each and every person should share in that prosperity. 
That is why we are making the changes that we are to the utilities payment, and I will talk about that uh, in a little uh, bit of time. The Prime Minister has announced uh, quite categorically that the reports that have been uh, out in the media recently that uh, pe pensioners and carers may be worse off are wrong. He has made it absolutely categoric that those reports are wrong. What he's also said, what he's also said is that when it comes to the bonus system, when it comes to the bonuses that have been paid in the past to both uh, older Australians, to senior Australians and to carers, that they will not be worse off. That is a guarantee that the Prime Minister has given to those uh, senior Australians and to carers. But one of the things that this government is prepared to do, unlike the previous government, is actually give some certainty past this budget to those carers and to those seniors. What we want to be able to do to uh, uh, both, those, both of those groups is, is give them greater security into the future. Rather than have to deal, as they did with the previous government, with a series of one-off payments, what we're proposing to do is actually look for new ways to make sure that we can give both older Australians and carers greater certainty into the future. We do know that uh, this is a much greater sense of security than the previous government was ever, pre ever prepared to do. We had the uh, member for Warringah just a few minutes ago saying that the uh, previous Prime Minister, John Howard, actually delivered. One thing the previous Prime Minister did not deliver was any sense of certainty into the future about these bonuses, because what we know is that all, of, all the opposition was prepared to do was say, before each budget, we'll give a one-off bonus, bonus, but before the last election, as the Prime Minister indicated in, in his earlier remarks, as the Prime Minister indicated in his earlier remarks, this opposition was not prepared to give any certainty as to whether or not, if they had won the election, they would, they would not give any guarantee whatsoever, no guarantee whatsoever, that they would have paid this bonus and certainly gave no guarantee, gave no guarantee that they would pay this bonus or give any security into the future for uh, seniors or for carers. One thing that's very clear from the uh, opposition's election statements and uh, from the uh, state of the budget, when we actually look at the books, when we look at the uh, budget papers from last year, we know that, in fact, this bonus payment was not on the books. If ever we needed any evidence whatsoever about this, this uh, opposition's intentions, this, government, this uh, previous government had no intention of paying this bonus in a secure way. No, no, no commitment whatsoever. What uh, that means is, of course, the government uh, had no commitment, that previous government had no commitment to continuing these bonuses. So I've had the Leader of the Opposition the member for Warringah getting up here making an enormous amount of noise today, but I think they should be honest with the carers that they're speaking to, the carers they're speaking to individually and through this parliament. They made no commitment in the budget last year, they made no commitment in the lead up to the election that they would pay these bonuses. There is no money in the budget for it. And uh, I think a little bit of honesty, a little bit of honesty from the opposition would be welcomed by the carers that they are speaking to. All that they were prepared to do was offer short-term election year bonuses. They were not, in fact, prepared to make an ongoing commitment to carers. They were not prepared to make an ongoing commitment to carers because uh, they had no dedication to really sorting this issue out and giving people the security that they deserve. We do know that, uh, unfortunately, what we had from the, uh, from the previous government just, uh, was just a decision to make uh, things delivered on a one-off basis, not doing it uh, in a continuous way to give people security. I do have to say the other area of uh, hypocrisy uh, from the government, uh, from the opposition, really is uh, quite breathtaking. These are the same people. 
the same people and the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Warringah would have actually been in the Cabinet when this decision was uh, taken. They proposed taking the carer allowance away from nearly 30,000 parents of children with a disability. So this is what the Canberra Times actually reported back uh, in August 2003. They said nearly 30,000 families who care for children with disabilities are expected to lose their government carer allowance. Uh, and uh, the article went on to say that these figures uh, show that these uh, tw almost 30,000 fewer families will receive the allowance this financial year. This was a proposition from uh, those in opposition now who are uh, over there uh, making the most extraordinarily hypocritical statements in this, uh, in this uh, debate. Of course, it got much worse in 2003 for these parents of very disabled children. Uh, following the outcry, The Age reported on 13 August that parents of more than 5,000 disabled children have lost their $87 fortnightly allowance under a Howard government review. So this is what the previous government was actually on about. Uh, we've had a lot of noise today, a lot of uh, suggestion that things were different. But in fact, when you look at the record, you look at what this government uh, was on about, they actually were not about uh, providing any certainty for the future, making sure that, uh, that carers or seniors were able to cope with uh, the uh, very significant financial pressures that they face. So unlike the opposition, what this government is all about is giving some certainty, giving certainty to carers giving certainty to seniors, because what we want to do is not leave, not leave them hanging. We don't want to leave people hanging until budget night, year after year after year. That's, right. That's the task that we've taken on. That's the task we've taken on because it was never taken on by the previous government. There was no previous commitment in the budget to deliver these bonuses. There was no previous commitment given by uh, the now opposition uh, just before the election that they would pay these bonuses. The, the Prime Minister has made it absolutely plain that as far as these bonuses are concerned, no carer, no senior will be worse off. He's also given a guarantee that what we'll do is give some security to these people so that they're not hanging out every budget. They're not hanging out every budget for uh, information about uh, whether or not these, these bonuses will be paid. I do want to uh, also uh, make a few remarks about the very important election commitments that we're about to uh, deliver to over three million Australians, to seniors, carers and people with a disability. And that will be with the increase in the utilities allowance. We're uh, increasing the utilities allowance from its current level of $107 to $500 a year, and we're going to pay it on a quarterly basis. Uh, what we also know is uh, just how important this is for those uh, who are on the seniors' concession allowance. So for those eligible self-funded retirees, they too will be getting the uh, $500 utility allowance and it will be paid quarterly to them. In fact, the only threat to this utilities allowance that currently exists is, uh, is, the, is the need for the current opposition to make sure that there's no nonsense in the Senate when this issue is debated this week. This government wants to make sure that this utilities allowance is paid on the 20th of March as we promised. We promised that it would be paid on a quarterly basis. We promised that it will be paid on the 20th, that the first instalment will be paid on the 20th of March. And in fact, the only thing standing in the way of that uh, promise is, in fact, the uh, federal opposition. We want to be able to give. We want to be able to give this additional uh, help to uh, senior Australians, to carers, to people with a disability. So I'd ask the Leader of the Opposition to guarantee that there won't be any delays, no delays in the Senate while this, uh, while this uh, issue uh, is debated so that we can make sure that uh, the seniors, the carers, the people with disability actually get what they need. We hear from those op opposite that, um, that they wanted to uh, do this. They wanted to do it. Well, they actually had 11 years 
to increase the uh, utilities allowance. They had 11 years to, uh, to make sure that the utilities allowance was available to carers. They had 11 years to make sure that the uh, utilities allowance was available to uh, people with a dis disability. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, each and every one of us know, but more importantly, each and every senior Australian, each and every carer, each and every uh, person with a disability in Australia knows that that utility allowance was, one, not increased to $500 by the uh, previous government. That was never done. That was never done by the previous government. And secondly, it was not extended to carers. It was not, ex it, it was not extended to uh, people with a disability. This, mo this money is very important to help people with the rising cost of living. It will be delivered on the, the first instalment will be delivered on the 20th of March next week, as long as the uh, opposition makes sure that it's quickly delivered uh, through the Senate. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, Mr Speaker, I did say at the outset uh, that we understand the concerns of carers. We understand the very significant financial pressures they're under. We also understand the very significant financial pressures that senior Australians are under. And so that's why we've made sure, uh, and the Prime Minister has assured these most vulnerable members of our community that it, when it comes to these bonuses that uh, they won't be one dollar worse off under the forthcoming budget. Order. It is important that people Order. are given that financial the security and this government expired. will give it to them. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the no's have it. Division required. Vision required, ring the bells.
Uh, lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina tellers for the ayes and the members for Werriwa and Shortland tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 59, noes 81. The question is therefore negatived. Members, please resume their places quickly and quietly. Resume their places quietly or quickly. The member for Warringah. My question without notice is to the Prime no, Minister. The member will resume no, his seat. Been... The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. Members resume their places. Questions without notice, are there further questions? Member for Leichhardt. Inform the House of the Leichhardt. The member for Leichhardt will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, the continuation of question time was identified The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. I know what is going on here, and it's a try on because of an incident in the last sitting fortnight in completely different circumstances. Completely different circumstances where people were still resuming their seat. Because if the member for North Sydney was wanting to take a full picture of the chamber, the member for Leichhardt was standing on his lonesome at his place at the same time the honourable member for Warringah was attempting to get the call. Now there are, is a limit to the amount of nonsense that I will take. There is a limit. There is a limit. No, I'm, I, I am calling it as something that I believe to be deliberately disruptive. It is not deliberately disruptive. It is about the standards of the House, Mr. Speaker. And exactly, that is for exactly the point I am making. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. 
In the other example, I gave a full explanation of what happened. The member for North Sydney might claim that there was some confusion, but the member that did not seek the call could have done something to make sure that that confusion was not the same. In this case, in this case when people were resuming their places, I could have quite easily given the call to the member for Leichhardt straight away with people running around. Because people were on their feet going around. Now, look, I am really trying to get the chamber into a point where there is a bit of respect shown to everybody. And in fairness, in fairness, I think that I've tried to, to do the right thing in rotating the call. As I have said to as I've said to the member for North Sydney privately, and I do not wish to embarrass the member for Wentworth, but I wish he hadn't dropped the two inches. And then this wouldn't be a point. Now the rotation of the call is the member for Leichhardt has the call. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Can the Minister inform the House of the latest developments in quarantine? The Minister for Fisheries, Forestry, the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Um, Mr. Speaker, shortly before, no, short, shortly before question time today, uh, I was advised of a certification error by the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service which may have a significant impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. AQUIS has advised that on the 23rd of November last year, under the previous government, cattle were exported to New Caledonia from Australia, which were vaccinated against the disease babesiosis instead of being treated with a, a chemical treatment as required by New Caledonia's import requirements. Animals vaccinated against babesiosis can be a source of infection to ticks. I'm advised that the export of vaccinated cattle to New Caledonia has allowed the disease to enter their tick population and cause a disease outbreak in their local cattle. While information on this issue is still coming to hand, it seems clear, first of all, that there was a certification error by AQUIS and that as a result of that error, there may be a significant impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. On hearing this information prior to question time, I immediately held a telephone conference with the secretary of my department, who is also the director of quarantine, and am urgently seeking more information, including what assistance measures can be provided to New Caledonia, and hope to meet with their ambassador later today. I understand that AQUIS is seeking expert advice from the Queensland Tick Fever Institute on ways to manage the exported cattle. Uh, and cattle which have been in contact with the exported animals in New Caledonia. Preliminary advice is that treating all the cattle, those exported from Australia and the New Caledonian cattle, in contact with them by injecting the chemical imazole would kill the organism in the cattle and prevent further transmission of the diseased ticks. I understand that AQUIS is also seeking advice on how to ensure that the disease is eradicated from the New Caledonian tick population. I also took the opportunity uh, during the, the last hour to speak with Russell Bock of the Queensland Tick Fever Institute, who has confirmed that the institute is willing to assist the New Caledonian authorities in whatever way it can to help them deal with the outbreak, including serological testing. Russell Bock raised with me that in order for them to be able to receive the samples, they will require cooperation from AQUIS and I've received uh, an email in the last couple of minutes from the Director of Quarantine and Secretary of my department confirming that AQUIS will expedite the import permits for samples from New Caledonia to be sent to Australia for serological analysis by the Queensland Tick Fever Centre. Mr Speaker, members will already be aware that I announced a review into Australia's this is important information and a major impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. Mr Speaker, Members will be aware that I, previously, that I previously announced the review by Mr Roger Bealeo into Australia's quarantine services. It is important, critically important, both for the protection of the biosecurity in Australia, 
that our quarantine and biosecurity services be, be robust. It is also of critical importance for the neighbouring companies to which we provide a service under agreed protocols. This review will help inform that process and we are also making sure that we meet all our obligations with respect to the government of New Caledonia. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The member for Hinkler. Oh. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it, this is a question to you, and it's not made with any malice nor to prolong an unfortunate incident. <clears throat> but I ask you to reflect on an incident that occurred in respect of the member for uh, Moncrief when he was excluded from the House under 94A on the, the Friday afternoon that we have been discussing this day. Um, he was excluded under 94A and indeed escorted from the chamber by the sergeant at arms. It seems to me then you had imposed the penalty and that it was executed in his removal. The business of the House continued, albeit somewhat disruptively, for a number of minutes when you subsequently said, I name him. I put it to you, Mr Speaker, that that would be improper as it would constitute a double jeopardy, and I ask you to reflect on that and report back to the House. Order. As I've indicated to the House, it's not my intention to enter into a question and answer session about the proceedings of the parliament, but I will make an exception in this case because I just wish to remind the member for Hinkler that uh, I thank the member for Boothby for his primer about what was the appropriate action that I should take, having invited the sergeant at arms to escort a member from the chamber that I was obliged to name him, and that's why we proceeded to that point. Whether we should then blame the member for Boothby for the action that happened to the member for Moncrief or not, I don't think we should be that harsh. But that, that was simply um, the, the course of action that was carried out. Intuitively, I may have been trying to give the member for Moncrief an hour, but uh, having been reminded of my obligations, uh, we got to the point in time which had its conclusion today. So the doc will have to answer to the member for Moncrief. The uh, member for Macmillan. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a number of the standing orders and uh, procedures of the House now refer to the Friday sitting. I take it they will be what? Uh, when will they be revert? Can we actually act on those? procedures and standing orders at this time when they actually refer to a Friday sitting and not other sittings times of the House? I'm in the hands of the House. They, they represent the standing orders at the moment, but I understand that they'll be, they'll be dealt with. The Leader of the House on indulgence. On indulgence, Mr Speaker. This was asked by the Manager of Opposition Business uh, before question time today. I indicated that a series of standing orders have been drafted uh, with the assistance, as usual, of, uh, of the, the, the clerks in terms of making sure that they are in order. Uh, those I intend to put on notice today, I intend to put them on notice for debate uh, later on the week so that no one on that side of the House can say that they didn't have an opportunity to peruse them. It is within uh, my uh, ability to seek leave to have those standing orders debated and voted upon uh, at a time of my choosing, but that would require leave to be given by the opposition. And uh, frankly, given the, uh, the lack of goodwill Order. that has Order. been— The honourable member will resume his seat. The honourable member will resume his seat. Order. The Minister for Family, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to make a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have been misrepresented? I do, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The member for Warringah repeated a report from the Sydney Morning Herald from the 7th of March about comments one of my staff made about bonus payments. I've written to the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, indicating that my staff member did not make uh, these remarks uh, as they were reported. <coughs> 
Order, I, order, I present the following Order to General's audit reports for 2007-2008. Number 24, Performance Audit, DIAX Management of Introduction of Biometric Technologies, Department of Immigration and Citizenship. Number 25, Performance Audit, Administering Round-the-Clock Medicare Grants, Department of Health and Ageing. And number 26, Performance Audit, Tasmanian Forest Industry Development and Assistance Programs, Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that the reports be made parliamentary papers. Order. The question is that the reports be made parliamentary papers. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, the following documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. The clerk. I present a copy of the order of the High Court of Australia remitting the election petition Mitchell against Bailey and another to the Federal Court of Australia. Order. I have received a letter from the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the need for a clear commitment to protect vulnerable Australians and ensure they benefit from a strong economy. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, a censure motion was moved against the Prime Minister and the Australian Government. And that censure motion was moved uh, because, uh, on this side of the House, we do not have confidence that the government, and the Prime Minister in particular, understands the importance of building a strong economy so you can actually assist the weak, the sick, the unfortunate, and in this case especially uh, carers, seniors, the elderly and the frail. You don't attack the vulnerable to make a strong economy. In fact, uh, the government, if it really wanted to pick on someone its own size, would, would, should go no further than the state uh, governments, which at the moment have in excess of $40 billion of debt, headed over the next three years to more than $80 billion. Instead of that, the government and the Prime Minister in particular, as the chairman of the so-called Razor Gang, has chosen to use Australia's carers and the vulnerable as human shields in their campaign against uh, inflationary pressures. I ask, Mr Speaker, uh, is this government so obsessed with media management and bread and circuses that it's become blind to what in the end is the real purpose of government? Has it become deaf to the pleas of anguished despair coming from this nation's most vulnerable that it simply can't say with certainty that these lump sum cash payments to them are guaranteed? I ask Mr, Sp Mr Deputy Speaker, why is it so hard for the Prime Minister, given every opportunity through questions, through a censure motion, to stand at the dispatch box and say not only or so much to this House, but more importantly to the 400,000 carers that are behind this, and those Australians above the age of 65 and the elderly especially that are so reliant on that cash payment of $500, that the $1,600 and $500, why is the Prime Minister and the government not able nor man enough to actually guarantee them that they will receive a lump sum payment. Instead of that, we've had these mealy-mouthed words about, oh, they won't be worse off. They won't be a cent worse off. Well, look, Mr Sp Deputy Speaker, we on this side, and I as a former cabinet minister myself for six years, know only too well as you go through the budget process, there is debate. There's debate about the defence budget, about the health budget, about the education budget, about roads. There's a whole debate about those things. But I say to the Prime Minister, when he gets back to the lodge tonight, he should ask one of his staff to get for him a recording of his contribution in the censure motion on this issue of carers and seniors. He needs to sit down in a quiet place and actually have a look and a, at himself 
and listen to what he was saying. Because what he needs to do is to make sure that the balance sheet that he's got, and he sounds like and he increasingly looks like a bureaucrat running an economy and running a public service, than he does a prime minister leading a group of men and women who should be committed to building a better and a more caring Australia. The one thing that the prime minister has not got on his balance sheet is people, because in the end that's what it's all about. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I go, for example, to Mary Lou Carter, and she said to the Daily Telegraph on the 11th of March, she said, "If this was about symbolism, it's a terrible thing to have to prove how tough you are by attacking the weakest in the community." End of quote. The Chief Executive of Carers Australia, Joan Hughes, to Channel 7 on the 8th of March, said this, and I quote. I don't get why they would be picking on some of the most vulnerable people who were really struggling to survive. It's a real kick in the face for many family carers. Or Mr Ashley Norman, the 73-year-old man in Mackay who's dying, cared for by his wife Pat of 52 years, when he said, and I quote, to the Australian newspaper on the 7th of March, he said, and I quote, my wife gets $100 a fortnight to look after me. She's got to do everything I did, everything she did, and care for me like a baby. What's he, Mr Rudd, what he's doing is criminal. To take $1,600 off us after giving it to us every year for four years is criminal." End of quote. He also said on the Late Line ABC program on the 10th of March, he said this, and I quote, of the Prime Minister, he said, he is an absolute Jekyll and Hyde. Prior to the election, for God's sake, everyone thought he was a wonderful man. Since he's been elected, he's turned into an absolute ogre. Pam and Wal Beckhouse, whose 37-year-old son John is autistic and profoundly deaf, and Pam said this to Channel 10 on the 7th of March, I just can't believe that a Labor government would do that. The carers have given up a lot to do that caring, and they don't deserve to be treated like rubbish. And Wall said, "There's a lot of cranky people out there." Well, that is an understatement, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There are a lot of cranky people out there, but they're more than cranky. These are desperate people who live quiet lives of desperation, trying to look after people whom they love, and in the process, saving this country an enormous amount of money in the effort that they make for those whom they love and for whom they care. I say to the Prime Minister, after just uh, more than three months as the Prime Minister of Australia, I say this to the Prime Minister, whatever you do, Prime Minister, remember in the end it is about building a better society. It's about building a more caring society. It's about reaching out to people who feel they have neither power nor a voice in this country and making absolutely certain that decisions are made with them foremost in mind. Whatever the bureaucrats have told you, whatever you tell yourself as a former bureaucrat, the most important thing the Prime Minister needs to do at the moment is to reassure these 400,000 carers, to reassure those pensioners, seniors, elderly and frail, that they will receive the lump sum cash payment in this year's budget. Because whilst Prime Minister, as a bureaucrat, being driven by a bunch of bureaucrats, you sound like a man dealing with a balance sheet rather than a man who is actually grappling with day-to-day -day human struggles and desperate concern to look after others in greater need than yourself. Just remember, Prime Minister, that in the end, in addition to income and expenditure, the government's balance sheet must always include people. This is about human beings. This is about dignity of human life. And as far as we on this side are concerned, and on behalf of the 400,000 carers in this country, the seniors, the elderly and the frail, we say to you, Prime Minister, be honest and open with them and guarantee them that they will receive their lump sum payment. And in doing so, whatever the niceties of the bureaucrats and the balance sheets, that will give more comfort 
and certainty these for these people, some of whom will not even live until the budget, about how they will be able to manage their finances in the year ahead. Yeah. I call the Minister, the Assistant Treasurer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It appears that the Leader of the Opposition couldn't even find five minutes more of hypocrisy to fill his speech. Finishes five minutes early, couldn't find five minutes more hypocrisy. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the height of the opposition knows no bounds. Let, me, let us deal first with the matter of carers' bonuses. The opposition leader says, the opposition leader says that the government is ignoring carers because we won't guarantee on the 11th of March the exact detail, the exact detail of what will be announced in the budget. We won't outline every last dollar on the 11th of March about what will be in the budget in relation to carers. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's instructive to go back and look at the record. At the uh, 2004 budget, the first budget that introduced a bonus for the, uh, for the carers, the Treasurer, the then Treasurer of the member for Higgins said, and I quote, Tonight I announced that around 80,000 people on the carer payment will receive an additional one-off payment of $1,000. That was announced on the 11th of May 2004, not the 11th of March today, the 11th of May. We then go on to 2005, the 10th of May. The then Treasurer said, tonight I announce as I did last budget. So there wasn't this great concern from the Liberal Party that in March or February or April we have to put carers' minds at ease about whether they're going to get the bonus. They left it until budget night. And then we went along, then we went along to 2006. What did the then Treasurer say? I quote, Tonight I announce, as I did in the last two budgets, an additional $1,000 announced on the 9th of May, not the 9th of March. The previous government left it until budget night. And then, of course, last year, 2007, the 8th of May. What did the then Treasurer say? I also announce tonight for the fourth consecutive year that recipients of the carer payment will receive $1,000 and recipients of the carer allowance a bonus of $600 each for each eligible person in their care. So each night for the last four years on budget night, the then Treasurer outlined that these bonuses would be paid. They didn't take it upon themselves in March or April or February to make that announcement. They announced it in May. And of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, they now in opposition, they now in opposition say it's incumbent on the government of the day to clear this up on the 11th of March, that it's outrageous, it's callous, it's heartless unless we tell people on the 11th of March exactly how the payments will be paid. And of course, Mr. Deputy, Mr Deputy Speaker, on each of those budgets, never once did the Treasurer say, never once did the Treasurer of the day say, and I'm announcing tonight that we are budgeting for this into the future. Never once did he say, I'm announcing tonight that it will be in the forward estimates. Never once did he say that we're going to put money aside going into the future to provide certainty for carers. He said it was a one-off bonus on every occasion, and yet this hypocritical opposition waltzes in here and has the high to suggest that this government is not being caring when it comes to carers. Mr Deputy Speaker, being lectured by this mob about vulnerable people is like being lectured by Paris Hilton on public modesty. Mr Speaker, their hide knows no bounds. They have they ha if hypocrisy was a crime, they would all be serving time at Her Majesty's pleasure, Mr Deputy Speaker, because, because Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a cheap political stunt from a desperate opposition. These people, these people had the hide to come in here and lecture us about carers, but more importantly, Mr Deputy Speaker, they had the hide to come in here and to lecture us about vulnerable people generally. Now, of course, carers and our elderly are vulnerable. But there are more examples. Now, the people who have the hide to propose this matter of public importance are to a man and a woman the same people who voted for work choices. Not once, not twice, but on multiple occasions. And Mr Deputy Speaker, can I say the number of vulnerable people in this country will be reduced dramatically the day that the stain of work choices is removed from the legal record of this country? when this government is able to remove Australian workplace agreements and remove work choices from the official record of the laws of this country. And if you need any evidence of that, let's have a look at the list that the Deputy Prime Minister released uh, earlier this year. 
of the working conditions that vulnerable people had taken off them by the previous government. 70 per cent of AWAs removed shift workloadings. We're talking about the MPI on vulnerable people. 68 per cent removed annual leave loading. 65 per cent removed penalty rates. 63 per cent removed incentive-based payments and bonuses. 61 per cent removed days to be substituted for public holidays. 56 per cent removed monetary allowances. 50 per cent removed public holidays payment. 49 per cent removed overtime loadings. 31 per cent removed rest breaks and 25 per cent removed declared public holidays. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the limited data revealed that 75 per cent of the 1,500 AWA sampled did not provide for a guaranteed wage uh, increase. Don't come in here and lecture us about vulnerable people. It's vulnerable people who were created by you. We know you're in favour of vulnerable people. That's why you created so many in your 11 years in office with your work choices regime, which the Australian people passed judgment on on the 24th of November. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it wouldn't be so bad if they'd learnt their lesson. It wouldn't be so bad if they'd recognised that the Australian people passed judgment on the 24th of November and work choices was now dead. We saw the unedifying spectacle of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition over the last few days saying the Opposition neither supports or opposes the government's move to eradicate work choices. Now, this is her grand plan, to neither support nor oppose the government's moves to abolish work choices. Billy Sneddon likes, she says, I have the solution. We will neither support nor oppose it. No wonder the Australian people have come to the conclusion the Liberal Party has lost their way. I'll say one thing about the former Prime Minister. At least we knew where he stood. At least we knew what he believed in. At least we knew, as strongly as we disagreed with it, that he believed in work choices. With these people, they refuse to admit it. They refuse to guarantee how they'll vote on work choices because they neither support nor oppose it. They just don't get it. They just don't get the message that the Australian people gave them about vulnerable people. They think that they can, they can score a cheap political point on the backs of carers, hard-working carers in this country. They think that they can use that as their way out of their political problems. That is their way out of their leadership speculation. Well, they can't, because the Australian people know what they really think about vulnerable people. The Australian people know what they really think about workers and working families who are vulnerable when the industrial relations system has its balance tipped so far in one direction that the Prime Minister of the day becomes the second Prime Minister in Australian history to lose his seat. The Australian people see through this, Bob, and, and coming in here and posturing about vulnerable people won't work. Don't lecture us about putting people first. Don't come in here and lecture us about how it's important that the balance sheet in includes people when you imposed work choices on the Australian people. The, the, the longest suicide note in Australian political history, which the Australian people passed judgment on. And Mr Deputy Speaker, we had the spectacle of the former Minister for Workplace Relations on Four Corners just a couple of weeks ago, saying that members of the Cabinet when he took over the portfolio, did not know that vulnerable people could have working conditions removed under work choices. He said, quite frankly, when I took over the job, I don't think many ministers in cabinet were aware that you could be worse off under work choices and you could actually have certain conditions taken away without compensation. And Liz Jackson said, you're saying to me that cabinet colleagues were unaware that you could be worse off? And the member for North Sydney said, some were worse, some were, yeah, yep, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, they haven't learned. Now, of course, there is another category of vulnerable people in this country. They are the people who are vulnerable at the prospect of losing their homes. They are the people who are at the tipping point at the moment, who are wondering how many more interest rate increases there will be because this government, the previous government, couldn't get inflation under control. The people throughout Western Sydney the people represented by the member for Lindsay and the member for Blacksland and myself and the member for Fowler and the member for Reid, who are struggling in the killing fields of Western Sydney mortgages, who have the highest repossession rates in Australian history. They're vulnerable people. They're vulnerable people. That's why this government is taking difficult decisions. That's why this budget, delivered in May, will increase the surplus to 1.5 per cent of GDP to put downward pressure, to put downward pressure on interest rates, something they could never do. 
something they couldn't be bothered to do because the previous Treasurer said inflation is right where we want it. Well, it's not right where we want it for the people of Western Sydney who are struggling to keep their home. It's not right where, they, where we want it for them because it's putting upward pressure on interest rates. And that's not something this government is prepared to stand by and watch, which they were. Now, Vulnerable people, Mr Speaker, are people who are at risk of losing their home. Now these are the people who the current alternative treasurer, the current alternative treasurer, the member for Wentworth, said on his way into the house, on his way into the house through the doors, that were over dramatising a 25 per cent, a 25 basis point increase in interest rates. He said, well, we shouldn't get too concerned about this. It's only a 25 basis point increase. It's only a quarter of 1 per cent. It's being over dramatised. That's what they think about vulnerable people. They believe that it's a small increase in interest rates that shouldn't be over dramatised. Well, it's pretty dramatic if you're at risk of losing your home. It's pretty dramatic if your life stream, the house that you have built up, is in, is in danger of being lost forever. So these guys who come in here and have the hide, the temerity and the hypocrisy to lecture us about vulnerable people should go and look in the mirror. They should say, well, we never put the carers' bonus in the forward estimates. We never budgeted for it. We never had the wit. We never had the wit to put aside the money into forward estimates. We never had the wit. We never cared about people who we put on the heap in, with our work choices reforms, so-called reforms, and we certainly never cared about the people that da of danger of losing their house in Western Sydney, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Australian people are smart enough to see through an opposition, which, which suddenly discovers compassion on the 25th of November 2007, which, cut, which suddenly decides that a balance sheet should include people, which suddenly decides which suddenly decides, Mr Deputy Speaker, that carers are so important that we should put aside money for them into the future, that we should put the money in the forward estimates. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Australian people understand that this government won't make those sorts of mistakes. This government has made very clear that when it comes to improving the resources for carers, we can always do better. Carers fulfil a vital role in society, and no government, frankly, will ever do enough. No government ever could do enough for those people. But what we can do, what we can do, is for the modest support we can give them, we can be fair dinkum about it, and we can make an allocation for it going forward. And we won't leave them hanging till the budget night every year, 9th, 10th of May, for the treasurer of the day to say, "Tonight I announce a bonus." What we will do is ensure that. They are no worse off as a result of this budget, and they have some guarantees going forward. And that's an essential difference between the approach taken by the heartless government which preceded us and the government which was voted in by the Australian people on the 24th of November. And for the Leader of the Opposition, who was a member of the Cabinet which approved work choices, who was a member of the Cabinet which did not make an allocation for carers' payments, who was a member of the Cabinet which included the Treasurer who said inflation is right where we want it so we will not take any action on fiscal policy. It is the, it is the epitome of hypocrisy for him to come in here and to blush and bluster and froth at the mouth in his confected ways and to say it's time for the Australian people to be shown some compassion, to be shown some compassion because they are the people who for 11 years left vulnerable people hanging. They are the people who, for four years, put a bonus into the surplus, into the budget, but did not allocate it going forward. They are the people who have made, who have made cheap political points off the back of hard-working carers, who have used carers as a political hobby horse in order to get themselves out of their current political difficulty because nobody knows what they stand for anymore. The once great party that once stood for something has been reduced to crocodile tears and throttling at the mouth about this issue when they refuse to make any allocation in the budget going forward. They refuse to put the money aside. They had other priorities, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Vulnerable people in Australia know this is this, this, this will always be there. there. Call the honourable member for McPherson. Deputy Speaker, one would have to wonder, listening to the previous speaker, if we actually are talking about people. 
We are talking about the most vulnerable people in our communities, our senior Australians and our carers, and that's what we have been talking about this afternoon. I would ask the previous member, have you not been reading the press over the last four days? These are the people in Australia who have been threatened by your government. You are the ones who have gone out to the media talking about the bonus. You are the ones who are causing the anxiety and the stress with senior Australians. They are the ones feeling unsure of the future because you as a government will not commit to a bonus that they have received for the past four years, a bonus that has helped make their lives easier and given them a choice about what they do with that bonus. And that bonus was paid because of our surplus. We gave back to the people who'd given to us. And you need to think about that too. Can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is my belief that the Rudd government is actually dudding our carers and our pensioners. Right, yeah. They are dudding them. This government is causing so much anxiety, so much anxiety amongst our carers and amongst our aged. You will not commit to the bonus. All you will say is they will not be worse off under a Rudd government under your budget brought down in May. But at no time today, Mr Deputy Speaker, have we heard how they will not be worse off. You will not spell out, the Prime Minister will not spell out, how those people are going to be paid. They don't want to be drip-fed. And in fact, every caller to my office who has spoken about this wants a lump sum payment because it gives them choice about what they do with those extra dollars. It gives them choice about where those dollars are spent. And there is a concern that if it is paid as part of their age pension or as part of their carer's payment, it can be taxed. Do we need to incur more taxes on older Australians or carers? Will you guarantee that it is not taxed if, in fact, it is paid as part of their age pension or their carer's payment? I can tell you that people calling my office, the pension groups, the individuals, feel cheated. They feel let down by this government. They don't believe this government is listening. Because, in fact, if you had listened over the last few days, the Prime Minister would have come into this House today and told those Australians, those most vulnerable Australians, exactly what you were going to do in the budget. Instead, the anxiety and the worry is there, and it's going to be there for two months. Two months of worrying about how this is going to be paid. It is despicable. The Prime Minister says they will not be worse off, but that is not guaranteed because the Prime Minister won't outline how those people won't be worse off. Carers and senior Australians need to know where they stand in relation to the carers and the seniors' bonus. Today we've heard a lot about those carers in our communities. The Leader of the Opposition has detailed those personal stories, and I ask today in the House a question of the Prime Minister on behalf of Mr Norman, who had contacted my office. Where are those seven letters? The Prime Minister has lost the seven letters. He has denied that a senior adviser said to Mr Norman that the carer's bonus and the seniors' bonus had been scrapped. That was a senior adviser advising Mr Norman that that was what was going to happen. We've heard from the Leader of the Opposition today about Mr Norman's story. He, in fact, contacted my office on a number of occasions to discuss what was going on. This is the human face of what we are talking about today the human face of the most vulnerable in our communities who are going to be the most affected. 
You talk about us not being caring when we were in government. For four years, we paid these bonuses. We were able to pay those because of our good economic management. It was because we had a budget surplus. We were able to give back to those people. And they came to expect that every year. They want to see it again this year. This former government left a budget surplus, double digits. Why can't part of that surplus be given back to these people in our communities? I am sure everyone sitting on the, on the other side of the House in government today has had calls to their office, concerns raised with every member in this House about these bonuses and whether or not they will be paid. I guarantee every one of you has had a call, and I dare you to come to the, the dispatch box and say you haven't. These people need to be looked after. And in fact, can I say, um, on behalf of the, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Norman actually wrote to the Leader of the Opposition mm. as well. Mm. Not only did the Leader of the Opposition visit Mr Norman, but he actually answered his correspondence. Mr Norman wrote to, our, to the Leader of the Opposition on the 13th of February, and he received a response on the 18th of February. Does that say something about how much we care about people like Mr Norman? Yes. Our leader even went and visited Mr Norman. Where, Where has your Prime Minister been? He certainly out. didn't answer any of the letters written by Mr Norman outlining what was happening in his life. Can I also say the Minister for Ageing, in the, in the newspapers in our local area at the weekend, she would represent the local interests. Well, I say to the Minister for Ageing, she is the National Minister for Ageing, and she should be representing all older Australians, each and every one of those older Australians who have contacted all of us regarding these payments. It is important that they know that they have a representative sitting in this House who is prepared to go into bat for them. They deserve nothing less. One thing that also hasn't been said is this is going to affect veterans in our communities. That's right, that's right. Do you know how many of our veterans receive these bonus payments? Yes. These are the men and women who have served their country, and they have served it graciously, with dignity, under our flag. What are we doing about our veterans? Are we ignoring the contribution they have made to our country? The contribution made by all older Australians in, in building this wonderful nation of ours. They deserve this bonus. They deserve to know what this government is going to do when that budget is brought down in May. What they don't deserve is two months of uncertainty and anxiety. The Prime Minister of this country needs to tell older Australians and carers what he intends to do in that May, May budget. You are the ones that have brought this to the media. Now you have all these older Australians worrying about their future and their bonuses and whether or not they will have the flexibility and the choice to spend that very small bonus in the way in which it is most going to benefit them. They need to know it is coming. And I call on the Prime Minister and the Minister for Ageing to assure older Australians, our veterans, our carers, that they will be looked after with a one-off bonus in the May budget this year, 2008, so they can make those choices about how that money is spent to the best advantage for themselves. I call the Parliamentary Secretary for Disabilities and Children's Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the one hand, in this debate, we see that Labor is proposing a raft of measures to protect the vulnerable and to ensure that they benefit from a strong economy. But on the other hand, I have to say that the previous government disappointed and failed to protect vulnerable Australians during their tenure in government. Appropriately, this debate has been about carers and pensioners, 
but I'd like to draw particular attention to people with disabilities who are at the centre of potentially being the most vulnerable people in our community. And I think if we look at the policies of the Rudd Labor government and contrast it with the scoreboard of the last 11 years, it can only draw the conclusion that if you're vulnerable in this society, you're far better off having a Labor government in Canberra. And when I try to assess what vulnerable, when I try to assess what vulnerable means, I actually think that is someone who lacks human rights, someone who lacks the opportunity for education, to enjoy wealth, home ownership, indeed access to buildings, jobs and income. And I heard at question time very clearly, as we have over the last number of days, our Prime Minister saying that in this budget, whatever will be done will be done fairly, and that this government appreciates the invaluable work of carers and seniors and the work they do for the community. In fact, we in the Labor Party have a century-long commitment to the fair go, and that certainly won't end on budget night. That's why when carers and seniors compare their bonus payments this year with what they received last year, they'll be no worse off. No worse off, Mr Speaker. And in addition, the government's increased the utilities allowance to $500 per year and for the first time ever extended it to recipients of the carers' payment. And we also know that carers and seniors need more financial certainty than they've been receiving in recent years. The bonuses, which the opposition is so loudly shouting about now, we found out in budget speech after budget speech were well, one-off payments. There was never a guarantee under the old mob. No promise into the future, no commitment, no guarantee and, sadly, no plan. This is the system which we have inherited. This is the system we are working with. But, Mr Speaker, I can, I can be reliably assure you that things will get better. The idea that Labor lacks compassion is simply laughable. As I've said in this place before, as I've said in this place before, Labor has always been the party which cares about all Australians, which understands the need in our community for support in the system. Mr. Speaker, the Whitlam government was the first to commit to indexing pensions to cost of living increases, and it delivered in its first six months the single mother's benefit, the first Commonwealth income support payment to single parents. In the late 80s and the early 90s, the reformist Hawke and Keating governments introduced the family assistance package, child support payments. They replaced the unemployment benefit with the New Start and Job Start allowance, linking for the first time social security payments with an active non-punitive employment participation scheme. They introduced the sole parent pension, set at the same level as the age pension. They in fact replaced the invalid pension with a disability support pension. And let us not forget that in 1991, it was the superannuation guarantee charge which provide low-income Australian working families with the opportunity and the prospect of some retirement income. Because, and this is why we go on with this debate, Labor has always been the party who has protected the most vulnerable in our community. And when we hear the, the opposition say that they are now the models, they are the Mother Teresas and St Bernards of compassion, where was their compassion in 2003 when they planned to cut 30,000 families of child, off the child care allowance? What is it about Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, cystic fibrosis, epilepsy and PKU that would require those disabilities to be taken off the list of recognised conditions for the child care allowance? It was only through the efforts of Labor and carer groups and no doubt a few quiet voices of conscience in the now opposition these savage cuts were reversed. And when I look at my own portfolio area of disabilities and children's service, I look at the opposition who had the chance for 11 years to demonstrate their commitment and disabilities, and I take nothing away from individual members of the opposition, such as the member for Macmillan, who's, taken a big, who's already approached me about issues in disability and government. But apart from these individual contributions, the numbers, the scoreboard of the last 11 years reflect that the most vulnerable in this community, people living with disabilities, severe and profound disabilities, were missing out. In fact, the number of people pushed onto the disability support pension grew from 500,000 to 720,000. And indeed, this is despite the Howard government's much vaunted, although significantly punitive, welfare to work. All that what happened is that people tried, that were pushed off the pension and the endeavours to punish people was to create fear. It was money saving. It was never about people with disabilities. And I have a look at, I have a look at some of the, C, I have a look at some of the numbers which the OECD have reported about disability in Australia at the coming of power of Labor. And the numbers are not pretty and do not reflect well on the most vulnerable in this community in the last 11 years. There's been a falling, a falling expenditure on sickness benefits by the previous governments. 
The employment rate of people with disability has been falling. It's under 40 per cent, which puts us well down the bottom of the charts in the OECD. People with disability the member for Flinders may not be aware of these numbers because I can assume that he can't be saying that they're wrong. People with disability below 50 per cent of the median income has been rising. So the relative poverty of people with disabilities has been increasing under the previous government. If you have a look at the income of people with disability relative to those without, it's been falling under the previous government. Why does it take four years? for the Building Code of Australia to be reviewed to see that new access to premises can align up with the Disability Discrimination Act? Why does it take 11 years of having an acting human rights commissioner in disability? These are the people who speak up on issues. Why is it that in Australia for the last 11 years that if you can't go into a shop, if you can't, if you can't catch an aeroplane, if you can't get a job, if you have half the educational outcomes of people without disabilities, why is this not viewed as a scandal? And why, was not, why, was, why were things not done by the previous government to remedy these issues? If you, couldn't, if, you couldn't access, if you couldn't access entry to a shop, if you couldn't get, if you couldn't get a job, if you, if, you suffer income, if you suffer relative poverty because of your, because of your skin colour or your gender, there'd be a hue and cry. But because it's someone with a disability, the most vulnerable in the society, whom now we're hearing the crocodile tears about the one-off bonus payment issue, where was the opposition when they were in government championing the rights and equal treatment of people with disabilities? So when I hear a debate, when I hear a debate about protecting the most vulnerable, yet I look at the second class treatment which people with disabilities have been receiving, then I actually realise there's been something terribly unfair happening in Australia. There was an initiative of the, opposi the now opposition to set up special trusts. Not a bad idea. The problem is it was executed poorly. Only 17 people, families in Australia, have been able to exercise and access the special trust opportunities to secure people's future. Good idea, poorly executed, and it'll be up to Labor to fix it up, and we'll welcome the suggestions of the opposition on how to improve it. But why is it in Australia that if you work in what was once known as a sheltered workshop, now known as a business employment service, why did the previous government pay you $25 less in mobility allowance? The taxi you get to the work site is no less cheaper than the taxi you get when you go to open employment. Why is it that in the current arrangements, if you are on the disability support pension, as you would have been under the previous government, and you wanted to do work experience, then you had to lose your pension? We created in the last government—not we, actually, the opposition created in the last government—a culture of fear. So when we hear today a debate about standing up for the carers of people with disabilities. What I want to understand is where was the now opposition collectively, as opposed to the individual efforts of some in the opposition, where were they on the rights of the disabled? Well, the member for Flinders realises that the point which I'm making can't be debated because he understands that the poverty, when Australians, by virtue of having a physical impairment, or an intellectual disability or a mental illness in Australia have a less chance to get a job, less chance to own a house, less chance to get an education, less chance to be able to access buildings, less chance to receive equal treatment. Please let's spare us the hypocrisy of the debate about the one-off bonuses, which the Prime Minister has made perfectly clear what will happen. But I have to say that Peter Martin, the economics editor of the Canberra Times, in his article today, says it more eloquently, I suspect, than I can. He says, he says but, but it, is worth, it is worth applying what he says for the record. He says carers themselves, while grateful for the coalition's last-minute budget balancing exercises, were never happy about the way they were treated. The head of carers ACT, Dee McGrath, told the Canberra Times last week that the problem with the bonus payments was that they were non-recurrent and this was setting up false expectations this was a very dangerous thing. He goes on. It is the coalition that should be condemned for the way in which it treats carers, not the Rudd government. Had it recompensed them properly, it would have cost much more, he goes on to write. It would have been a permanent part of the budget. The Prime Minister and Minister for Families and Community Order. Services the made it very clear. Time has expired. I call the honourable member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
Well, I trust the parliamentary secretary opposite will go and give a lecture to his leader because the leader's, the prime minister's performance here in the censure motion this afternoon was an absolute disgrace. He showed absolutely no care or compassion at all. The question was put to him: Would he rise to that dispatch box today and say to those carers and the people for whom they care that their apprehension, that their feeling of being um, in a situation of uncertainty as to whether or not they are going to be able to cope could be laid to rest if the Prime Minister had simply risen to that box and said that lump sum payment will continue. That's all he had to do. Now, I, I turn to this fascinating use of weasel words. First of all, the Prime Minister said, we won't leave these people in the lurch. Really? What does that mean? Secondly, they won't be one cent disadvantaged. Really? That is, can only be delivered if that lump sum payment is made, because many of the people who in fact receive that bonus payment, which is a tax-free bonus payment, if it is rolled into a pension-type payment, will be subject to taxation, and every individual circumstance will be different. And there is no way in the world that you can make a collectivist guarantee that each individual will not be one cent worse off. The only way that can be done is with a tax-free lump sum payment to continue. And the Prime Minister had it within his capability to do that today. Now, let me tell you about, as the Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs, let me tell you about the plight of one war widow. One war widow who uh, receives the carer's payment. She's 80. She looks after her mother, who's 105. She looks after her mother and keeps her out of an institution, out of an aged care home, by being able to manage in the best way she can. At Christmas, her refrigerator broke down, so she had to go out and find someone who would give her 12 months' terms to pay it off. The mother, who's 105, has a pet. The pet is important to that person. The bonus payment would assist with an operation cost that that pet requires. The bonus payment is used for all sorts of things that enable people to have a payment ready that gives them an advantage that they are otherwise denied. If you look at the situation where the wives of people who are, for instance, TPIs, who are not in receipt, obviously, of gold card coverage because they are looking after their husband who is still covered by the gold card. But with that one-off payment that they receive, because they're getting it because they receive either the care of payment or care allowance, can be used to go towards paying for their own private health insurance. It is used in ways that people are, as individuals, allowed to make a decision about how it can best suit them. The lump sum is what comes through from these people as being important. Not to have it dribbled out over several um, payments, uh, rolled into a pension-like payment, but to have it as a lump sum that comes where they can make a payment which is meaningful for them. It has been, in fact, factored into their way of life. Now, the Prime Minister, when he wanted to become elected, said, we will be fiscal conservatives, we will be economic conservatives. Every time we made a statement, he said, me too. The much vaunted um, utility allowance, which was talked about today, that was our policy. It was a me too that meant the legislation came in and it was introduced. So too was this lump sum payment, a me too policy. The Prime Minister said, me too. Well, with regard to veterans, we've got th th we have 30,000 TPIs, totally and permanently disabled people. Those people, about one half of them, will be affected by this policy of getting rid of that lump sum. Extremely disabled people. Again, a large number of people will be affected. But when I listen to the Assistant Treasurer talk, make, try and make an equation between an able-bodied working person and a carer of someone who is totally disabled, I found that comparison obscene in the extreme. I found that the, the uh, speech by the uh, Parliamentary Secretary whereby he started to ask for compassion, needs to give that lecture to his own leadership. He certainly needs to go and instil it in the Assistant Treasurer. At the end of the day, what has to be done, and done immediately, 
because these people cannot go Order on the for, time, uh, to the time of May in time indecision. Has expired. I call the honourable member for Cunningham. I just want to address um, some of the, uh, what I see as cynicism on the other side of the House. There's been some discussion of the hypocrisy. I think that's been well covered and uh, proven. But I want to comment on the cynicism. What's actually happened over the last week is that this story broke in the media towards the end of last week, and the opposition immediately jumped on it. We're going to whack the government around the ears. Why? For taking $1,600 off people. Outrageous. How could they possibly survive having lost that money? When the Prime Minister came out and made it clear that despite the debate about the nature of the payment within the budget process, he gave a guarantee that people who are carers are not going to be $1 worse off and then also pensioners are not going to be $1 worse off, what did the opposition do? Panic. How do we keep this rolling as a political issue? How do we continue to get some political mileage out of this? I know we'll make it about the fact that it's a lump sum payment. We'll say that they can't do without a lump sum payment. They're not capable of handling any other sort of payment. It's got to be a lump sum payment. That's what today's about. But today is about a last-ditch political attempt to try and drag out an argument out of this that gives them something to say something in this House about. And the reality is that if this one-off lump sum payment was so vitally important, so absolutely critical to the well-being of carers, what did they do for four years about it? When they bought it in the first time, one would assume that carers said, thank you, thank you, finally, a lump sum payment, what we've always needed. And they would have said, great idea, obviously it's important to these people we care about, we'll make it a permanent payment. Did they do that in the first year? No. Did they do it in the second year? No. The third year or the fourth year? No. Did they ever make it an election promise? If it's so critically important and they're so profoundly concerned about carers, did they make it an election promise? No. Now they come in here and try and tell us that our commitment that carers will not be one cent worth worse off is not good enough. Why isn't it good enough? Because it doesn't suit their political advantage. That's the only reason why. That's the only reason why. Because the commitment that they have been given is that they will not be one cent worse off. Now, let, I actually have a sister-in-law as a carer, the minister at the table may like to know, and I have spoken to her. So, shadow minister. So let's not get into the per let's not her comment actually, if you would like to know, is she'd rather have a regular payment than a one-off payment. And I'm sure there are others who would prefer it the other way. The argument we're having is the financial well being of carers. And do not get personal by starting to take cheap shots about whether people personally know about people with disabilities. It's not relevant because you're making a presumption about me that is inaccurate, Shadow Minister, and you don't want to go down that track because it would be very unfair. Yeah. Let me also tell you about my, my experience as a member of the IR task force yeah, when we were in opposition. Minutes. You want to talk about caring about carers? Let's talk about the woman who, who appeared before the IR task force, who was a secretary in a medical practice had always worked 15 hours a week. Why did she only work 15 hours a week? Because she was a grandmother of a profoundly disabled child. And she could only do those hours because she relieved her daughter one day a week to give her a break, give her some respite from looking after that child. What happened to her? She was offered an AWA. She was offered an AWA that would not give her a guarantee of hours. She had to be available at any time during the five days of the working week to do the 15 hours. So she could no longer give a guarantee to her daughter to provide her with one day a week's respite. Let's talk about the reality of understanding the lives of carers and their families and what sort of certainty they need in their lives in order to be able to meet those commitments. And the work choices legislation, in her very direct personal experience, ripped that away from underneath her. And she ended up, because she wouldn't sign that AWA, because she would not say to her daughter, I can't help you out, losing her job. So don't lecture us on the understanding of the dilemmas facing carers and their families in our communities. Now, the reality of this is this is simply a desperate attempt to drag a last political gasp out of this so that they had something to talk about in this House. And the reality for carers is that they have been given a commitment by the Prime Minister.
by the Prime Minister that they will not be one cent worse off and at the end of the day at the end of the day an ongoing guaranteed income is going to be far more important to carers Order, and families the honourable member than for the Cunningham's time has expired I call the honourable member for Riverina Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to be the voice of the carers in my electorate just for this moment and not actually throw bombs across the chamber. Um, what I'd like the um, Prime Minister and the Minister to know from Jenny and, uh, and, and Tony and Mark and Katie and Toby and Jody and, and, uh, and many of the people in my electorate, please understand the issue that the carers are facing at this point in time and their concerns. Please understand that if you provide a utilities allowance, not everybody qualifies for a utilities allowance. It is a vastly different imposition on families, or it's a vastly different system. Please know that the lump sum, as has been paid by the former government, can be duplicated for the numbers in care. So if you've got, as, um, as Jenny and, and Tony have, two um, profoundly autistic children, as twins, you get $1,200 as under the carer's allowance um, bonus, not, um, not $600 for a one-off. So okay. I think these are the issues that are, that are fa facing and concerning the people in my electorate. A utilities allowance, as has been announced by many of the people across my electorate, is a payment that is generally not commensurate um, with the numbers in care. And we do have numbers in care. We, we certainly have Robert and his mother. Now, Robert's mother cares for two people within her family with severe and intellectual and physical disabilities. And Robert has said, myself and my mother both voted for the Rudd government in the hope that things would get better in our community. Um, we now feel very uneasy and unsure as to what the future holds um, with the Rudd government. This is not about politics. This is the concern of the people. Hear and understand and deal with and respond to the issues that the, the, um, the member for McKellar has raised. It is a taxable thing if you make it part of um, the payment. It becomes a taxable, so it is eroded away. The benefit of that payment is eroded away, whereas a one-off bonus um, each year is not eroded away. A one-off bonus each year in announcement with the budget um, has, you know, has common sense precautions that does not allow, it, allow these monies to get ro eroded away. Now, the, the, the opposition um, has clearly articulated the concerns of carers, and in response we hear about the fact that it was from the government that it was not in the forward estimates. How many times did we sit in the government benches and hear the opposition carp on about the dental program that the, that the Howard government cut out in 1996 when, we came, when the Howard government came into being? They cut the dental program. And again, might I say, um, it is not uh, do as I do, it is do as I say. It's one rule for one and one rule for the, the other. Now that the opposition, now uh, the previous opposition is in government, it is now, oh, it must be in the forward estimates. Well, we remember that that dental program was never in the forward estimates either. It was a one-off program. And how many hours did we spend listening to that ad nauseum comments from the other side of the House whilst we were in government? Now it's also very important what happens in the forward estimates. Can I just appeal to the Prime Minister, can I appeal to the Minister on behalf of the carers, not only in the Riverina, but carers in all electorates, both Labor, Liberal, Nationals, right across the spectrum, right across Australia, they are right to have concerns. They are right if the reports that are coming out are true, are saying that it would be in a utilities allowance, and even though the Prime Minister may think that the carers will not be one cent worse off, please look at this carefully. Please understand the concerns of the carers and please respond appropriately. This is not a political issue. This is not just political bun fighting across the chamber from a government and an opposition. This is the lives and the concerns of the real people who matter. This is the concerns that the carers are raising with us. 
and they will also, be, to be truth be known, be raising with the members of the government. We sincerely just ask that the Prime Minister ensures that he looks at this so carefully so as not to disadvantage any further those carers across Australia who do a magnificent job on behalf of the people of Australia. If we were just to put 10 per cent of our disabilities into care, we would not be able to manage the budget that, uh, that is responsible for caring for them. So rather than be playing time across the chamber, I just appeal for common sense to be had. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. The discussion has concluded. Parliamentary Secretary for Multicultural Affairs and Settlement Services. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion discharging a member from a committee and for the appointment of members to certain committees. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that Ms Grierson be discharged from the House Committee and that members be appointed as members of certain committees in accordance with the schedule which is available to members of the Chamber. As the list is a lengthy one, I do not propose to read it to the House. Details will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Parliamentary Secretary regarding committee membership be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have to report that the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Poison Standards Bill 2008 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to with amendments. I present a certified copy of the bill together with a schedule of the amendments made by the committee. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill immediately. The question is that the amendments made by the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill, as amended, order now. The question now is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill, as amended, has been agreed to. Minister. I ask Leader of the House to move a third reading forthwith. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that this bill now, now be read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the Trade Practices Amendment Access Declarations Bill 2008 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of this bill. Again, I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill immediately. The question, therefore, before the House is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave the House to move the third reading immediately. Order. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Trade Practices Act 1974 and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion, offering an apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples, has been debated in the main committee and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter forthwith. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Honourable the Prime Minister be agreed to. I ask all honourable members to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House.
Order. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in connection with the death of the Hon. Kim Edward Beasley Sr. has been debated in the main committee and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion and I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter forthwith. The question is that the motion moved by the Hon. the Prime Minister be agreed to. I ask all honourable members to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in, relate, in connection with the death of Mr Peter James Andron has been debated in the main committee and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion and I understand it is the wish of the House con to consider the matter forthwith. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Hon. the Prime Minister be agreed to. I ask all hon. members to signify their approval by raising in their places. I thank the House. Order. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in connection with the deaths of Trooper David Pearce, Special Forces Sergeant Matthew Locke and Special Forces Commando Luke Worsley has been debated in the main committee and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter forthwith. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Hon. the Prime Minister be agreed to. I ask all hon. members to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House. Order, I have received the following message from the Senate. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to give effect to the model law on cross-border insolvency of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and for related purposes and transmits it to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to give effect to the model law on cross-border insolvency of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and for related purposes. Minister. I move that the second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Order. The question is that the second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that order of the day number two, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. Order. The question is that the order of the day number two, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number three, Governor General's opening speech, resumption of debate on the proposed address in reply. Order. The question is that the address be agreed to. Before I call the member for page, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech, and I ask the House to extend to her the usual courtesies. The member for page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I come to this place as the first female to represent the people of Page, and I come to this place as a fighter, having first fought my way out of the Housing Commission estate where I grew up. I don't mean the locality, which is still a nice place to live. I mean the thinking that confined and constrained me. We never went to university or did things like that. That was not our world. Although I lacked confidence, I always had a yearning, an intellectual curiosity that drove me to seek something more. I have achieved some good things, great things really, for a girl with no education who went up the ladder, so to speak. 
but my instincts and therefore responses to situations are still very much rooted in the working class girl from the one mile Ipswich. And Mr Speaker, I, ha <laughs> I have to say these instincts have served me well. Ipswich was my stamping ground for the first two decades of my life, and I accept membership of the parliamentary Ipswichian shame. <laughs> Ipswich formed me and Lismore, my home for more than 30 years, gave me the substance that makes me an effective representative for the people of Page. So you see, I too can say, hello, my name is Janelle Saffin. I'm originally from Queensland and I'm here to help. And I truly am. It's my mission in life to serve and to serve well. And today in this great institution, I pledge to do just that, serve all the people of Page, just as Kevin said he would serve all of the nation in his acceptance speech on election night. Mr Speaker, I said I was a fighter and I fought my way into university without the credentials, into jobs without the experience and into politics without the network, but with the passion to make the world a better place, to make a difference, and it was very much locally driven, to get women who are victims and survivors of domestic violence and rape access to services not available, laws created and laws changed, to get housing for homeless young people not old enough to be eligible for public housing, to get recognition, services and a voice for the mentally ill, and for people living with disabilities to change laws and policies so that they reflected and responded to our entire community. Mr Speaker, the first time I went to our then local MP with some other women of action from our local community, and he was someone I respected, it was to ask him if we could get a house on a peppercorn rental for women escaping domestic violence, and he said he didn't see the need. That motivated me. <laughs> well, it got me going, or as my mum would say, it got my goat up, and we got the house, and it's still a public, in public use today. We then went to open a bank account, and we were told that we needed some men of means to be our trustees or some such nonsense. <laughs> we got our bank account open in our own community name. We could not get solicitors to effectively represent women and children, so we set about finding some, <coughs> educating others, and I became a lawyer myself. I thought, I'll show them. Don't get mad, get active, as Edna Ryan used to say. At local level, I have fought for and secured many services, many firsts, and am proud of it. I say this in full recognition that I was never alone and took up many issues collaboratively, but always with a determination to get us what we needed and a better deal. I got millions for the Summerland Way when others could not, the regional baseball stadium, the establishment of the North Coast Community Housing Company, the North Coast Breast Screening Program, Far North Coast Domestic Violence Liaison Committee, Policy Firsts, Internet in Schools, I wrote it, community justice centres in our region, regional domestic violence coordinators and many more. This experience as community advocate has equipped me well for this job. Mr Speaker, I am here to make a difference, to make our patch of page a better place for all of us lucky enough to live there. As federal MPs, we are charged with local leadership. We are charged to listen and we're charged to be community facilitators. During campaigning, especially when door knocking in Grafton and Lismore, it was evident to me that people felt abandoned and taken for granted by a coalition government, national party representation not being listened to on any score. I pledged to listen no matter what, and I have been doing my best to do that since I was elected. I know my way of working puts a bigger burden on my staff. Carmel, Lee, Paul, Peter, Marin and Sarah. And for that I say sorry, but that's how it is. I'm not, not one to let things sit idle. If I see a problem, I hop to to help fix it. There has been so little listening over the years. People are literally coming out of the woodwork. People expect us to be ca compassionate, and we are, and they expect us to be good economic managers, and we are. This is a challenge, a challenge we are up to. I was very motivated to run as a candidate for PAGE for two compelling reasons. The first was that John Howard's coalition government had taken Australia to a place I did not like. I was working and living in Timor-Leste, or East Timor as we call it, coming home to the Northern Rivers every few months. 
and I had the advantage of looking through another lens at my beloved community and homeland and didn't like what was happening. Mr Howard played wedge politics on so many issues. His brand of ruling, not leading, encouraged us to give vent to our most unkind view of others. He never managed to lead us and inspire us to be better human beings. I never thought I would see attack dogs, men in black balaclavas on our wharves, locking out workers. I saw it with my own eyes the first night it happened. I was then a member of the New South Wales Parliament, the Legislative Council, and we went down to express our solidarity with the workers um, on the wharves. I was stunned. Children overboard was the last straw. This was not the Australia of the fair go. I marched in Sydney along with what seemed to be hundreds of thousands of others against the war in Iraq, along with Judy Reid, a long-time friend of mine from Ballina and previous staff member of mine who's here, here with me today, and also Cameron Murphy, who's a previous staff member of mine who's up here as well. So <laughs> thank you both for being here, and also my staff, Lee Duncan, Peter Allen, they're up there, and my good friend Susan Conroy. Thank you for being here. John Howard dismissed us as a rabble, taking no notice. It was amazing, though, how many Aussies, those who marched, and those with whom I have a beer on Friday night at the local pub, knew we were going to Iraq on a lie, to find WMDs that were non-existent. Yep, we still went in. Aussies are basically a kind lot and will give a neighbour a helping hand before they would turn them away. John Howard's coalition led us into a more selfish and aggressive way of doing politics. Every issue became a battleground. This brings me back to why I stood and why I was singularly determined to win Page. I, like other community members, watched as we got less of the pie than we needed, after being continually told that we're in times of economic prosperity. But worse than that, our representative was not even discussing the issues with us, not saying, OK, let us talk about it. Before I turn to the attributes of Page, and there are many, prim primarily the good down-to-earth people, I want to say thanks to Kevin and to Tony for listening to us in Page regarding our floods in January, the worst in some areas in over 50 years. In Kyogle, they are still talking about the first ever visit by a prime minister, and we got some extra dollars, and that went to Richmond as well. <laughs> Page. My friend Harry Woods held Page for Labor from 90 to 96. He went on to become the state member for Clarence. Harry now lives in Yamba with his wife Sandra and I'm pleased to say came with me to the de declaration of the polls on December 17th last year. I want to place on record my thanks to Harry for his engaged and tireless representation and also his wonderful sense of humour. Page comprises over 16,000 square kilometres is rural and has a significant coastal community, stretching from Ballina in the north through Wardell, Broadwater, Woodburn, Evans Head, Iluka to Yamba in the south. These coastal communities are under pressure from development and climate change. I live in Bunjalung country, the original nation of the Northern Rivers, and we have about twice the number of Indigenous people in Page than we do countrywide. Our industry base comprises agriculture, beef, dairy, sugar, oil seed, horticulture, aged care industry, retail sector, hospitality, construction, and 42 per cent of all voters in Page are seniors. We have many sea changes as well, all coming to find a more relaxed but stimulating lifestyle. It goes from Lismore, my hometown, to Casino, Korokai, Kyogle, up to Woodenbong and the Queensland border, back down through Tabulum, Benelbo, Old Benelbo, Urbanville and Bayougal, and what a tragedy beset the people of that village. James Hardy mined asbestos there, and friends of mine are still pursuing their compensation claims now. Down the southern end, we have the north coast's first city, Grafton. We have Rapville, Mullangany, Mummelgum, Copmanhurst, Lawrence, Coots Crossing, Nimboida, Tiringhen, Dundarabin, through to Hanani. It's a poor seat. It has about 13 to 14 per cent of people living at or below the poverty line. And I'm not sure what the National Party were doing about that. They've actually held the seat for nearly a century in some way or another. I want to do something about reducing that, and later this year we'll run a poverty forum marshalling some of the best and the brightest to help. 
Now I want to turn to some young people's concerns, particularly the ones that my son, who's 23, raises with me all the time. He keeps me honest and keeps harping about me at issues of concern, issues he says we don't talk about, but ones that concern many people. I look at their websites, I look at their blogs, so I know some of the things that they're seized with. In general, they're concerned with things like corporate power and particularly like that of the chemical industry with its vast empire stretching out across the world. Most of the chemicals we find in our food, and it's a lot, were not made for such and are not necessary. Some other issues of concern and ones that concern me, the death penalty. I remain an active campaigner against it, having worked for a long time with the Asia Pacific Anti-Death Penalty Coalition. I'm concerned about child abuse in any form and how to give better protection to children. Child pornography, the violence that has permeated our films, our television, our media, our daily lives, the late hours of pub and club openings, and I'm not a wowser, where many of our young people spill out drunk, out of control, and have more fights, more violence, more sexual assaults. Also, why in 2008 we do not have paid parental leave. It just seems ridiculous to me when our economy depends on parents making their contribution to the economy. We don't have childcare rebates for all, all types of childcare. No public transport in rural areas and dental care not covered by Medicare. Mr Speaker, our first sitting week was a momentous week for me in two ways. I came to Parliament, this great institution, after having won the seat of Page in a fiercely contested election battle, wresting it from the increasingly out-of-touch, lost-touch National Party coalition. What a privilege it was to be part of a parliament that said sorry to Indigenous Australians and how humbled I felt to be in the presence of people who had been wronged so cruelly, yet who found it in their hearts to accept the apology and to forgive. For me, that first week was momentous for another reason, because of events in Timor-Leste. Mr Speaker, it is known that I lived and worked in Timor-Leste from 2004 to 2007 as His Excellency Dr José Ramos Horta's senior political adviser. José is a man of peace, a man of vision, a pragmatic man, an international statesman, diplomat and a leader. I was with him in foreign affairs and cooperation and in defence. I learnt a lot about defence. He was a minister for defence as well, prime minister and then as president. On the first day of parliament, I'd just arrived and done a brief doorstop announcing myself as proud as punch as Janelle Safin, member for Page, da -de -da -de -da, and was walking down the hallway when I got a call telling me that José had been shot and was in a critical condition. José is my friend, my colleague, or amigo and colleague in his language. I was devastated. That week, as I maintained focus on my duties to the people of Page, feeling delighted but also devastated at the same time. I was with Shazay when the crisis broke out in East Timor in 2006 and witnessed his heartbreak and determination to make things work. For me, it was a singular and unique experience, one that was formative and it made me fearless. I have to say that Jose inspired me to go for it in the election campaign, although he told all publicly, also in the local media, that he hoped I lost so I could continue to work as his advisor and for his country. <laughs> I can see my colleague Gary Gray laughing. He knows him well too. And when I worked in, in Timor-Leste, I used to see Gary quite regularly, so um, I know he can understand just what I'm saying. Timor-Leste is a country I love a people that I miss, but one that I'm happy now to support from within the framework of our government, the Rudd Labor, Labor government. I have faith that they will make it, and I'm so pleased that José will resume his duties as president in the not-too-distant future. He is healing well and sends his thanks to all of us in this place, and I mean all of us, because he knows that we support him. And he's back to SMSing me, so <laughs> I'm getting messages. <laughs> I know he's healing. I have faith in people and, in my case, faith in the people of Page. They are not demanding more than their fair share. They just want a fair go for their kids, their families, and they want their communities to be safe and sustainable. I have faith in our representatives. 
our government led by Kevin and faith in politics. And I have to say on our side, we are blessed to have such talent, front and back bench. So watch out, Justine. <laughs> There's a lot of talent here. We're very lucky. And I'd like to also acknowledge my colleague, um, the Honourable Justine Elliott, who is the um, representative on the other side of my seat in Richmond and was the first female to represent Richmond. And um, Justine goes before me, so also someone who's inspired me. Mr Speaker, let me recount just some of the legacy in brief of the coalition that has impacted on services in PAGE. Up to a billion dollars out of the public health system in New South Wales alone. Acts the Commonwealth Dental Scheme, causing untold misery for people. Some in PAGE have waited for years for treatment and dentures. And the coalition also ripped the guts out of public housing. A huge um, disinvestment. Mr Speaker, in coming to a close of my first speech in this place, I will cite the monetary election commitments that I gave, supported, of course, by the leadership. <laughs> Not that I just gave. <laughs> Freely. $780 million for Pacific Highway projects from Ballina to Ewingsdale, so it covers the two electorates there, Page and Richmond. $90 million for Alstonville Bypass. $23 million for Grafton Base Hospital upgrade the operating theatre and emergency department and a GP super clinic and no strings attached. $15 million in radiotherapy services at Lismore Base Hospital to accelerate its opening. $3 million for Casino Community Centre. $2 million for Casino Town Centre revitalisation. Up to $2 million for Yamba Sports and Recreation Centre. $1 million for South Grafton Town Centre. 250,000 recurrent funding for Northern Rivers Business Enterprise Centre, 200,000 for the Lismore Homeless Shelter, and that was the first commitment that we actually gave. It was for the homeless shelter, with our concern for homelessness. $125 for the upgrade of the Grafton sale yards, and about $2 million spread across the region for community projects under the Stronger, Stronger Families and Communities program, so that they could have continuity for the next three years. And I will be working over the next three years to add many more much-needed projects to my list of priorities. I'd like here to make some acknowledgements. And first of all, to the Your Rights at Work campaign, spearheaded by the ACTU and Greg Combe, I say well done. And Greg Combe's uncle lives in my seat. Greg's got family in my seat, and his uncle talks to me endlessly about Greg. <laughs> and they're very, very proud of him. To the local Your Rights at Work campaigns and the two people I most interacted with, Graham Flanagan and John Hickson, thank you. To the USU, Craig, CFMEU, Bluey, LHMU, Carmel, CPSU, ASU, AWU, AMWU. And when I say the AWU, it's to my colleague here now, Bill Shorten, but he campaigned with me in PAGE when he was still General Secretary of the AWU. They campaigned hard on work choices, as did I. It was very, very unpopular, a big issue in the seat of Page. To my Page campaign team, Elma Stewart, whose blood pressure I caused to rise, but who stuck by me through every day of a relentless campaign. Doug Myler, Felix Eldridge, Colin Clegg, Kevin Bell, Liz Adams, Mark Barden, Glenis Ritchie, Rick Smith, Ron Tinker, Wally Mulgrave, Don Blackmore, all the boys from Ballina. Melanie Dorian, Eric Kaiser, Andy Moy, Iluka and McLean Mob, Mark Kingsley, Ron McGeorge, Cave and Ray, Emily, Megan Lawson, who's somewhere here in the gallery today. Megan now works in this place. She worked in my Grafton office. I, and many, many more, and I know I forgot some. I want to give two significant personal acknowledgements here. Firstly, to His Excellency President Jose Ramos Horta, whom I've already mentioned. And the other is to General Mick Slater, who was the force commander of the Joint Task Force in East Timor 2006, over a couple one day at Camp Phoenix. I used to go there to sort of get better food. <laughs> and, and I was considering whether to run for parliament and just chatting about it. And he said, Janelle, if that's what you want to do, do it. You only have one life. He had no interest in the politics. It was a personal chat. But that one really made me sit up and take notice, and I never looked back. I will finish by also 
thanking my husband, Dr Jim, as he's known, my son Ned, my sisters, Denise, Donna, my mother, Oriel, dad, Phil, who came out and door knocked with me and over 80, good door knockers. My father was the only person I allowed to have a beer while he was door knocking. <laughs> no one else was allowed near it. And I know that they're very proud of me. And in closing, I'll finish by speaking of a remarkable woman that I know, one who has great strength of mind and character. It's Burma's Aung San Suu Kyi, still under house arrest. Sue is a beacon of hope for over 50 million people who are held prisoners, not by any occupying army, but by their own military dictatorship. Sue is a Buddhist, and there is an enlightened principle in Buddhism, which Sue refers to in her writings. It's instructive for all of us in public life. She says, just continue to do what you believe is right. Later on, the fruits of what you do will become apparent on their own. One's responsibility is to do the right thing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. The question is that the address be agreed to. Before I call the member for Swan, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech, and I ask that the House extend to him the usual courtesies. The member for Swan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to my parliamentary colleagues. As I rise to speak today, I congratulate the Speaker on his election, and to all the other members on their success in the 2007 election. I'd like to thank the people of Swan for putting their trust in me. And in return, I'm pleased to represent you with the same determination as I and my dedicated campaign team of volunteers displayed during the camp campaign. I will ensure your voices are heard loud and clear on this side of the Nullarbor and, most, most importantly, in Parliament. Last week, I was fortunate enough to hear the former Wallabies captain speak, John Eels, and he reminded me of some good advice I had received from friends before I entered the political arena. Be yourself and don't change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good advice. I will do that today and give you some history of myself and my family and the values and beliefs that have helped lead me here today. I'd like to put on record that I actually live in the electorate I represent and that I'm extremely proud to represent the federal seat of Swan. I acknowledge all the previous members of Swan, particularly the three previous members, Don Randall, a member for Canning, Kim Beasley, a former Deputy Prime Minister, and Kim Wilkie, and recognise their contributions. I'm going to tell you about the electorate of Swan, and res with respect to the other new members who have spoken before me, I will state that the electorate of Swan is a great place to live, and the people who live there are fantastic and as diverse as you will find in any electorate in Australia. I will not lay claim to the electorate being heaven or paradise, but there is no other electorate that I would rather live in or represent in this place. The electorate of Swan is east of Perth and it takes its name from the famous river which forms one of its electorate boundaries. The Swan River was the birthplace of European settlement on the western coast of Australia. It is the scene of much cultural and community activity, the site of festivals and concerts, a meeting place for family and friends, with sailing, skiing, restaurants, barbecue and picnic areas along its foreshore. Mr Speaker, Swan has many landmarks, institutes and buildings that add to, add to its character and gives the residents plenty of opportunities for varying education, entertainment, lifestyle and family recreational activities. We have the Belmont and Ascot race courses, the Perth Zoo, the Burswood Casino, Curtin University, Cannington Greyhounds, Clontarf Aboriginal College, three golf courses, the Perth Football Club, more than 50 primary and secondary schools, including a TAFE college and three Islamic schools, the Perth domestic and international airports, the State Tennis Centre and many more clubs and associations that the constituents of my electorate participate in. Another popular waterway, the Canning River, provides a natural border on the southern side of the electorate which spans over 108 square kilometres, encompassing a variety of industries, small business and professional offices. Swan is about 21,000 businesses, far more than any other electorate in WA, and includes the interstate and interstate freight and transport terminals, both road and rail. This is vital to the West Australian economy, as are all businesses in our great state. After being involved in small business for more than 25 years, 
I understand the commitment and sacrifice that the small business people of Australia make to strive and achieve their goals in life. They are a major employer in Australia but are treated with indifference by the vast majority of Australians due to the demonising of them by the ALP and union advertising during the election campaign in past decades. No doubt the new government will wind back the clock to make it harder to run your business with draconian compliance regulations and the reintroduction of unfair dismissal laws which will act as a disincentive to employ staff. Shame. Being a small businessman or ex-small businessman, I know that just means small businessmen will work harder and longer hours to make sure they don't have to bear the risk of financial ruin under unfair dismissal laws, which is exactly what they will be, unfair. The Liberal Party and opposition will continue to support small business in Australia and fight for you to ensure the government provides the necessary framework for you to prosper and run your business with a minimum of, in of interference. Yeah, yeah. The, the demographics in Swan are broad with diverse e ethnic groups, Asian, Middle Eastern, European and Indigenous Australians. The issues in Swan are just as broad with crime and antisocial behaviour, road infrastructure problems, health care, mental health care, aged care and protecting our unique waterways and natural environment. These are the major concerns which figure prominently across the electorate. On the matter of health, the Labor State Government is planning to close the Royal Perth Hospital which services many of my constituents. There is a groundswell to prevent this happening, and I have joined the fight. The airports and access highways could be described as infrastructure bottlenecks due to the lack of commitment from a state Labor government bursting at the seams with budget surpluses. The airports and highways in Swan are the gateway to Perth and Western Australia for both interstate and international visitors, and could only be described as inadequate when compared to other cities around the world. I urge the government to bring forward the commitment it made to Swan during the election to upgrade the Great Eastern Highway. During the election campaign, as I have with my life, I have met people who have inspired me and helped shape and mould my values in life. In the gallery today as my guest is a gentleman I met during that campaign. In 2007, this man had his and his father's medals stolen from him and they were not recovered. I approached the Defence Minister of the day, Brendan Nelson to replace them, and he arranged to have the medals reminted and then personally presented them during a visit to WA. This man's name is Fred Harper. He lives in the suburb of Redcliffe in Swan, and he is a remarkable man. Fred was born in South Australia on the 4th of April 1907. His family moved to WA, and at the age of seven he was removed from his family by the state and placed in the Clontarf Boys Home. Fred tells me that uh, he escaped from Clontarf with another 25 boys, <laughs> and once they had been found, he was placed with the Christian brothers. Fred served with the ADF during World War II and left Fremantle in 1941 on the Queen Mary. Fred was stationed in the Middle East, in Palestine and Egypt. He also served in Java and Ceylon. Fred has many stories which I would love to tell the House, but maybe he should put them in a book as he seems to have time on his side. Fred and the men and women of Australia who laid their lives on the line for all Australians to continue to live the lifestyle and the freedoms we now enjoy are the true heroes of this nation and must never be forgotten. I honour you, I honour you Fred, and it has been a privilege to have been able to bring you to the Australian Parliament House. Please enjoy the rest of your trip and your visits to the War Memorial and the Museum. On a similar vein, at the, age, at the tender age of six months, I was removed from my family and placed in a baby's home and made a ward of the state in Victoria until I reached the age of 18. Nearly 50 years on, it is remarkable to reflect on just how far we have progressed as a nation in our short but proud history, and that I can stand here amongst Australia's leaders as an equal. It has set in concrete my belief that we are the land of a fair go, where we are not afraid to back the underdog with that sense of hope that he or she may achieve something special. I know that all People who have been through a, not all people who have been through a similar experience as myself or the Fred Harpers of this world during their childhood will go on to stand in federal parliament. But these experiences in life should not stop anyone from achieving their goals. Out there, in, and uh, there are plenty of good people. Sorry, achieving their goals in a nation such as ours. I hope that our story can inspire young children going through the same experience. Now that they can still achieve great things with their lives, and there are plenty of good people out there willing to back them. My first priority as the member for Swan will be to pursue the 
Rudd-Gillard government to make good all the promises it made for the Swan electorate during the recent election campaign. These include upgrading the Great Eastern Highway, more than $1 million for crime prevention initiatives in the city of Belmont, the installation of lights at the FTL Oval, home of the Mighty Demons, yeah, yeah. who won their first premiership in 1907, the year Fred Harper was born, funding for the restoration of the historic old mill in South Perth and a Medicare office in Belmont. I was born in Melbourne as the sixth child of ten in the Dix family. As I mentioned previously, my mother and the state had placed me in a baby's home at the age of six months. Two of my older siblings were also in foster care and a younger brother was adopted out, who this, to this day I have never met. I did not meet my father until I was 23 years old and some of my siblings until I was 35. I was fortunate enough to be fostered by the Irons family at the age of three. My foster father, David, was a church minister and went on to be a social worker, and my mother, Mary, was also a social worker. Because of their commitment to helping people who were going through tough times, I was given a start that many other children in my situation never had. I grew up in Box Hill in the Federal Electorate of Chisholm, then known as Deakin, in what would be described as a middle-class area, with many of its residents working in the manufacturing sector or as tradesmen. There was a perception that the bosses, no matter whether they were small or medium-sized businesses, were wealthy and were tight-fisted towards their workers. This perception still exists today and is promoted by the ALP and the unions. It wasn't until I operated my own small business in Perth many years later that I found out just how difficult it was to be the boss. Contrary to what I was always been told, being the boss wasn't a licence to print money. It was hard work, there were plenty of bills to pay, and every one of your workers' livelihoods depended on the decisions you made on a daily basis. This was my introduction to Liberal politics, where people were rewarded, not envied or chastised, for their initiative and enterprise. The rights of the individuals are valued and respected, as is the freedom of association. It would probably not surprise you then that uh, both my sets of parents were Labor supporters. <laughs> my biological dad was a member of the old painters and dockers union, and my uncle Bob Dix was, the, uh, was actually the secretary of that union for some time. He was believed to be one of the few secretaries of that union that died of natural causes. <laughs> I am still sure that even though three of my parents have passed away, they would be extremely proud that their son is now a member of parliament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After finishing my apprenticeship, I left my employer and did various jobs, which included digging sewers, shoveling chook manure out of a farm in Hastings, working a jackhammer inside an abattoir in Dandenong, and then 18 months on the roads for the Gas and Fuel Corporation in Victoria. In 1981, I packed my bags and headed to Western Australia to play Australian rules football for East Perth. A great club steeped in tradition and full of values and principles I still carry with me today. While my football career didn't end up the way I imagined, the move to the West has been fantastic. I've also enjoyed mentoring and supporting young footballers in the past 10 years in my role as a junior coach at the South Perth Football Club and as director for junior development at the Perth Football Club. It is one of the ways of giving back some of the support I received as a child. I believe sport has an important place in teaching our children the value of teamwork and discipline. With the rising incidence of obesity in our children and throughout the community, I encourage all parents to make sure their children are active and scoring goals, not just on the PlayStation but on the field of sport as well. Another epidemic which we must seriously address as the nation's legislators is the growing binge drinking culture which we have inadvertently encouraged over many decades. When the rest of the world label us as heavy drinkers, we wear it as a badge of honour and brag how many we had the night before. We have fostered the development of a culture which looks to the weekend as a time to get smashed. It is a culture that we have accepted as a nation, while most of the community has condemned the use of illicit drugs in society, getting blind on the weekend is accepted as being part of an Australian. We might be losing the war against illicit drugs, but at least we are trying to mount a fight. We need to a sustained assault on the binge, binge drinking culture and I support the alcohol toll reduction bill and I urge the government to make responsible drinking part of their education revolution. A report released by the WA Health Department last month found that West Australians were drinking 30 per cent more than they did 10 years ago. According to that report, 3,975 West Australians died from alcohol-related causes 
between 1997 and 2005, and that doesn't include road deaths. That's about one a day. One of these people who died during that time was my sister, Margaret Dix. My younger sister, Margaret, came to Western Australia about seven years before her death, and we were able to develop a strong bond as brother and sister, which was earlier not possible. Margaret was drinking at the Rendezvous Observation City's lobby bar while catching up with a friend from Victoria on August 12, 2004, before she fell to her death from a 15-storey balcony at that hotel. Toxicology analysis indicated Margaret had a blood alcohol level of almost seven times the legal driving limit. The bartender, bar manager and licensee were charged with four counts of each of supplying alcohol to a drunk person. A magistrate later ruled they had no case to answer. Unfortunately, Margaret is not the only sister I've lost to an alcohol-related incident. My older sister, Jennifer, was killed in a hit-and-run accident by an alleged drunk driver in Victoria more than 35 years ago. Now, I'm not a wowser, and I'm certainly no saint when it comes to alcohol. I enjoy a few beers on a warm day and a couple of glasses of wine with friends. But I strongly believe that we all have to work together in this parliament with the states and the community to make binge drinking un-Australian. Changing the nation's attitude towards binge drinking cannot be achieved in the short term, but it must begin. It will be a long-term battle that has the potential to change the very nature of our national identity, but it will help save relationships, marriages, jobs, sporting careers and lives. I dedicated my victory in Swan last November to my sister Margaret, and I'm committed to making sure that all Australians understand the dangers of excessive alcohol consumption. Someone else who has given me an inspiration ever since the day he was born was my son Jared. Jared was born in 1992 during one of the toughest periods of my life, coming out of a recession we had to have. He gave me a new purpose in life, and since he came to live with me three years ago, we have been great mates in our home in South Perth. At a young age, Jared has given me great support during the campaign and has been a constant reality check for me since he came to live with me. Jared is in the gallery today. And I salute you, Jared, and I hope we have many more years of mateship ahead and you achieve all your dreams in your life. Yeah. I'd also like to thank my mother and family for all the love and support they gave me whilst growing up and the support they offered during my run for federal parliament. I've heard family mentioned many times in this house and would join in the chorus of how important families are to Australia and our way of life. There are many people who I have to thank for their assistance during the long and arduous election campaign. Some of my campaign team and my mates are in the gallery today, and I thank them again for their support and for travelling all the way from WA to be here today. I'm sure to miss some people, but I will never forget the fantastic and enjoyable ride to achieve the remarkable victory in the 2007 election in Swan. Keith Ellis, a small businessman with six kids. Keith turned 66 this month. Travis Burrows, a small businessman. Jim Crone, an Irishman who insisted we use the campaign motto of refuse to lose. <laughs> Gordon Thompson, the boss. Richard Basham, John and Karen McGrath, the Tyler family, Adrian Lawson and my brother Rob Dix, Sandra Brown, Anne Jones, Sue Chown, Dawn Stratton, Helen Leslie, Colette Wiltshire, Paul Everingham, Robin Nolan, Daniel Blaine, the Liberal Party State President. Mark Neam, Jason Morocchi, Zach Kirkup and all the staff at Menzies House in WA. The local chambers and the CEO, Charles Bellow. All the federal ministers, members and senators who visited Swan during the campaign. Senators Eggleston, Cormann and Johnston. Darrell Lathwell and Lindsay Albonico, a couple of mates of mine who are here today as well. All my mates from the Florida Aquatic Recreational Cricket Club. All the members of my golf club who assisted with my campaign. Rob Dunn, who mentored, mentored me and gave me an opportunity in the early 80s. Swan Division and the Liberal Party, who had the confidence in me as a candidate. And finally, to John Howard, Peter Costello and the previous government, who left this country in a better shape than when they inherited it in 1996. Yeah. Yeah. On February the 13th this year, I was in Parliament when the apology was given to Indigenous Australians, and I think it was an important initial step in the process of resolving the real problems Indigenous Australians face today. However, I believe this apology disregarded a good one. The good, sorry, the, this apology disregarded the good that can come from removing children from abusive situations. Perhaps one day we should apologise to all the young children of Australia who were not saved by being removed from an abusive or non-caring parents. 
I mentioned the case of the young seven-year-old girl, Shelley Ward, who died last year after being seriously neglected by her parents. And I call on all communities to make a concerted effort to bring cases like this to the attention of the proper authorities. We should have also thanked and congratulated all foster parents and staff of institutions who have cared for these children during the past century. Mm -hmm. The efforts and sacrifices they make are underestimated and should be recognised officially. On a matter of compensation, which continues to be debated throughout Australia, I call on the Rudd-Gillard government to establish a compensation fund which all Australians can donate to. This will give the population of Australia the opportunity to show their level of commitment to compensation. In finishing, I would like to voice my concern on reports that the federal government plans to change the requirements for provisional voters to prove their identity on polling day. Surely a country that sends delegates overseas to observe the fairness of other countries' elections would not introduce a system where someone could easily vote without proof of identity. Yeah. Our citizens need proof of identity to get a passport, a motor vehicle licence and many other licences and registrations just to perform normal day-to-day -day activity. But we have a government that is promoting the idea of don't bother to register, just turn up and vote and while you're at it, vote early and vote often. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to the next three years in this House with a fantastic opposition team with the sole purpose of gaining back the role of government, not because we were born to it. We are just better at it. Thank you. Yeah. Order. The question is that the address be agreed to. Before I call the member for Leichhardt, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech and I ask the House to extend to him the usual courtesies. The member for Leichhardt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, political leaders and governments impact the daily lives of the citizens they represent. The good ones provide leadership and vision that can, that can inspire great endeavour and achievement and that can heal historical pain and suffering. Through legislation, they shape the foundations for the country and the society they envision. So the decisions we make in this parliament can improve the lives of every Australian, whether they know it or not. And I can think of no more important or rewarding work than to be part of a government ready to provide that leadership. To be part of a government ready to shape the foundations for a fairer and more prosperous society that ensures that every Australian, no matter their economic, social or cultural background, has the opportunity to participate fully and reach their potential. This is the Labor ideal, and I'm proud to be part of a Labor government. I therefore come to this parliament recognising the power that we as a government possess, determined not to waste the opportunity that I have been given to help shape a fairer and more prosperous Australia. As the member for Leichhardt, I represent a large and diverse electorate, stretching from Saibai Island in the Torres Strait bordering Papua New Guinea through Cape York Peninsula to and including the great city of Cairns. Leichhardt, more than any other seat in our federation, is a microcosm of Australia. It contains remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, small rural towns built on mining and agriculture, and popular tourist destinations like Cairns and Port Douglas. Cairns is a rapidly growing regional city with sprawling outer suburbs and inner city communities, where old Queenslanders are making way for new unit developments. The population is expected to grow from 125,000 to 180,000 over the next 10 years. We have mortgage belt aspirationals, blue collar battlers, sea changers, tree changers, farmers, graziers, miners, islanders, aboriginals and, of course, strong migrant communities. The economy founded on agriculture and mining continues to diversify with tourism, construction, marine, aviation, defence, film and education playing playing important roles in our developing regional economy. It is no wonder that the many challenges confronting Australia in the 21st century are being experienced by communities in my electorate of Leichhardt. Businesses are crying out for skilled labour and there is an urgent need for investment in roads and community infrastructure like sporting facilities and childcare centres. Our major hospital, the Cairns Base, experiences chronic bed shortages and patients have to travel away to receive many specialist services, including oncology and cardiac procedures. 
Working families are struggling under rising interest rates, petrol and grocery prices. Many young people are, for the first time, starting to question they will ever be able to afford to buy their own home, while many Indigenous people are welfare dependent and have limited opportunities for full-time employment and suffer poor health and educational outcomes. Climate change is also placing at risk our World Heritage Great Barrier Reef and wet tropics rainforest, our agricultural industries and low-lying coastal communities. These are major challenges requiring long-term planning and investment, while for working families they are practical problems they face every day. I am proud to be part of a government that brings new leadership, that understands and responds to everyday problems but remains focused on ideas to build a modern Australia equipped for the 21st century. I am working hard to lend a helping hand to the everyday problems being faced by my constituents while building a long-term plan to, to, to tackle the challenges facing my communities. I am proud of the many local commitments I secured during the recent election campaign, including increased road funding for the Bruce Highway and Peninsula Development Road and new health services through a GP super clinic, an MRI for Cairns-based hospital and funding to improve oncology services. In the tropical north, our natural assets, our close proximity to Asia and the Pacific region and our tropical expertise provide us with unique opportunities to grow and strengthen our local economy. To take advantage of these opportunities and prosper into the future, Australia must remain a technologically advanced country. That is why Rudd Labor is investing in nation-building infrastructure and an education revolution. Our high-speed fibre-to-the-node communications network will go beyond the capital cities and connect our rural and regional communities to the global economy. Because if we unlock the creative potential of our population through education and training and have world-class infrastructure, then we will be able to compete and do business anywhere in the world. Our human creativity and access to world-class infrastructure is also key to our fight against climate change. Leichhardt is home to some of the world's great natural wonders in the Great Barrier Reef and Daintree Rainforest, which are both at risk from climate change. Island communities in the Torres Strait, like Saibai and Boigu, are also under threat from rising sea levels. The problem of climate change has arisen because of a failure of our market-based economy to cost in pollution in the form of greenhouse gas emissions. This classic example of market failure has produced climate change that now poses a real threat to our environment, our local economy and our way of life. This problem requires practical local action and a global solution. An enormous challenge for our government will be how we intervene in the market to ensure that the real cost of greenhouse gas emissions is reflected in the market for fossil fuels. Getting this right will not only be critical to tackling climate change, but ensuring that our quality of life doesn't decline as we develop and adopt new renewable fuels and technologies to replace old ones. The market-based economy that, although not perfect, has allowed for the creation of so much of our wealth is also under threat from uncertainty in financial markets and the increasing power of global corporations. The uncertainty in financial markets generated through the United States subprime mortgage crisis is a factor in Australia's rising interest rates. Financial markets have failed halfway around the world, yet the impacts are being felt by families with mortgages in Leichhardt and all across Australia. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, in a report into petrol prices recently, released in December last year, found no evidence of price fixing but found major oil companies had been operating in a comfortable oligopoly. Labor has since announced a petrol commissioner to monitor prices and improve transparency in the fuel industry. Legislation to protect consumers from monopolistic market power and unethical behaviour in the marketplace is critical to our long-term economic and social prosperity. Climate change, the subprime mortgage crisis and the domination of large corporations in the supply chain for basic goods and services like fuel and food underlines the important role that government must play in regulating markets so they create prosperity not only today but into the future for the broader community. Increasingly, though, regulating these markets requires agreements that cross national borders, and we need leadership and a new effort to develop global solutions to the problems of market failure. Australia is well placed to play a leadership role in developing these solutions. 
To do this, we must participate fully in the global community, and that, it was, that is why it was so important for Australia to have signed the Kyoto Protocol and join the global effort to tackle climate change. Critical to our long-term future is also agenda for reform through the Council of Australian Government. The fact that federal and every state government is Labor provides us with a unique opportunity to put aside the blame game that we must not squander. In a report for the Business Council of Australia, Access Economics estimated the cost shifting, duplication and other inefficiencies in Commonwealth state funding arrangement cost some $9 billion per year. Of this, $5 billion is related to spending inefficiencies, including around $1 billion in health-related inefficiencies. In areas like health, where there will always be more demand than funding, it is imperative that we make the best use of available resources. When we squander precious resources, we make those who may be waiting for treatment suffer longer and have fewer resources available to take much-needed action to prevent people getting sick. New medical technologies have improved the quality of life of many people suffering debilitating illness and ensure that we all live longer and enjoy a better quality of life. The spiralling cost of these technologies, however, creates huge challenges for governments who want to ensure that it's not only the better off within the community who have access to these treatments. Preventable diseases like diabetes and heart disease that develop over a person's lifetime are also increasingly threatening the sustainability of our public health care system. Reform is required to reduce waste and duplication and improve service delivery across government. This is not only an economic but a moral imperative in areas like health and Indigenous affairs. Leichhardt is home to wonderful, wonderful Indigenous culture and the historic Margabo and Wick native title decisions. I would, like to pay tribute, I would like to pay a special tribute to the numerous Indigenous traditional owners and elders from my electorate who have fought to maintain not only their culture and rights but those of other Indigenous Australians. In Leichhardt, like in other parts of Australia, Indigenous people statistically have poorer health, have lower levels of education and are more likely to be on welfare or in jail than non-Indigenous Australians. It's no wonder that Indigenous life expectancy is 17 years less. We need practical action by government in partnership with Indigenous communities to close this gap. We need an evidence-based approach that holds people accountable and delivers action and real improvements in health, education and creates it creates economic opportunities while tackling the debilitating impacts of welfare dependency and substance abuse. We also need leadership that inspires and heals, and I'm proud to be part of a government that has shown that leadership by apologising to the stolen generations as its first order of business during the opening of this parliament. It is this combination of leadership that touches a deep emotional chord and uplifts the human spirit that, when combined with real and substantial practical action, starts us down the road to closing the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. As Paul Keating put it in his famous Red Forum speech, how we respond to Indigenous Australia, and I quote, is a fundamental test of our social goals and our national will, our ability to say to ourselves and the rest of the world that Australia is a first-rate social democracy, that we are what we should be, the land of the fair go and the better chance, end quote. I believe Australians believe in equality of opportunity enshrined in what we term the fair go. We believe in the fair, we believe in the fair go that embodies rights and responsibilities. Australians expect everyone to get a fair go when it comes to the basics including health, education and a job, but we also expect everyone to have a go and contribute depending on their ability and circumstances. We are practical people, common sense people who look for straight answers to the challenges we face in everyday life. Does it work and is it fair are simple but powerful values that Australians understand and that I learnt growing up. I was born the third of four children. My parents, John and Joan Turner, who are in the gallery today, grew small crops and ran cattle at Kamali Creek near Bachelor, 56 miles south of Darwin in the Northern Territory during the 1950s and 60s. They established the block from scratch, building their house from home made bricks and experienced the hardships of bush life. My parents, who would make a career of pioneering, setting up properties firstly in Australia and then overseas in Indonesia and the Philippines. Dad is a do-it-yourself man who can fix pretty much anything with whatever is at hand. 
Even the kitchen cupboards were fastened to the wall in one of our homes with eight gauge wire. <laughs> My mum is an only child who came to Australia as a 10 pound palm in 1952, aged 21. She never seems phased by anything and has always been active in the local community, where it, whether it is at the Country Women's Association, the Parents and Friends Association or the local church. I proudly carry her maiden name, Pierce, as my middle name. My parents were, de were determined that all of us kids would get a good education. I boarded at Brisbane Grammar School and subsequently went to the University of Queensland, where I graduated with degrees in agriculture and later economics. So I grew up with strong role models surrounded by different cultures, learning to use what resources I had to find practical solutions to the challenges of everyday life. I was taught to treat people fairly, even if the world isn't always fair. So thank you, Mum and Dad, and sisters Jennifer and Carol Caroline, who are in the gallery today, and my brother Matthew, for your love and support and the lessons learnt. The support of my family, my education, the practical skills I learnt growing up have held me in good stead throughout my working life. For almost 20 years I built a career working with farmers and grazers for the Department of Prime Ministries and as, as an agricultural consultant in Australia and overseas. Most recently I managed Operation Farm Clear, a large project that employed more than 200 people and assisted more than 1,000 farmers recovering follow following the devastation of severe tropical cyclone Larry. Politics, though, has always interested me. At home, we always talked about politics, and I was at university at the end of the Jackie Peterson era and experienced the great mood for change that, that elected the Goss Labor government in Queensland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My younger sister, Caroline Turner, though, has had the greatest influence over my political career. She told me to stop whinging about John Howard back in 1998 and join the Labor Party. In 2001, she suggested I contact Senator Jan McLucas, who's in the um, chamber today, and work for a politician and see what it was really like. I was so glad she was there last year when I finally won after the disappointment of the 2004 campaign. So thank you, Caroline, for always being there for your advice and for your advice and support. I want to pay tribute to my wife, Tiffany, who is in the gallery today. Politics is tough on families, but she knows I love this job and how hard we both have worked to get here. I thank you, Tiffany, for the love and support you have given me and the sacrifices you have made and the many more ahead. To my beautiful daughter, Zoe Joan, the size of my electorate and its distance from Canberra means that I am going to miss some of you growing up. I'm going to work hard not to miss too much and hope that you appreciate and enjoy some of the unique experience you will have as a daughter of a parliamentarian. In Leichhardt, we achieved a massive swing approaching 15 per cent. I want to thank my campaign and the Your Rights at Work campaign for the effort they put in. The timing was right and the national swing was on, but you don't achieve 15 per cent without a great local campaign. I was endorsed in April 2006 and we ran a mini campaign later that year thanks to the efforts of my campaign director, Mike Bailey, Tony Fulton and the financial backing of the Cairns branch. This campaign leveraged off the national Your Rights at Work campaign and the local Where's Warren campaign, driven by Stewie Trail and the Electrical <laughs> Trades Union. Stuart Trail would go on to become the ACTU Your Rights at Work coordinator in Leichhardt, and there is no doubt that the community activism the entire union movement created on the ground in Leichhardt galvanised opposition to the work choices law, laws and drew people back to, la to the Labor Party. Thank you, Stuart Trail, Kevin O'Sullivan, for leading the campaign and all the unionists who worked so hard to get rid of the Howard government. We couldn't have done it without you. Leichhardt is elected to more than 150,000 square kilometres with diverse communities and it requires great logistical planning to run a good campaign. Leslie Clark, the former member for Barron River, came on to coordinate the overall campaign in the last few months, enabling me to focus fully on my job as the candidate. Her knowledge and experience of marginal seat campaigning is only exceeded by her generosity of spirit when it comes to supporting the Labor Party. I couldn't have had anyone better running the local Labor campaign. She and Mike Bailey were ably supported by so many fantastic people, but I need to name a few who have supported me over many years or gave up so much of their time during the recent campaign. Thank you, Hazel Lees, for so professionally managing the finances. Thank you, Cathy Laverne, my campaign director from 2004, who I have so often turned to and who has never let me down. 
Thank you, Jan Lani, who's also in the gallery today. John Pratt, John Toot, Sue Tom, John Thompson, Dorothy Growler, Cam Muir, Jackie Clarkson, Alison Alloway, Andrew Lucas, Les Francis, and all the others who have worked so hard on the campaign. Thank you, Alan Ringland, who ran the best core flute campaign ever. <laughs> John Adams did a great job organising the Cape and Torres Strait, while Martin Hurst similarly did a great job organising the polling booths. I want to pay tribute to my Senate colleague, colleague Jan McLucas, who is in the chamber today, for her support over, the many years, over many years. I learned a great deal about politics while working for Jan, so thank you very much. I also want to thank my Senate colleague Claire Moore for her support during the recent campaign. State members Jason O'Brien, Steve Wetnall, Warren Pitt and Dejani Ball have all supported me wherever they could. I look forward to working with you to improve the lives of the communities we represent. I also want to thank the Queensland and National ALP campaigns who ably supported our local effort. Finally, I want to pay tribute to the candidates and members who went before me, to Chris Lewis and Matt Rezaez, who ran for Labor in 1998 and 2001. The time just wasn't right. To John Gala, Peter Dodd and Warren Inch, Hope you're enjoying your retirement from Parliament, and thank you, John, for your support and advice. I hope to have a long career in this place, achieving good things for my communities and my country. Everything we achieve in life, we achieve through the support of others, and that is particularly the case when it comes to politics. I am so lucky to have had a supportive family growing up, and now such a wonderful partner in Tiffany. I have great staff and a strong base of support in Leichhardt. And I'm now looking forward to working with members of this House, the Senate and their staff over the years ahead, because political leaders and governments really can make a difference. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. 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 Order. The question is that the address be agreed to. The member for Hume. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Before I begin, may I once again congratulate uh, you on your election to the role of Speaker. I rise today to join the debate on the address and reply to the speech given by His Excellency the Governor-General. Mr Speaker, in the electorate of Hume, the electorate of Hume is continually changing. Sometimes this is due to the regular redistributions that require the boundaries to move and therefore various towns and villages and their inhabitants to be omitted or included. The, demographic, the demographics of Hume continue to change also with the move of the first the young people and then other job seekers into larger urbanised areas. This affects the emphasis to be placed on different types of services and infrastructure. Then there is the changing nature of business. To be viable, rural properties have had to grow in size and diversify their earning streams to minimise risk and improve the capital to earning ratios. These are terms that would not even have been used 20 or 50 years ago. Back then, the value of the dollar or the pound would have been measured in terms of what it could buy at your local shop. Now any farmer can tell you the value of an Australian dollar in terms of international exchange rates. Farms have become highly effective international agribusinesses. One of the things that hasn't changed is that we all still talk about the weather and measure the amount of rain that falls on our properties. When much of your livelihood and quality of life depends on the weather, despite the best laid plans, it can become something of an obsession. This is especially so in Australia, where the vagaries of our weather are so well known and recorded in terms of human suffering, depression, poetry and folklore. Another thing that hasn't changed is the tremendous spirit of the people who live in Hume. Take, for example, Scott and Belinda Medway, a farming couple who one day decided to meet the drought head on and take further financial risk by gambling on their confidence in their ability as excellent business people. They decided to do something positive rather than allow the drought conditions to slowly erode their confidence in being able to survive another bad season. A victim mentality was definitely not part of their survival kit. They opened a cafe restaurant aptly named the Merino Cafe, cafe Country Bakehouse in their village of Gunning. Through determination and sheer hard work, the Medways quickly established a popular venue in an historical building in the main street. 
Their enthusiasm has culminated in the business expanding to include a takeaway outlet in the old Hume Cafe just down the road and the employment of farming women who also have been hit hard by the effects of the drought. The business sources 98 per cent of all the food and products it uses from local people and outlets, thereby generating income for others in the village and the district. This, Mr Acting Speaker, is a classic example of rural people getting out there and helping themselves and others. In the process, the Medways are putting the village of Gunning back on the map by attracting visitors who have heard on the Bush Telegraph about these gutsy rural Aussies who are determined to be successful in what has been a difficult period in their lives. The spirit shown by this couple who now employ over 20 other local people augurs well for the future, and they are not the only ones. This is why, when I hear people from urban landscapes talking in derogatory terms about the government's assistance for farmers, I wonder just how well they would travel in the same circumstances. If you are on a salary or wages, do you run low as your weekly or fortnightly payday approaches? Just imagine getting paid twice a year. How well could you manage your money? What if, purely because of the weather, the paymaster doesn't pay you for three months? Could you continue your quality of life? What if the paymaster didn't pay you for a year? Forget quality of life. Would you ever even survive? Try no pay for four years. At the same time as highlighted by my able colleague, the member for Farrah, input costs are rising faster than CPI. Today it costs about $1,000 per acre to sow a crop. For a smallish farm of 200 arable acres, that would cost $200,000. I wonder how many people could find that amount of money three years in a row and watch the crop not even sprout or worse sprout and then die before maturity. Yes, rural people have suffered through this long drought, but as demonstrated by the Medway's positive actions, they are resilient, resourceful people who manage their affairs carefully and efficiently. They are the progenitors of the self-help attitude in Australia. And why they don't, what they don't need is a Labor government that is determined to cut rural and regional programs. What the ALP must realise is that these people who look after themselves as soon as circumstances allow. In the meantime, any resources provided to them will be very effectively managed, giving excellent value for each and every dollar of assistance provided. So there is no excuse for reducing the programs that assist rural people in times of difficulty. These programs of assistance provide a form of job security for farmers, dependent businesses and their employees. They help prevent working families and young workers from leaving for the big smoke because things are becoming just too hard. Goulburn City, in the electorate of Hume, is one of the larger New South Wales cities to have experienced an acute water shortage during the prolonged drought. So our community is fully aware of the drought's impact. In fact, they have experienced the full measure of it. Rural people just adapt to the pressures of water rationing in drought periods to the extent they not only understand what a precious resource water is, they also appreciate what needs to be done to ensure their limited water supply is used only for the bare living essentials. My constituents cut the daily average consumption of water by as much as 60 per cent per household. This level of rigour is commonplace for country people who willingly step up to the plate when asked to cut back on their water usage. Similar sacrifices are also undertaken by all businesses, including pubs and clubs. So, Mr. Act Mr. Acting Speaker, at least the climate of self-help in the country is predictable. It does not change. And what I hope is that this Labor government does not cut the programs that assist rural and regional people to help themselves through the hard times. However, Mr Acting Speaker, the signs so far are not good. The Labor government has delayed funding of $65 million needed for critical rail maintenance demolishing its claims of concern about infrastructure bottlenecks fueling inflation and damaging our transport efficiency. It seems that working rail lines throughout New South Wales and Victoria will now not be upgraded in 2008 and 2009 as we, the coalition in government, had planned and fully funded. The finance minister claimed that the funding pushed back from this year and 2008 
2009 until 2009-10 related only to the inland rail proposal. And this was repeated by the infrastructure minister in parliament. However, as pointed out by my colleague, the shadow minister for infrastructure and transport and local government, Treasury papers reveal that the $65 million was to be used by the Australian Rail Track Corporation for maintenance and upgrading of a number of existing rail lines which could contribute to a future inland rail corridor. In other words, this Labor government has slashed funding for rail lines which are already operating and allowing farm and mine product to move up and down the eastern states. At a time when we are emerging from drought in many places, farmers will want to move more food and fibre to market, not less. Constricting trade will drive up prices for consumers and inflation make us less competitive internationally. We hope Labor realises the mistake it has made here and reinstates the $65 million immediately. Otherwise, this government will stand condemned for letting rail lines run down and breaking election promises about fixing infrastructure bottlenecks. Then, Mr Acting Speaker, there is the Labor's decision to cut crucial education and training programs for rural Australians, which will worsen the nation's skills shortages. The Prime Minister apparently believes that skills and staff shortages start and finish in the inner suburbs. Labor plans to cut $98 million from four key training and education programs for rural and regional workers. The coalition left the Labor government with record workforce participation and historically very low unemployment. This has meant that local communities all over Australia have struggled at times to find the right people to fit into the right jobs. With many communities emerging from a cruel drought and needing skilled workers, now is the wrong time to be cutting programs that provide skills to tens of thousands of rural and regional workers or make it harder for apprentices to survive financially. Labor has announced four major cuts to education and training that directly affect primary producers and people living in rural and regional areas. And they are Farm Biz, Advanced Agricultural Industries Program, Apprenticeship Incentives for Agriculture and Horticulture, and the Living Home Away from Home Allowance for School Based Apprentices. It is hard to understand why these programs, which have already assisted more than 165,000 farmers, fishers, land managers, apprentices, women, young people, Indigenous Australians and small businesses, should face the chop. There are members in this chamber today who were involved in the Standing Committee on Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries when I was chairing it at the last parliament. who. Uh, uh, travelled with me throughout uh, Australia taking evidence about skill shortages and we saw the outcomes, the positive outcomes, including uh, you, Mr Acting Speaker, we saw the positive outcomes uh, of commitment by uh, rural Australians to these programs. It is shameful and disgraceful that a Labor government is, is contemplating or has removed funding which uh, will see these um, wonderful programs disappear. An estimated 70,000 workers left country areas during the drought. Many will return, and it would help to have them come back with better skills and prospects. With the Prime Minister and Treasurer talking about how important it is to tackle skill shortages, Mr Acting Speaker, can I say that Labor's actions will speak far louder than its words? One accident that, uh, action that the government can take is the duplication of the Barton Highway and the construction of the Murrumbateman Bypass. This is a very important piece of infrastructure, not just uh, uh, in, in my electorate of Hume, but also in the Labor electorates of Fraser, Canberra and Eden Monero. Every year, thousands of tourists drive down the Barton Highway to Canberra, to the coast and to the Snowy Mountains. Our constituents benefit from the millions of dollars they bring to businesses in our respective electorates. Now, I understand that um, no decision has been made on that uh, yet, Mr. Actor, Mr. Acting Speaker, and it would be remiss uh, 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 of me if I didn't say that um, a lot was left to be desired about the uh, 
uh, the commitment to the priority of people in safety by some members of the former government, particularly me members of uh, uh, or ministers for transport. I've said it publicly before and I'll say it now because uh, um, I saw questionable decisions made on the basis of uh, popularity in, uh, in marginal seats at the expense of uh, safety in places like uh, uh, the Hume electorate and particularly with regards to the Barton Highway. Prior to the 2000 election, uh, despite my criticism than that, uh, and finally uh, common sense uh, um, being uh, considered, uh, under the Auslink 2 program, $264 million was finally promised for these works between the 2009-10 and 2013-14 financial years. This promise was not matched and has not yet been matched by Labor. In 2006, $20 million was committed for the project with $3 million to be spent in 2007 for the relevant land purchases and the remaining $17 million to be spent on planning infrastructure uh, pre-construction planning during 2008 and 2009. As I understand it, that uh, money is still there and that process is still going on. I hope that's right and I'll certainly be talking to the new Minister for Infrastructure uh, about that particular project to, uh, in fact, um, confirm that that is uh, still the case. It's interesting, Mr uh, Acting Speaker, um, there was a lot of uh, hype uh, made by uh, the Labor Party candidate uh, who ran against me in the electorate of Hume, uh, um, uh, and thankfully I uh, and my constituents sent him on the way uh, that uh, I've sent a number of Labor candidates over the years. But it was interesting that he was making a lot of criticism about the lack of funding for this particular highway uh, uh, in the past, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to uh, see whether the Labor Party itself um, matches the rhetoric of its candidate and makes the funding available for this much-needed project. To date, Mr Speaker, I also have heard nothing of the 20 per cent funding to provided by the New South Labor Party government towards this project. As many parliamentarians and their staff would know, because they travel the road between Yass and Canberra, the Barton Highway has a long history of serious and fatal accidents. While not all accidents are actually caused by the road, we should do everything we can to reduce the potential for serious injury and damage when accidents do occur. For the safety of our community, it is imperative that this road be upgraded and soon. As one of the few parliamentarians in the coalition, Mr Speaker, who has experienced time in opposition, I am here to say that I will be working with the government to deliver programs that make good sense to the people of Australia, especially the constituents of Hume. I respect the right of an elected government and its ministers to uh, uh, deliver to the Australian people a, uh, a governance uh, that they said they would deliver, but they have to also respect the fact that I'm a member of a coalition and I will vigorously and rigorously pursue them out in the public arena if for pure political reasons they deprive my constituency of their rights as Australians to uh, taxpayers' funds that are needed for projects that are essential to uh, the ongoing um, viability of rural communities and particularly those projects that centre around infrastructure which this current government is talking a lot about but hasn't yet demonstrated uh, to uh, the community at large that it's going to actually deliver positive outcomes in terms of infrastructure into the uh, rural and regional uh, areas of this great country of ours. As I said, I'll be watching the government to ensure that they do what, what needs to be done without fear or favour. And I thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, for the opportunity to make a contribution to this address and reply here today. Order. The question is that the address be agreed to. Before I call the member for Macon, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech, and I ask the House to extend to him the usual courtesies. The member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may I begin by adding my congratulations and good wishes to yourself on your election as Speaker of the House. Mr. Speaker, I begin my first address in this place by thanking Matilda House and the Ngunnawal people 
for their very gracious welcome to Canberra on the opening day of Parliament. I congratulate other members of the House on their election or re-election last November, and I compliment the class of 2007 for the very impressive first speeches that have been made so far. For new members, there is a lot to learn in this place, and I also thank the Parliament House staff, the office holders and my parliamentary colleagues for all their assistance as I settle in. And tonight I thank some of the people who have travelled from interstate to come along and hear me as I present my first address in this place. And I particularly acknowledge Tony Catanzariti, MLC from New South Wales. Mr Speaker, I speak in, in support of the motion moved by the member for Solomon in response to the address to Parliament by His Excellency the Governor-General. His Excellency's address outlined the Rudd government's agenda for the 42nd Parliament. It is an agenda which Labor took to the Australian people last year and which was resoundingly endorsed on November the 24th. It is an agenda which responds to Australia's needs of today, which responds to the challenges of the 21st century, which res restores international respect for Australia, which restores fairness and decency into our society, and which treats all people as equals. Mr Speaker, to be a new member of a new government with a new agenda for Australia gives me cause for much optimism. That optimism was certainly justified when on the second day of this parliament, the parliament said sorry to the, to the stolen generations of Indigenous Australians. To be here as a government member on such an historic occasion was both an inspirational beginning to my time here and a matter of personal relevance. Shortly after Sir Ronald Wilson presented the Bringing Them Home report to the government, I asked him to address a public forum in Salisbury, and I can vividly recall him emotionally recounting some of the heart-wrenching stories that were conveyed to him in the course of his inquiry. I had also, on other occasions, discussed with Elliot Johnston QC his earlier report on Aboriginal deaths in custody. And I count as friends many of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, some of whom, whom came to Canberra to hear the Prime Minister say sorry. Mr Speaker, since Federation, the National Parliament has shaped our nation. It is where our civic leaders have met to discuss and debate the national and international affairs of our nation. It is where elected members have brought the grievances, the aspirations and the expectations of the Australian people. And it is where our future will be forged. Mr Speaker, those of us elected to this place bring with us the hopes of so many Australians. We bring with us the hopes of the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged and the most in need. We bring with us the hopes of those who, for reasons beyond their control, do not have the ability to stand up for themselves and whose only influence is their right to vote, and sometimes they don't even have that, and whose only hope is that they will be heard by the people they elect every three years. Mr Speaker, I am the 1,059th person elected to this place and the 95th South Australian. For that, I am most grateful to the people of Macon for placing their faith in me and for giving me the opportunity to represent them. Over the years, I have met with literally thousands of people from the Macon electorate, and I value the friendships that I have formed with so many of them. What I value just as much, however, are the efforts so many people in Macon um, make every day in helping others, in managing our environment through their voluntary work with organisations such as the RSL, the National Servicemen's Association, the school councils, Lions, Rotary and Zonta clubs, the sports clubs, Meals on Wheels, Trees for Life, Friends of Dry Creek and Cobblers Creek and so many other local community groups, or by simply being a grandparent or a friend. These people do what they do because they care. Mr Speaker, the seat of Macon takes in many of the north and northeastern suburbs of Adelaide. The seat was created in 1984 and was named after Norman Macon, a former distinguished member of this House. From 1984 until 1996, the seat was held by Peter Duncan and from 1996 until last year by Trish Draper. <coughs> I acknowledge the contribution they both made in public life. Mr Speaker, it is the people of Macon who elected me to this place and whom will, deter whom will determine how long I remain here. And the issues I campaigned on in the 2007 election I intend to now pursue as their Member of Parliament. Mr Speaker, as I listened to the first speeches of others, the words privilege and honour were used often. Indeed, it is a privilege and an honour to be elected to this place. Regrettably, the privilege and the honour is not matched by the esteem in which politicians are held by the wider populace. 
and perhaps for good reason. Politicians have not always covered themselves in glory, and parliamentary processes have increasingly come under question. In particular, over the last decade, the transparency and accountability of government, the erosion of human rights, the manipulation of electoral laws, the abuse of public office, the process of appointment of people to high public office and the behaviour of politicians in this place have all contributed to the cynicism and mistrust that people have in politicians and in governments. Mr Speaker, the words rights, respect, liberties and democracy underpin the oath of allegiance that new citizens swear on becoming Australian citizens. There should be no greater example of upholding those values than by the Australian Parliament. Democracy is fundamental to Australian way of life. Democracy, however, is only as good as the level of engagement of the people it serves, and people will only engage in the political process if they have confidence in that process. That is why it is so important to restore the faith of Australians in this parliament and why I support the accountability and transparency measures already announced by the Prime Minister. On the question of rights, I have for some time supported and publicly spoken about an Australian Bill of Rights, and I was encouraged to hear the member for Fremantle and the member for Blair express the same view in their first speeches. Mr Speaker, it is expected that your first speech will define who you are, what you value and what your agenda might be. I can't do all of that in 20 minutes, but I will provide some answers to those questions. Firstly, I am a Christian who respects the views of others. I was raised in Paraka, a working class suburb, and that is where I still live. I was drafted into the ALP in the, in the late 1960s by Reg Groth, the then member for the state parliament seat of Salisbury. It was Reg Groth and his personal assistant, Lynn Arnold, who encouraged me to stand for Salisbury Council when a casual vacancy arose in 1977. Lynn Arnold went on to be Premier of South Australia um, and was at the time himself a Salisbury Council member, and I learnt a lot from him. I was elected to council and, whilst never intending to, remained on the council for 30 years, serving as mayor for the last 10 years. I believe that my time in local government has prepared me well for my time in this place. As mayor of Salisbury, I saw firsthand families struggling to make ends meet, old Australians, particularly single pensioners, living a life that should shame us all, Indigenous people living a life that none of us would want for ourselves, defence veterans neglected as they try to cope with the horrors of war that they live with every day of their lives. People with disabilities or other health issues struggling through life when just a little more help could make so much difference to their life and that of their carers. And the grief in so many families caused by drug abuse or gambling addiction. For these people and so many others, life is a constant struggle. I know that there are no simple solutions to their needs, but I do not accept that we could not do more yet we could find $3 billion for an unnecessary war in Iraq. Mr Speaker, as Mayor of Salisbury, I also saw the best of Australian life. I saw the new arrivals from all over the world, from the UK, from South America, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia and the Middle East, settle into their new land and quickly contribute to Australia's development. I saw my friend Hugh Van Lee, a Vietnamese boat arrival, become Lieutenant Governor of South Australia. I saw the generosity of the Australian people in moments of hardship, natural disaster or tragic events. I saw the success stories of local businesses built on hard work, family sacrifice, long hours and financial risk. I saw the extraordinary talents of young people in the schools, in our TAFEs and in our universities. And I saw the Christian churches reach out to the refugees, the homeless and the hungry. And Mr Speaker, I saw young paraplegics like Neil Fuller, Matthew Cowdery and Richard Morovic become local heroes. Mr Speaker, as Mayor and Councillor, I also saw the important role of local government in communities. And today I do not have time to speak about local government, but I will make this point. Local government was established in Australia in 1840. That is 61 years before this parliament. After being entrenched in our system of government across Australia for 168 years, it is time that local government was recognised in our constitution. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the environment, the economy and social policies are inextricably linked, and in the time I have today I want to briefly touch on all three of these areas. Australia is a prosperous country, rich in natural resources and by most comparisons considered a wealthy country. 
but that wealth is unevenly distributed and there is too much inequity of income and assets across Australia. For the year 2005-2006, the poorest 20 per cent of households received about 8 per cent of national income, while the richest 20 per cent received approximately 38 per cent. Of greater concern is that two million Australians are today living in poverty and more and more people are facing financial pressures, with household debt reaching $1,170 billion and credit card debt now at almost $43 billion. As I talk to people, it is clear that the greatest cost pressures are coming from home repayments, food and fuel costs. It is worth noting that last financial year, the four major banks, the two grocery retail giants and the four major oil companies made a combined profit of over $21 billion. That equates to nearly $1,000 for every man, woman and child in this country. Yet they keep increasing their prices and, in the case of the banks, their interest rates and fees, and they pay their CEOs millions of dollars per annum. Mr Speaker, I'm also concerned that many young people may never own their own home. And it's my view <coughs> that home ownership creates stable households, individual security, builds stronger communities and provides the best environment in which to raise children. I support the Rudd government's housing policy announcements to date, but I suspect more will need to be done. Shortly before I stepped down as mayor, Salisbury Council endorsed a shared equity housing scheme, which would make home ownership considerably more affordable. It's a sensible scheme that should be looked at by all levels of government, and I intend discussing the scheme with the Minister for Housing. Mr Speaker, on another matter, I welcome Senator Kim Carr's announcement of a tariff policy review in Australia. Over the last 40 years, we have lost too many manufacturing jobs to overseas countries, and in doing so, we have lost many of the trade skills we are now in short supply of and for which we are spending large sums of money to re-establish. From 1949 until the late 1960s, about 29 per cent of Australia's labour force was employed in manufacturing. Today, manufacturing accounts for only 10 per cent of employment, and there has been a corresponding decline in the manufacturing share of Australia's GDP, which has also fallen to around 10 per cent. Furthermore, and more concerningly, we have lost our manufacturing capability, leaving Australia vulnerable to overseas countries in the future. The manufacturing sector is particularly important to my home state of South Australia and to the region I represent. And I'm appreciative of the Rudd government's $20 million commitment for a manufacturing innovation precinct in my region. The closure of the Mitsubishi plant in Adelaide, in which 1,200 jobs will be lost, highlights an additional disturbing reality. Today, our economy and the livelihoods of so many Australians are at the mercy of overseas boardrooms. Mr Speaker, the issue which concerns people around the world is climate change and environmental mismanagement. In 2001, in a public address, I warned of water shortages and, in January of last year, in another public address, I said that the greatest threat facing humanity was not terrorism but climate change and global warming. Regardless of what is causing our climate to change, our failure to prepare has already cost us dearly. The drought we are experiencing, the worst in 100 years, has over the last two years totally changed the way we value and use water. Of particular concern is the critical state of the Murray-Darling system. This, this river system contributes in excess of $50 billion annually to Australia's GDP, sustains hundreds of towns and tourism destinations along its watercourse, and creates a 2,000-kilometre ecosystem corridor through Australia. In the late 1970s, Ralph Jacoby, the member for Hawker at the time, raised in this place his concerns about the demise of the Murray River. Unbelievably, the response from subsequent governments was to issue more water rights. Sadly, our mismanagement of the Murray has cost lives, export income and brought financial ruin to many farming families. The only useful outcome from the drought is the acceptance by most people that climate change is real, that it affects us all and that we must act now. There are solutions to our water needs, but they require tough decisions and political will. Thirty years ago, the city of Salisbury began a visionary concept of collecting rainwater, cleaning it through wetlands, storing the water underground and then reusing it when required. Today the city supplies billions of litres of water annually to homes, industry and playing fields from the wetlands and the city of Salisbury is an acclaimed world leader 
in stormwater harvesting and reuse. There should be more of these schemes around Australia, if for no other reason than, than because they are a very cost-effective way of providing water. Mr Speaker, my journey to this place has been a long one, and today time does not allow me to acknowledge all of the people whom I would like to acknowledge and thank. I could not, however, let this occasion pass without acknowledging at least some of the key players who influenced or helped me along the way. From 1976 until his retirement in 1981, I worked for Senator Jim Kavanagh. During that time, I formed a friendship with Ralph Jacoby, whom I mentioned earlier. They were both good men, neither self-serving, and both with a social conscience. They both influenced my political outlook. I also thank the small team of people who helped me when I contested Macon in the 2004 election. We did not win in 2004, but we went against the tide and reduced the margin to less than 1%. In 2007, there was clearly a mood for change across Australia, and whilst I do not intend to offer an election analysis, there is no question that Kevin Rudd's leadership of Labor was a determining factor in the election result. I thank Kevin Rudd and his deputy, Julia Gillard, and all my parliamentary colleagues, both state and federal members, for, the assistance, uh, for their assistance over a long campaign period. I'm extremely grateful to the hundreds of volunteers who campaigned with me day after day, door knocking, letter boxing, putting up posters, working on polling booths, answering phones, and so on and so on. I especially mention David Gray, Lee Odenwalder, and I see Lee is here and David Gray is here tonight and I thank him for coming, Matthew Dean, Justin Hanson, Georgie Matches, Nina Gerace, who I think is here as well, and, and Mike Tumbers. I also thank the many union members from the Your Rights at Work team, the, the LHMU, the AWU, the NUW, the ASU, the MUA, the CFMEU and the HSU, who campaigned tirelessly alongside me so that we could bring to an end the Howard government's 11-year assault on working Australians. Mr Speaker, if I can just digress here for a moment, it's interesting, in fact hypocritical, that those who are the most vitriolic on their attacks on unions are more likely than not themselves members of professional associations or business associations. And they use their associations to attack and, vil and vilify working Australians who dare to organise themselves just so that they can defend the human rights of people who only have their labour to bargain with. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I was raised to value my family and my family has always been there for me. I would not be here today without the support and understanding and the encouragement of my wife Vicky, and Vicky is here tonight as well, my children Rocky, Francesca and Conchetta, and my brothers Dominic and his wife Anna, Frank and his wife Frances, Pat and his wife Joanne, and my sister Rosa and her husband Dominic. They have all been an incredible help to me right throughout my life. Mr Speaker, of course it all began with my parents who sacrificed so much of their lives so that my brothers, my sister and I could have a better life. My deep disappointment is that my father did not live to see me elected to this place. It was my father who brought politics into our lives and who instilled into me that it is only through politics and education that you can change society. Mr Speaker, we live in challenging times. We have never been wealthier or more knowledgeable, yet never has the future been so uncertain. In a complex, complex integrated world, global problems become Australia's problems. Information technology changes our world faster than we can adapt and faster than we can reskill our workforce. We face massive workforce shortages and serious environmental dilemmas. We face the challenges of managing an Australian economy heavily influenced by external forces and multinationals over which we have very little control. These are just some of the difficult responsibilities of government. And I might say it's my view that those countries which manage their environment well, which educate their people, and which minimise global influences over their economies will prosper most. Mr Speaker, I know that we cannot change the past, but we can change the present and build the foundations for a better future for all Australians. When my time in this place ends, I want to walk away with a clear conscience that I have, that I have done all that I can to create a more prosperous, a more sustainable, a more just and a more compassionate Australia. Thank you. Order. The question is that the address be agreed to.
The member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is my honour and privilege to be here this evening, having been elected for the third consecutive time for the electorate of Canning. And I'd like to thank everyone that assisted me on my 2007 Canning campaign. There are many volunteers who generously gave their valuable time to help me be re-elected as the member for Canning. And special thanks goes to all of those who helped me on the 46 Canning, 46 Canning polling booth on the 24th of November, what turned out to be a very hot day in Perth, I might add. Most of all, I'd like to thank the people of Canning who continued to show me strong support. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say that it is with sadness that a number of my colleagues and friends are no longer joining me in this chamber. I congratulate them on their service to this parliament and their time in and working for their constituents and wish them very all the best for their future endeavours. If I could indulge for just a moment, Mr Speaker, I'd like to congratulate my West Australian colleagues in particular on such a strong election result um, fought in the campaign in Western Australia. It is a true reflection of the prosperity of the state of Western Australia that voters clearly endorsed what the coalition government had done for them over the past 11 years. Eleven of the 15 federal seats in Western Australia are held by Liberal members. The swing against the coalition in WA was only 2.14 per cent, well below the average national swing of 5.44. May I make special mention to those new members who will be joining us in uh, Parliament and on the regular flights to Canberra. The member for Cowan, Luke Simpkins, Luke the local as they called him. Uh, the member for Forest, Nola Marino, who ran a special campaign. And I want to make a particular mention of the member for Swan, Steve Irons. And many would have heard him here in the chamber tonight. And that his story is unbelievable and uh, a credit to him that he has become a member of this esteemed place. As some know, I have a strong affiliation with the seat of Swan, and I congratulate Steve for being the only Liberal MP in this country to have won a seat from a sitting Labor member during the 24th of November election. That's a credit to his hard work and dedication and to the campaign that he ran. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have continued to work hard for my electors fighting for infrastructure, working together with residents on local issues and representing those that may need help with government bodies, local government and many other authorities. I thank the Canning electors on their vote of confidence in me as their representative. My re-election is an acknowledgement by the local community that they are happy with my representation, I hope, and with that comes my obligation to work just as hard as I have done on their behalf for the last three years, for the next three years, and I have no hesitation in saying I intend to do so. Now, in terms of the campaign, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, just a general wrap up. Um, as many will know, when I first won this seat in 2001, I won by a very slender margin of just over 500 votes um, from a very good ALP candidate in Jane Garrick. She was a delightful person. Um, the, uh, this, on this occasion, I, sorry, I'll go back in the uh, 2004 election, I had the largest swing in Australia, uh, non, except for the independent of 9.2 per cent. And uh, on this occasion, even though losing some ground, I now have a margin of 5.6 uh, per cent, which I'm very proud of in the current climate. And uh, I'll do my best to uh, make sure we continue to uh, have the people of Canning realise that we work hard for them. However, there will be a redistribution in Western Australia in the next uh, term, and that will make some interesting uh, reading over those three years, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm so you've taken a lot of interest in that. <laughs> but um, the campaign was a, a strong campaign. I've always treated uh, Canning as a marginal seat, and I always will, because uh, for those who for one moment become arrogant and think that uh, they're popular or that their election to uh, the House is a foregone conclusion are headed for doom. Now, I need to talk about um, the union campaign, and I've listened to many maiden speeches in this House, and we've heard a number today. And uh, it's no secret that the union movement was very active uh, in its at Your Rights at Work campaign, and, and they're entitled to do that. But there are some more unseemly aspects of the union campaign which I will uh, make clear here. And um, 
we know that uh, even in the maiden speeches, many of the new members have acknowledged they wouldn't be here without that campaign on behalf of the local unions. Uh, in August last year, for example, Mr Deputy Speaker, I reported to this parliament that the campaign by the unions had reached a new low in my electorate of Canning. The TWU had been ringing members in Canning and asking them how they were voting, in fact, basically standing over them and telling them they, how they had to vote. A local truck driver who contacted me about this behaviour said that the TWU representative had asked him if he would be voting, voting the right way. When my constituent asked, what do you mean by the right way? The TWU representative said, well, you're going to be voting for Kevin Rudd or not? We've got to win that seat. And he was quite offended by being told. And he got on the, um, he got on the two way system and talked to all his mates in the other trucks and told him how appalled he was. And um, I, he was just as appalled as I'm sure many other union members would be to see that uh, their union dues weren't going into looking after their own particular situations, but going into a National Labor Party campaign. Uh, the, the union's campaign slush fund, and it was uh, my candidate. I understand was able to convince the uh, Australian Labor Party that he should be the um, candidate because he was going to be getting funding from the Australian Workers Union, and that would be uh, the tipping point that allowed him to get, gain pre-selection for Canning. And uh, on that point, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, uh, when I raised it in the House before, this letter from uh, Tim Daly, the local AWU uh, representative, uh, uh, so soliciting uh, votes on behalf of the union based in Pinjarra and largely around Alcoa. And this is an interesting one. Uh, the member for Maribyrn on Bill Shorten, in this little letter I have here, Mr Deputy Speaker, telling uh, people that they needed to vote for uh, the candidate, Labor candidate in Canning because uh, you know, he was the right man for the job. And it was interesting also, Mr Deputy Speaker, that he was running on this campaign slogan, a fresh face for Canning. But Mr Deputy Speaker, is he, if you have a look at this photo, um, it's not a very fresh face. And mine might be weathered and quite worn, but it's certainly at 54, it's, not as, uh, it's a bit fresher than the 58-year-old uh, that said that he was going to be giving a fresh face for Canning. But in this letter from Bill Shorten, he asked uh, the uh, electors of Canning um, in, in this particular AWU to be, give uh, $5 a week to the campaign, to be putting it in the uh, Horsehead Community Bank, uh, Bendigo Bank, and this was the account number and who the signatories were. And I wonder, Mr Deputy Speaker, if they're still collecting these union dues of the AWU workers, who in Western Australia, I might say, have never had such good wages and conditions in their life. In my electorate, for example, uh, in, a, in an electorate of uh, about 95,000 people, there are 23,000 people that were on flexible workplace agreements, and they actually wanted to stay on them because it got them more money, more money, and greater flexibility, and they're able to tailor their job conditions to suit them and their families. So, what's wrong? with having a more flexible workplace where you actually earn more money and have greater choice and productivity in what you do. Now, interestingly, uh, on, on election day, uh, the, um, the people manning the booths uh, you know, got a bit ugly, but I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to make a little bit, take a little bit more about your what, uh, Rights at Work uh, campaign. And uh, we do know that, for example, um, as much, it didn't have that much of an effect in Canning, but in the neighbouring seat of Hasluck, uh, which is run by Karen, Sharon Jackson, I congratulate her because she worked hard to get back in. Um, they ran a voracious campaign there. And uh, as the Weekend Financial Review reported on February 9th, for 18 months the ACTU paid full time organisers in 24 marginal seats um, to uh, work for that whole 18 months. And uh, we know that they spent eight and a half million dollars in those seats. And in the 24 targeted seats, there was an average swing of 2.5 per cent or higher to the Labor Party. Now, so obviously their campaign worked in those targeted marginal seats. But uh, it just makes you laugh, doesn't it? You know, on these so-called disclosure laws about uh, who donates to campaign. Here's the Labor Party you can give eight and a half million dollars to run a targeted campaign. Uh, putting uh, ACTU workers into 24 seats, and nobody seems to take any notice. Somebody puts $10,000 into my campaign, and it's, and it's insidious, and it's horrible, and it's wrong, and they're buying favour and votes. Shock, horror. Absolutely wrong, and all it's designed to do is to try and demean anybody who wants to be involved in the political process. It's 
but um, this is what we'll expect for some time. I've been a uh, good fundraiser in campaigns, and I'm sure that the people that support me uh, will continue to do so, because um, I not only work on their behalf, but I trust that they consider the money is uh, well invested in the representation that they get. In the uh, same article, um, the, sorry, the Australian report on February 14th of this year, the ACTU collected another nine million this year, which will add to what it already has in its coffers from its 1.8 million members. It's been estimated that this year they may collect close to $1 billion in union dues around this country. So talk about slush funds for the next election campaigns. You can just see the sort of bank that's been built up by the union movement for and on behalf of the Labor Party. Um, as I said in this article, the ACT union officials are irritated they are still being levied when the coalition has been ousted and Labor remains committed to abolishing work choices. And why wouldn't they be irritated? The deal has been done and there is no ex uh, explanation as to what, where the money has been put or why it is being spent now that the election is over. And in Adelaide, for example, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was found that members of the United Firefighters Union were on duty at the time that they were handing out your rights to work flyers and shopping centres and railway stations during the last campaign. And of course, the union's the bosses claimed that they weren't bullied to do so or coerced, but nonetheless, these firefighters were on duty, and they were entrusted to be out there saving lives, not distributing union propaganda while they were being paid to do so. And yet, I'm told, uh, for example, Theresa Gambaro, who's a former member for Petrie, said that the the uh, uh, the public servants in in Petrie were given the last two weeks off on full pay to campaign full time against her. So you know that's, that's the sort of uh, campaigns that we're up against, and uh, we'll, we'll expect them again. But obviously, we'll be ready for them. On election day in Canning, uh, the union thuggery was uh, out there to be seen. Um, there were fisticuff fights amongst uh, union uh, union members themselves on various polling booths as they were setting up. Uh, the police were called, and that's on the record. It was reported in the media. Of course, the media is always right, isn't it? And uh, the, in Maroona, for example, in the south of my electorate, the people handing out ALP how to vote cards were abusing the many of the people who went through that didn't take uh, ALP how to vote cards. And uh, poor old, old ladies who, who didn't take them were being given certain hand signals and being called very savoury names as they went in without taking a Labor how to vote card. And one of the uh, guys in the orange T-shirts was heard to say, look, I really don't like doing this, but I know that if I don't do it, uh, I'll be in trouble when I go to work on Monday. So uh, that's the sort of thing that they were up against. Um, we know that people had their signs stolen, for example. One of my polling booths in Falcon, uh, in the dark, setting up the work, the uh, union guys that were involved there on behalf of the Labor Party grabbed all my T-shirts and took off into the dark. And uh, we know who the bloke was. Uh, but. Um, that's the sort of tactics you, you were to expect. Um, so that intimidation, you know, was a pretty ugly side. That was really the first time it was manifest during an election campaign, as far as I'm aware. Now, in the uh, the electorate of Canning, the uh, Rudd government promised a number of things to the Canning people throughout the campaign, and I'll be making sure these uh, campaign promises are delivered. Five and a half million dollars was committed to the Mandra Business Centre revitalisation project with the aim of revamping the town precinct to grow tourism and business. Another $345,000 was dedicated to the completion of the final stages of the Varuna Town Square Centre to redevelopment, which includes street paving, picnic areas, etc. The Howard government committed the funding in the initial stages, and this project I'm keen to see completed with. Uh, in such a vibrant part of my electorate, so that's one Labor promise I'll be keeping an eye on. 200,000 was promised for the com completion of the water cycle management plan to address the impact of development on the Mundajong town site, and another $200,000 $200, for climate change adaptation strategies for both Serpentine, Jaradale and Mandra. Importantly, the member for Batman and the Minister for Resources and Energy and Tourism uh, assured a $65 million uh, funding towards the construction of the Mandra entrance road. Now, at the outset, this, I must say that this is an important state government road, but it's just that. It's a state government road. The state government originally pulled uh, this uh, Mandra entrance road from the Perth to Bunbury Highway project as a way of reducing costs. Now the state government has the federal government picking up the tab for its responsibility. I say this, and I recognise the benefits of the entrance road, and I'll work closely with the city of Mandra to see it happens. However, I'm keen to see, because um, I want to see the Peel motorists uh, get access to this. 
but realistically it's just bailing out their um, Labor state mates who are flush with funds in any case. As this parliament will be aware, the Perth to Bunbury Highway has been a landmark project since the time I was elected as a member for Canning. I fought hard to get this project on the road and secure $170 million in coalition government funding. This 70-kilometre uh, dual carriageway extending from the end of the Quinana Freeway to Lake Clifton, taking haulage vehicles out of Mandras town centre and cutting at least 30 minutes off the trip to Bunbury. In order to see the Perth to Bunbury Highway get the road, the Howard government made um, funding. The Howard government made the original Auslink funding agreement conditional on the construction beginning in 2006 and being completed by 2009. If we hadn't surrounded the State Trans Transport Minister Alana McTiernan with this, the road wouldn't even be started now. The original cost of the Perth to Bunbury Highway was $340 million. Uh, the member for Batman admitted during the campaign that the cost had blown out to $660,000 million, dollars, uh, which the federal government will now provide an extra $160 million. And this is all it's doing is rewarding the mismanagement for and on behalf of the state government, uh, who stalled this project, mismanaged it, and allowed the blowouts. In fact, the minister, as I've said on many occasions, hasn't delivered one project on time or on budget. However, they've been rewarded now by being propped up by $160 million now from uh, federal labour as they're in government. But it's good we're going to get the road. Now, um, I'm, as I said, I'm very proud of the achievements uh, that I've achieved uh, in Canning through the last uh, couple of terms. I remain committed to bringing the essential infrastructure to the region, fixing dangerous roads, community facilities, and uh, the constituents of Canning can be assured that I haven't forgotten um, them as I represent them here. I will urge the new government to honour the coalition's $10 million promise for the Pinjarra bypass, $22 million. The expansion of uh, the mining activity around Alcoa have really pushed this, and as well as Boddington. Other promises also include the funding for both, Pin the, both Pinjarra sporting complex of $650,000 and lighting for the Falcon Reserve of $125,000. And I'll be calling on the new, minister, the new parliamentary secretary for Brand to look at these proposals because it's in his region, the Peel region, and I'm sure he'll take an interest in this. One of the biggest issues concerning my constituency is crime, graffiti, hooning and antisocial behaviour. And I'll be working with all authorities to see that uh, this is addressed. It is the biggest cancer in our society at the moment, the, the disgraceful uh, antisocial behaviour to the rest of the community, and it uh, really needs along with, as I you know, compliment, the um, attack on binge drinking and support my colleague from Swan in his comments. But uh, we need to take a firm stand on the all sorts of antisocial behaviour that wreck the fabric of our society. Improving broadband access is obviously something that's high on my list because of the diverse nature of the Canning electorate. There are many black spots and um, I'll continue to fight for better coverage and a better deal and uh, ask Telstra to turn on their enabled exchanges, which Many of them have been enabled for ages and that Telstra have just refused to turn on. However, they're not on their own. Uh, they need um, support from a wide area. The Canning schools did well under the Howard government through the investing in our schools program. And, uh, it's, put, it's very sad that they're going to be uh, missing out on this sort of funding, uh, saying that every child, it's like Bob Hawke said, no child will live in poverty after whatever it was. No child will live without a computer now. But the strange thing is, most schools have got computers for every child in the school. But anyway, they're going to get new ones now. And the computer companies, uh, computer companies are very happy about that because they're going to turn them over pretty quickly. Uh, during the last uh, parliament, I worked very hard to get a fairer deal for franchisees. Um, I was involved in a dispute assisting uh, former Leonard franchisees um, in my area. It's a very sad case that many of these have lost their houses and their homes and their livelihoods and gone broke as a result of being done over by what I consider a rogue franchise organisation. And I'll be talking about more of this later. And I'm going to be asking ASIC to do their job, particularly the small business manager, Mr Martin, to toughen up the compliance regime in this area. I'll continue to work with my colleagues in this place, and the member for Hasluck and I have already talked about this, about 14 visa holders. And finally, I remain an outspoken critic of the current situation at the Perth airport. Long delays, queues for check-ins. I've written to Prime Minister Rudd about this. It's a disgrace that the Perth airport in a booming state like Western Australia is little better than the Lagos airport in terms of confusion, uh, congestion and uh, unsafe, uh, unsafe uh, sort of uh, transit through the airport. 
and it really needs the federal government to take a strong hand to modernise the master plan for that airport and make sure that Western Australia benefits from the boom that we're going through. So this the is another project I will continue to work for on behalf of Western Australia and my constituents. And thank you. I call the member for Mallee to move the debate. <clears throat> Uh, Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary for Early Childhood Education and Child Care. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that business intervening before order of the day, number 16, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. The question is that the intervening intervening before order of the day number 16 government business be po postponed until a later hour this day all those of that opinion say aye no aye. aye i think the ayes have it the clerk government business order of the day number 16 infrastructure australia bill 2008 resumption of debate on the second reading the question is that this bill be now read a second time to that i call the leader of the nationals Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the bill before the House uh, creates Infrastructure Australia, a statutory authority within the infrastructure, transport, regional development and local government portfolio, with members drawn from the various levels of government and industry. It will have functions that include uh, auditing Australia's national infrastructure and considering current and future infrastructure requirements. This new body was promised by Labor during the election campaign uh, on the pretext of improving the national infrastructure planning process and to advise government and private stakeholders on infrastructure issues. Madam Deputy Speaker, good infrastructure is the veins through which the lifeblood of the economy flows. Good road, rail, shipping, telecommunications and other infrastructure is essential to keep our country strong. Infrastructure is vital to exports, to imports, to industry, to commerce, but it also is critical for our day-to-day -day activities and the enjoyment of our environment. Now, traditionally, most infrastructure has been a state responsibility, and that has led to its own series of issues, different rail gauges, different traffic rules, different priorities and standards, and certainly different outcomes. Over recent years, the federal government has sought to take a leadership role to help try and standardise the laws and to, and to deliver better cooperation between the, the states. Now, some issues, like the rail gauge, will be very difficult to resolve, but some progress has been made and barriers broken down which have made it difficult to do business when an industry is, uh, it crosses borders. In addition, the federal government has provided significant funding for the first time for infrastructure, infrastructure projects. Uh, for rail funding, particularly through the establishment of the ARTC, which has done an excellent job in helping to develop a national rail network for the first time in this country. We've, funded, we've developed and funded Auslink, which provides for the first time again a significant financial contributions from the federal government uh, towards the national road system. But we've also worked at a local level through very successful programs like Roads to Recovery to help ensure that local roads and streets are also improved and become a part of a national infrastructure plan. Uh, we've, we've made strategic contributions at a national level to, to important projects that, though not on the national highway or the national railway, are nonetheless vital to ensure the progress of commerce and industry in a particular region. And there's no doubt at all that the Australian government's involvement over the years now has made a difference. There have been significant advances. On the other hand, it's been disappointing to note that the more money the Australian government has put into infrastructure development, it seems the less the states have chosen to provide. States have pulled back on expenditure when, in fact, they should have been encouraged by the Commonwealth investment to do more. They, they, instead, when they see a project of importance, the states tend to demand that the federal government pay, rather than recognising that their revenue flows are sufficient to cover 
many of the vital infrastructure projects that are particularly a state responsibility. Many of them have, avoid, uh, have sought to avoid their share uh, when a project has indeed had a shared responsibility. And indeed, they've cut back also on their support for local government, which meant that local roads did not get the full benefit of the Roads to Recovery program because, in, in the end, the local government had to raise additional funds to cover for the, st the state Labor governments withdrawing financial assistance to them. So it is, it is, it is disappointing that the states have generally, almost without exception, have, have res responded to the generosity of the federal government over the last decade or more by cutting back their own contributions. And so the real benefit of some of this federal investment has not been seen at the, lo at the local level. In addition to that, project management by the states of the infrastructure funded by the federal government has been poor, in some cases, frankly, disgraceful. They've, the states have, had, have, have so run down their capacity to manage projects that rarely is any, is, is any new infrastructure scheme uh, completed on time or on, or on budget. Indeed, it is not uncommon for federal funding to sit in straight state treasuries for years, eroding away uh, while the states get around to finally drawing the plans and getting on with the project. Almost always, when a project is announced, uh, and, and there, is, there is a massive build-up in the costs between the time of that announcement and when the project actually begins. And as a result of that, particularly under programs like Auslink, uh, projects have had to be deferred to fund the ones that have already been announced, and they're being deferred because the cost has gone up, and the cost has gone up because the state simply hasn't got on with the job of building the road. And there are many disgraceful examples of traffic congestion, of, flood, of, of flooded roads for which the federal government has actually already provided the funding to upgrade, but the project has never occurred. And I think that that it demonstrates uh, a disappointing decline in the capabilities of state governments around Australia to deliver projects. Now, I know that it is a fact that in a strong and robust economy, such as Australia has enjoyed now for some time, that quality people quality managers are in demand in the private sector, many attracted to the mining industries but also to uh, infrastructure projects funded and developed uh, by the private sector. And that has meant that the states have lost a lot of their talent. In many cases there's also been fundamental incompetence at a political level at, uh, in, in the state governments. There's an inability to make decisions, a corruption in some states, but in addition to that uh, uh, decision-making processes that inevitably take years and years and years. In the 2005 budget, as an example, the federal coalition government provided grants to the states for a wide range of road projects. Now, those projects could only be funded because the states gave an assurance that they were ready to start, and the funds were provided immediately in that financial year. They were paid in lump sums to the states, uh, an issue that the Auditor General has commented about subsequently. But sadly, some of that money is still sitting in state treasuries today. Even though the states promised that these projects were ready to go, they could be funded under the rules uh, that apply to Commonwealth state funding, the projects simply haven't been built. There are people waiting at flood crossings in North Queensland that should have been fixed by now, but the money is instead sitting in a state treasury eroding away. And, and there are so many stories of, of this order. Uh, projects that should have been funded and, 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 and are still to this day not built. In other instances, there's been a clear example of poor planning or no planning at a state level uh, as well. Now, the Pacific Highway is a classic case of not only there being no funding provided to build this vital, vital piece of road, but no, no corridor had been identified for the new road network. And so when some money becomes available, you've got to go back to the very basics of trying to find and identify a suitable route for the road. In my own electorate, the, the Karoi to Kara bypass, an essential piece of infrastructure, infrastructure, and yet no corridor is developed to this day. 
and yet it's at the stage where that road should be under construction. So there's been a failure of planning at, at, at the local level by the various state governments. And then when the planning starts, it's often inept. The community consultation process is flawed. It inevitably takes forever, but there's not a genuine listening when it comes to identifying new, new transport corridors. Now, we all know that these issues are always contentious. No one wants a four-lane highway going past their property. They all want the four-lane highway because they want to get somewhere else, but they don't want it in their own yard. So it is always going to be difficult, and it's a trying time for governments and others who are associated with trying to identify a suitable corridor and then putting, uh, uh, putting the planning into place. And that simply hasn't been happening strongly enough at state levels over the years. And then the final point I want to make in relation to the role of the state governments in, in developing and, and providing infrastructure is the poor quality of the workmanship that's often delivered, particularly by state-owned road construction authorities. I've been appalled to see road projects fail many times uh, within months of construction. Projects that have never been, been a quality job right from the beginning and have failed again and again and again. And many of the states under the, under the, the, the funding arrangements have actually got an incentive not to do the job properly because they're expected to contribute towards maintenance, but if the whole road packs it in, well then the, they expect the Commonwealth to go in and fund the reconstruction. And so as a result of this, there's been no incentive for the, the states that have a responsibility for managing a lot of the national infrastructure to do the job properly. So states have certainly not done their job when it comes to uh, planning, constructing and funding uh, the road system of our nation. The states have also failed in relation to, to rail. It's a national disgrace that rail continues to lose market share. You know, uh, freight move, shifts onto road all the time. States have given up in many cases on their rail system. Queensland Rail owns more trucks than it owns trains. And if you put freight into your local train depot, it's almost certainly going to be carried by truck to its destination. So if the state governments who own this rail system have given up on its competitiveness and effectiveness, why would anybody else have any confidence in using trains? But the reality is that our national transport task is going to double by 2025. And so if rail does not do better, very, very much better, we will have so many extra trucks on the road that the road system will simply not cope. Now, even if train doubles its share of the, of the, uh, of the transport task, we will still have twice as many trucks on the road, and that's unacceptable. So trains and the, and the rail system must do very, very much better, and I'm concerned that, many, that, that, that the states have lost confidence in their rail system. They're allowing the, the branch networks to deteriorate and not prepared to put the, in, the investment that's necessary to ensure that we have quality rail around the country. And even in states where the rail system is underpinned by large-scale commodity movements, a failure to invest has meant that that infrastructure has deteriorated over the last decade or two. And the classic case of that has been the disappointing performance of Australia's coal exports over the last couple of years. At a time when the world wants our coal, when prices are at record levels, when there is an enormous capacity to sell Australian coal around the world, our, our trains and our ports have been unable to deliver. That's been an, a national disgrace and an embarrassment. And we have to say to people that you can't get the coal that you want because we can't deliver it. And we've all seen the television pictures of 30, 40, 50, 60 ships lined up at a port, unable to come in and, and take on a cargo because the, the port facilities are inadequate and the rail facilities to get it there have also, uh, are also in, in, inadequate. The infrastructure failures have damaged our growth and our quality of life over the years. And despite the enormous investment that the previous federal government put into infrastructure development, we have not achieved maximum value for those dollars because of the difficulty of engaging the states in delivering the projects more effectively. Now, part of Labor's answer to this problem is to establish Infrastructure Australia. However, this, this, this particular body is unlikely to be able to make much impact 
on delivering uh, infrastructure services in an efficient and an effective way. Currently, Labor is worried about the inflationary effect of bottlenecks in our infrastructure, and, it's, and dealing with those issues is one of, its five point, uh, one of the points in its five-point plan to address inflation. Of course, fixing infrastructure is important, and I've just very, I think, very strongly made the case for us uh, undertaking infrastructure investment. But Spending more money on infrastructure is not going to make any contribution, any positive contribution to inflation for a decade or more. It takes a long time to build the roads, fix up the reports, get the shipping systems working properly. And in the short term, more spending more money on infrastructure is actually likely to be inflationary rather than to reduce inflation. Now we do need to spend the money on infrastructure, but to suggest that this is a relevant part of a five-point plan to address inflation just demonstrates how economically illiterate the government actually is. Labor's complaining about the policy challenges of handling success, an economy that's booming and providing historically high opportunities for young Australians to participate in the workforce. This economy is, of course, the result of the competent economic management that occurred under the previous government. The five-point plan will do nothing to improve the pressures in relation to inflation in Australia. While some of the ideas are worthwhile and need to be done, they are not a part of, an, of, an, of a plan that will ease the pressure of inflation on Australian working families today, next month, next year or even in five years' time. And for that reason, uh, Labor needs to develop a genuine capacity to manage the economy if it's to earn any confidence from the Australian business community and the Australian community for, for its business management. By 2012-13, the export value of Australia's commodities will have grown by 34 per cent. Similarly, export earnings from Australia's energy commodities are forecast to increase by 51 per cent over the next year. Farm commodities are expected to rise from $26.7 billion in 2007-08 to $31 billion in 2008-09, an increase of 18 per cent. So we do need to continue the investment in infrastructure. Now, Labor's wrong to say that there was no national planning framework for infrastructure under the previous government. Auslink was established by the former coalition government in 2004 and represented the most significant change since Federation in the way in which we tackle the national transport task. Auslink was a comprehensive planning arrangement that covered both road and rail and involved both the Commonwealth and the states. Under Auslink, jurisdictions were able to develop long-term strategies for key major transport corridors, rating projects according to merits and giving ample lead time to the private sector. The industry knew the program years ahead and were therefore able to plan for it. So the reality is that Auslink did develop a national planning framework for road and rail. And the state governments, or Labor, were involved in that planning process and the choice of projects. Labor should also be aware of the entity called the Council of Australian Governments. We've heard a lot about it since the election of the Rudd government. Well, they should also therefore know that in June 2005, COAG agreed that each state and territory should prepare an infrastructure report every five years, and that the first of those reports were to be completed by January of this year. Presumably, they're sitting on the minister's desk. So he already has an audit of each of the state's infrastructure needs. He has a report on their progress in meeting those challenges. So what is Infrastructure Australia going to do that's not already being done under the current Auslink process? It's not the first national planning fra framework. We've already had that in place involving federal and state governments uh, with, with an overview from COAG for some years. Uh, bureaucrat Prime Minister Rudd is, uh, is now building a new $20 million Member bureaucracy to do a similar kind Minister. of task. By his the, the, the planning title. process exists and Infrastructure Australia runs the risk of being just another bureaucratic creation, completing a task that's already done. Now, to, to, to return to a, a number of the other Labor comments 
about the previous government and its infrastructure investment. Under the first Auslink program, 2004-05 to 2008-09, the coalition government provided $15.8 billion in funding for land transport infrastructure. Under Auslink 2, the, the, the previous government was to, to invest $22.3 billion in Australian land transport system. We actually went further than that during the election campaign, adding another three to five billion dollars towards our commitments for roads. That would be the largest investment in land transport infrastructure that has ever been made by an Australian government. So, so, so the reality is that Australia has been spending significantly on its infrastructure. It's not as good as we would like. It will require constant investment year in, year out, but we have been able to provide an infrastructure that has underpinned a world-class economic performance. A second point that's of importance is that the previous government had an infrastructure planning framework. Claims by Labor that we did not are wrong. Labor also claimed that the former coalition government did not take infrastructure challenges seriously. That's also wrong. The records show that the former coalition government under Auslink had spent more than any other government on infrastructure programs. And indeed, it's interesting to note that in spite of the fact that the government says that infrastructure expenditure is a part of its five-point plan to, to, uh, to tackle inflation, they actually plan to spend less on roads and rail and infrastructure than the previous coalition government had spent. They're cutting the funding not increasing it, which further undermines the, the credibility of their claims. As an example, uh, we've already seen Labor scrap the F3 to Brankston, uh, Braxton uh, link road. Many of you will recall the comments of the Federal Transport Minister in this place that the critically important road to remove bottlenecks around the Newcastle and the Hunter Valley area did not add up. And this statement was astonishing, given that the member for Hunter, now the Minister for Defence, had promised before the election that a Rudd Labor government would absolutely match the coalition's commitment of $780 million to commit the link road. This broken promise is a devastating blow to the people of the Hunter and makes a mockery of Labor's claims that it is determined to fix infrastructure bottlenecks as a part of its anti-inflationary strategy. The Rudd Labor government has also delayed funding of $65 million provided for critical rail maintenance in regional Australia. You may recall the misleading statement made in this place by the Federal Trans Minister, Transport Minister that pushing the funding back to 2009-10 related only to the inland rail proposal. That was wrong. Treasury papers showed that $65 million of this money was to be used by the Australian Rail Track Corporation for maintenance and upgrading of a number of existing rail lines that could contribute to a future inland rail corridor. They've also taken $500 million off the promised funding from the Karoi to Kara section of the Bruce Highway, the worst accident stretch in the state, the lowest ranked road in the whole of Queensland. Under Labor's timetable for the upgrading of this accident stretch, which has already had 34 accidents in, uh, fatal accidents in the last uh, five years and another two or three in recent days, will mean that under Labor's timetable it will be 2070, 2070 before this, the four laning of this high priority section will be completed. The Labor government is, is, is slashing funding for road and rail lines which are already operating and allowing products to be moved up and down the eastern states. I'd also observe the, observe the failure of federal labour to prod their counterparts into completing the projects for which funding has already been provided. These bottlenecks are meaning that funds already offered are simply not being, not being spent and therefore the cost blowouts will eventually be met by federal taxpayers. As always, it's, uh, when, when labour says something, you've really got to look at their deeds, not their words. If they were truly determined to remove in infrastructure bottlenecks as a part of a strategy for fighting inflation, they would be not making these kinds of decisions to cut projects, to slash road expenditure. They would, in fact, be increasing it. Now, in relation to Infrastructure Australia, there are a number of issues which I think need to be, need to be addressed. Uh, Labor is on record as saying 
and I refer to the member for Batman's comments on the 18th of July last year at the Australian Rail Summit in Sydney, that Federal Labor is absolutely committed to the retention of all Auslink programs. So Labor is committed to supporting the $15.8 billion in land transport infrastructure over the five years to 2008-09 under Auslink 1 and the $22.3 billion worth of, uh, of land transport uh, investments uh, in Auslink 2 from 2009 to 2013 and 14. Now Labor has also said that all of its election promises will be honoured. All of its election promises will be honoured. They spent the whole of that $22.3 million during the election campaign with their promises. So I ask, what is Infrastructure Australia going to do between now and 2014 while we're waiting for new funding to be made available? Labor is, the, the Infrastructure Australia is not going to be allowed to reassess Labor's election promises, so there in fact will be no money available for new projects new investments in infrastructure until 2014. So why are we setting up a $20 million bureaucratic body when in fact it will have no money to spend, no projects to prioritise? Or, or is it going to work between now and then just to develop the next list, Osling 3's projects for funding? Uh, or is it in fact going to fill some other kind of uh, bureaucratic process which in fact delays projects rather than advances them? We already have the infrastructure reports. They should be on the minister's table. He should know, therefore, now what projects need to be funded and what the priorities are. Uh, infrastructure Australia's first task, we're told, is going to be a 12-month review. And I hope that that review is not just an excuse for Labor, uh, both federally and at the state level, to simply duck the hard decisions and provide ex convenient excuses to delay expenditure on very important infrastructure projects. I also hope that the function of Infrastructure Australia to evaluate proposals for investment in nationally significant infrastructure does not become a bureaucratic hurdle uh, for the private sector to overcome when it's, uh, uh, when it's proposing projects which, which uh, already have to go through a very complex and involved approval process. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the opposition will move some amendments to this bill to try and improve its operations. I note that the bill, as it is currently drafted, stipulates that Infrastructure Australia may only evaluate infrastructure proposals on advice from the minister. It is unable, therefore, as I said earlier, to independently consider, for example, uh, the ALP's infrastructure election promises. If this is to be a, an independent body to assess where the money needs to be spent on the highest priority projects, why can't it look at what Labor has already promised? Particularly since Labor has, has spent every cent that will be available between now and 2014. It's a rather restrictive component of the, of the legislation that significantly constrains the capacity of Infrastructure Australia to engage in reviews of its own volition. I, for one, would welcome an independent analysis of the rigour and appropriateness of Labor's election promises. And I'm disappointed that Infrastructure Australia will not be able to undertake this task. I also note that the minister may give directions to Infrastructure Australia without reference to parliament. I think in the interest of transparency, directions by the minister to Infrastructure Australia should be tabled in each house rather than just being buried as currently proposed in the annual report of Infrastructure Australia. I think also that the minister, when making, such, uh, when making appointments to Infrastructure uh, Australia, particularly the appointment of Infrastructure Coordinator, should be compelled at the very least to consult the members of Infrastructure Australia uh, before making that appointment. The last thing we want to see is Labor using Infrastructure Australia as a vehicle in handing out jobs to its mates. They have already announced that Sir Rod Eddington is to be the chair of this new body, so we have got the chair announced before we have even got the legislation in the parliament to set the organisation up. Uh, hardly a logical process. But again, I know they owe Sir Rod, uh, Sir Rod quite a deal. They humiliated him before the previous election by appointing him to an important business consultancy role and then making all the decisions without even speaking to him. So this is obviously some kind of an apology get square for the government to, to, to Sir Rod, and uh, I think that, they have, uh, that it is an embarrassment 
uh, to Sir Rod that he was treated so badly by Labor, and I'm surprised that he's accepted this kind of a post from a government who obviously values his advice so, so poorly. So I'll be moving some uh, technical amendments to rectify many of these weaknesses in the bill. We won't be opposing the establishment of Infrastructure Australia, but we do want it to work better and we want to place on record our firm rebuttal of Labor's attempts to rewrite history in relation to the provision of infrastructure over recent years. The, the previous government has a proud record of its investment in Australian infrastructure needs. We do need to have a strong planning framework. There was one in place. I presume that will continue with Osling, but now there will be a second uh, planning process in place. There will be a bureaucratic creation that makes the rollout of national infrastructure, I suspect, harder rather than easier. So we wonder whether this bureaucratic entity uh, will in fact uh, provide significant advantages for Australia, but we do believe it is important to have a clear process for planning and investment in, in the nation's infrastructure. This bill will be useless unless the Australian government adds uh, the funding that will be necessary to upgrade the roads, the rail, the ports that are so essential to keep the Australian economy strong the in the years ahead. The member's time has expired. I call the min Minister for Youth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Chief Government Whip. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> I ask leave of the House to move a motion to refer bills to the main committee for further consideration. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Chief Government Whip. I move that the following bills be referred to the main committee for further consideration. Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Bill 2008, Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 2008, Screen Australia Bill 2008, National Film and Sound Archive Bill 2008, Screen Australia and National Film and Sound Archive Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2008 and Infrastructure Australia Bill 2008. Madam Deputy Speaker, could I point out to all honourable members in the House that this motion enjoys the support of uh, the Chief Opposition Whip, the honourable member for Fairfax. The question is that the following bills be referred to the main committee for further consideration. Telecommunications Incepts and Access Amendment Bill 2008, Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 2008, Screen Australia Bill 2008, National Film and Sound Archive Bill 2008, Screen Australia National Film and Sound Archive Consequential and Transitional Provisional Bill 2008, and Infrastructure Australia Bill 2008. All those of that opinion say aye, against no, the ayes have it. I have received a message from the Senate informing the House that Senator Parry has been discharged from the Joint Committee on the Broadcasting of Parliamentary Proceedings and that Senator Cormann has been appointed as a member of that committee, that Senator Ferenti Wells has been discharged from the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and that Senator Firefield has been appointed a member of that committee, and that Senator Cormann has been discharged from the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and that Senator S. Macdonald has been appointed a member of that committee. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to amend the law relating to financial sector and for related purposes and transmits it to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to the financial sector and for related purposes. The Minister for Youth and Sport. Thank you. I move that the second reading be made an order of the day for the next sitting. The question is the second reading be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye, against no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business. Order of the day number two. Skills Australia Bill 2008. Resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Boothby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, many factors have contributed to Australia's current skills shortages. It's the result of trade training or technical education being talked down over the past 20 to 30 years, leading to a perception in the community that trade training is a second best option to a university education. 
It's due to 16 years of, of uninterrupted strong growth in the economy and, as a consequence, strong jobs growth. We have an unemployment rate now at 4.1 per cent, the lowest since November 1974, and a growing workforce with growth in part-time jobs particularly strong. Some of the shortages are due to where we are in the business cycle. In a 2002 report uh, by the then Department DEST, uh, Department of Education, Science and Training, um, Nature and Causes of Skill Shortages, Reflections from the Skill Shortage Working Groups, uh, looking back over 20 years of skills needs, found that in some areas, uh, such as construction trades and metal trades, shortages were evident at the peak of the business cycle, whereas some have been widespread uh, for most of the last 20 years, such as chefs and pastry cooks. Um, in other words, it's where we are in the business cycle. We have been, the economy has been expanding um, for 16 years. And it's worth pointing out that in the recessions, uh, the most recent one of the early 1990s, there were no skill shortages because there was massive unemployment and uh, almost a million people out of work back then. However, Labor claim that skill shortages in Australia are a direct result of the former government's neglect, neglect of the vocational education and training sector. This is simply not true. It's due to a strongly growing economy over 16 years and, as a consequence, strong jobs growth. In 1996, $1 billion was alloc allocated to the vocational education and training sector. In 2007-08, uh, the former government allocated $2.9 billion to the VET sector, an increase in real terms of 97 per cent. In total, the former government invested $24 billion in skills and training over 11 and a half years. In 1996, 30,000 apprentices on average were completing apprenticeships, and only 16,000 people over the age of 25 were undertaking one. Compare that to now, where we've seen over the last four years, 544,000 apprentices have completed an apprenticeship, and in 2006, we had over 142,000 people complete an apprenticeship, and we now have 160,000 people over the age of 25 currently undertaking an apprenticeship. That is a tenfold increase um, for mature age um, apprentices since 1996. We've also seen strong growth in recent years in traditional trade apprentices. By comparison, and despite all their rhetoric about addressing skill shortages, one of the first decisions of the new government has been to scrap incentives for apprentices, apprenticeships in agriculture and horticulture, which was providing for apprentices $800 for a toolkit and up to $1,000 to help meet training fees. To meet future skills needs, the former government was establishing 28 Australian technical colleges and committed during the election that a re-elected coalition government would take that number to 100 at a cost of $2.1 billion. We now have over 2,000 students already receiving high-level training from ATCs, colleges which were opposed by Labor. We forecasted before the election that 10,000 students would be receiving training by next year from Australian technical colleges. Regrettably, these outstanding facilities will be transferred to schools after 2009. In addition to the technical colleges, we invested profoundly in work skill vouchers in order to meet popular demand. We pushed for more autonomy within the, within the TAFE system and we were committed to supporting apprentices throughout their training because we believe there is more to skills and training than just providing training places. Most apprentices receive low wages, particularly during their first two years. That's why we introduced the Tools for Your Trade incentives, Commonwealth Trade Learning Scholarships, Apprentice Wage Top-Up, Training Free Vouchers and the Living Away From Home Allowance and extending that to school-based apprentices in October 2007. Uh, the debate um, that, that we're, uh, the, uh, the bill that we're debating now um, provides for the establishment of Skills Australia. Uh, the Rudd government has said that it, it will invest in additional training places and introduce an advisory board to tell them where these additional places should go. Skills Australia, an independent statutory body that will provide advice to the government on current and future demand for skills and training, will be created by this bill. We're told the body will provide advice to the government on where to allocate the additional training places promised in Labor's election policy document, Skilling for Australia's Future. 
It's expected that it will collect information and put together data on Australia's current and future skills needs. There's nothing new about this. Uh, this function was done by the Australian National Training Authority, and it's being done now, and it's being done now by the National Industry Skills Committee and by DEWA. So this is another one of Labor's boards that were announced during the election campaign to give them, at last count, 81 new bureaucracies. The, the seven-member board, which will make up Skills Australia, will be appointed by the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion, and the qualifications to be appointed on the board is that members must have between them experience in academia, the provision of education and training, economics and industry. However, despite this, who exactly will sit on the board is unclear. While we support the introduction of Skills Australia, its success will rely heavily on the people who sit on the board. Um, Labor continues to stay quiet about who will be on the board. Uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry have called for the chair of the board to have an industry background. Again, no response uh, from Labor. The coalition believes it is critical that the new structure envisaged by Labor has strong business input at all levels. Unfortunately, there is not adequate business input in the proposed model outlined in Labor policy. The second concern is that the establishment of Skills Australia will create a second advisory body to advise the government of future workforce needs. There is currently already the National Industry Skills Committee and also, as I said, the, the department, DEWA. They both perform this function currently. While Labor are putting a lot of faith in Skills Australia, it's merely a third source of advice for the government about where to allocate training places. Um, case in point, 20,000 training places have been allocated to begin on 1 April. Where these training places occur um, was, was not determined by Skills Australia. It was determined by one of these bodies, the National Industry Skills Committee or by the department itself. Skills Australia is expected to provide advice to the government as to where the additional training places promised by Labor, that is the additional 450,000 training places over the next four years, should go. But this process only relates to these additional places. The arrangements under Skilling Australia, the uh, Commonwealth State Agreement for Skilling Australia's workforce from 2005 to 2008, will not be affected, including the functions of the National Industry Skills Committee. The National Industry Skills Committee provides advice under that agreement to the Ministerial Council, such as workforce planning and future training priorities within the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations. What the opposition would like to know is what is the relationship between Skills Australia and the National Industry Skills Committee? What are the differences between Skills Australia and the National Industry Skills Committee? What will Skills Australia be doing that is not currently performed by the National Industry Skills Committee? If Labor is serious about reducing duplication and reducing government spending, then they should guarantee that Skills Australia and the National Industry Skills Committee will not be undertaking similar duties, duplicating work, duplicating research and thus wasting taxpayers' money. Labor are putting an enormous faith in the capacity of Skills Australia. Uh, there is another concern, and that is that forecasting, labor forecasting is an imperfect science. Labor are putting enormous faith in the capacity of Skills Australia to forecast future skills needs. Um, as Gavin Moody pointed out in The Australian on the 12th of December, the experience of labour market forecasting has been poor. Anticipating future school shortages is not easy and, in fact, Mr Moody states that there is no record of any country successfully anticipating future skills needs. In addition, the opposition has concern about Labor's centralised approach. We're told that with Skills Australia's advice on which industries are experiencing skill shortages, the government will allocate the places directly to those sectors. This will work by the government allocating the additional places on the advice of Skills Australia to the industry skills councils, who will allocate the places to employers in these uh, sectors experiencing sh skill shortages via a tender process and set up training packages for training providers. In other words, instead of allocating places according to demand from the workforce, i.e. That is, that is where individuals themselves would like to train, the places will be allocated centrally by the minister. 
This puts enormous power in the hands of the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations. It concentrates unprecedented power in the office of the Deputy Prime Minister. Labor have stated that this model is a demand-side approach. It is nothing of the sort. What they are doing is replacing a market-based demand-side policy, which was the Australian skills vouchers, and replacing it with a central planning solution where supply is provided by the industry skills councils. Amy Owens, a former TAFE manager, had this to say about Labor's policy. These arrangements are, pr are predicted on an unprecedented degree of centralised control over the distribution of training effort. They bypass the states and territories, current user choice mechanisms and other direct client provider training transactions and institutionalise Commonwealth controlled entities as the sole broker of relations between employers and training providers. That's Amy Owen in Campus Review out in the cold. Industry skills councils are bodies which provide training packages. There is considerable concern about the capacity of the industry skills councils to deliver these places while focusing on the development of training packages. A further concern the opposition has is that Labor has to realise that if their intention is to address skill shortages in certain sectors, then providing training places has to be met with incentives to enter these particular sectors. If prospective students don't find a particular sector attractive, then they won't enter that sector. As one columnist said, prospective students will choose to do something else rather than fill empty places in engineering, education and nursing if they don't find them attractive. People study what they want to, and people will undertake vocational training in an industry that they want to work in. People will follow their dream, find a career which suits their background and interests. If young students don't want to study science at university, then they won't. If they don't want to be a teacher, an accountant, a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician or a mechanic, then they won't. What we can do is encourage people and provide incentives to alleviate concerns prospective students may have with undertaking into a an, into an trade apprenticeship, such as the low apprenticeship wages students face in the first two years of training. In fact, as a direct result of that concern, we introduced a tax-free payment of $1,000 per year for students undertaking an apprenticeship in their first two years in an area of skill shortages. In 2005, we introduced the Tools for Your Trade incentives, providing $800 toolkits to people undertaking an apprenticeship in an industry experiencing skill shortages. Up to 34,000 uh, apprentices uh, were able to receive uh, toolkits each year, although uh, not the apprentices in agriculture and not the apprentices in horticulture in rural areas. That's more than the number of completed uh, apprenticeships in the last year of the former Labor government. In 2007, we extended that offer to people taking up training in agricultural and horticultural industries and provided them with up to $1,000 for, for, to pay for their training fees. Labor has now scrapped this initiative, and here is another concern. Labor have announced a five-point approach to reduce pressure on inflation. Addressing bottlenecks and constraints in the economy was done by the previous government, and it makes good public policy sense. However, sometimes I get the feeling that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Case in point, Minister for Finance scraps incentives for apprentices in agriculture and horticulture, while Minister for Education is proposing 60,000 additional apprentices over the next four years. I mean, it's great to have a plan to deal with inflation. It's great to have five points, but you've got to make sure that there's not an internal contradiction within those five points. And it is always good for the left hand to know what the right hand is doing. So while the opposition offers qualified support for Skills Australia, we do not agree that the establishment should come at the expense of important incentive packages. If Labor does not support apprenticeship places with extra incentives, then we will end up with a whole lot of research on where we have skill shortages, but we won't have any students undertaking the training because they can't afford to pay their training fees or can't get a toolkit. There have been a shortage of chefs and pastry chefs um, for, for, for 20 years, and there are much more fundamental problems than just simply providing the training places. Um, so while it's good in principle to allocate additional training places, it doesn't mean much if the people can't afford to pay their training fees 
or cannot complete their apprenticeship due to financial hardship. Now, we, um, we also introduced a living away from home allowance for those who had to move away from home to complete their training. We extended that last year so school-based apprentices can receive this support. That is another thing that has been scrapped by the Minister for Finance, um, razor, razor gang cuts of, uh, of February. Labor did not believe that school-based apprentices required support and have scrapped that initiative as well. So while it's good in principle to allocate these additional training places, it doesn't mean a lot if secondary students can't afford to move away from home to complete their training. Um, now, to encourage people to undertake additional places, we also need to raise the perception of trade training. An apprenticeship should be and needs to be seen as important and as prized as a university degree. The former government's Australian technical colleges were part of a longer plan to raise the prestige of trade training. Labor's trade training centres for all secondary schools will do nothing to raise the prestige of trade training. In fact, if anything, it may do the opposite. The introduction of fee help to the vet industry was also part of this process to remove the barriers for people who want to upgrade their qualifications or take a higher vet qualification by attending a full fee course. Labor are talking about introducing these places into the vet sector, but they're yet to provide us with any detail on how it will work in practice. For example, how will TAFE and the registered training organisations cope with the additional places? We wanted to see greater autonomy given to TAFEs um, to the level enjoyed by universities. With greater autonomy, TAFEs could respond to emerging labour needs much better than any politician can. If labour really wants to address skill shortages, then they should not rely on these additional places and Skills Australia alone. The point is this. We offer qualified support. Uh, for the establishment of Skills Australia. We support the extra training places. Uh, we agree with the competitive tendering in the allocation of packages. But this has all been funded through the scrapping of the popular Work Skills Voucher Program. And we are concerned that Labor's approach by scrapping the Work Skills Vouchers, which allowed people to take up the training that they believe will benefit them in the courses um, they, would, they would like to do. Workforce planning is difficult. When Labor were last in government, they relied heavily on the Bureau of Labor Market Research. It failed to anticipate many workforce shortages. Their proposed model is a top-down approach, which doesn't allow uh, local TAFEs or, reg or um, registered training organisations to respond to local emerging needs. It has no way of responding to where individuals would like to train themselves. The idea of Skills Australia is not a bad one, but our concern is that under Labor's proposed model, there is insufficient input from business who will be providing these future jobs, and that we have moved from a more responsive demand-side approach to one where the supply of training places will be allocated in Minister Gillard's office. Minister for Employment Participation. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm, I rise to, of course, support the um, the bill. Uh, the bill itself, of course, would provide for the establishment of a statutory authority, Skills Australia, uh, which will uh, enable the government uh, to properly establish what skills are needed and where they need to be located. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, Skills Australia is a key plank in the Australian government's five-point plan to fight inflation. The Prime Minister and other ministers and, indeed, other members of government have made the point very clear that we have a 16-year high inflation rate. It's a legacy that's been left by the Howard government, something we have to attend to. That, is, that has occurred as a result of a number of factors, not least of all the failure by the previous government to anticipate the skill deficiency. Now, um, I'll accept, uh, by, I'll accept um, some of the assertions made by the opposition, indeed by the shadow minister, that you can't anticipate um, precisely um, all of the skill deficiencies that beset the country. Um, but to think that after 11, almost 12 years in government, um, the Howard government could not have anticipated um, um, the, the problems that uh, the, the lack of skills um, that were, um, that were um, causing concern to employers and industry across the country is a hard thing to accept. 
The fact is, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the previous government stopped thinking about public policy, uh, stopped considering the importance of um, this particular area, and uh, this bill will start to get the country back on track to have a to have a. Um, uh, uh, a, a policy in the area of skills that will be demand-driven, that is, um, will Minister, provide— Minister, I just have to interrupt you for a minute. It being 8.30, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn the Minister for Youth and Sport. I require the question to be put immediately without debate. The question is that the House do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye, against no. I think the noes have it. The Minister for Employment Participation. Th thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I say that, that that is one of the problems um, that we confront. We have had um, a government that ignored um, this area of public policy, did not acknowledge the problem was as big as it was, and as a result, we now have hundreds of occupational groups where, where, um, uh, where we need um, those positions to be filled with people with expertise and qualifications. Now, Skills Australia, um, as a statutory authority, will provide expertise to the government in order to attend to this particular shortage. As I said, as I was saying before being interrupted procedurally, um, can, I was saying, of course, that we are going to ensure that this is a demand-driven approach to the extent that we will ensure that employers will be given an opportunity to identify the skills they need for, to ensure a successful business. What has happened, Madam Deputy Speaker, over the last decade is employers have been disengaged from this area um, to a point where people are acquiring skills that are not necessary and, indeed, in the case of um, the shortages, there has not been sufficient uh, involvement of employers and industry in the area of um, uh, skills. So, um, we believe the Skills Australia um, uh, body uh, will provide that leadership and will advise government appropriately in order to ensure um, that uh, we are focusing on those needs. We know, um, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, there are major problems. We've got capacity constraints in the economy. Uh, we're attending to, of course, our fiscal responsibilities by ensuring um, that the budget this year will be 1.5 per cent of GDP or more. We're ensuring that um, we're encouraging private savings. Uh, we are going to ensure that there is a proper focus uh, on um, removing bottlenecks uh, in the economy. And indeed, uh, we are focusing, and this bill exemplifies that particular focus, on the skills uh, requirements of this nation. And fifthly, can I say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of course, fifthly, in rela relation to the um, the, uh, the war we will combat against inflation. Uh, we are going to increase employment participation because it is critical uh, that we do so in order to fight inflation and to mitigate the adverse impacts of, um, or uh, indeed pre uh, prevent, uh, if wherever possible, um, uh, the increases in, uh, in interest rates. So, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this bill is part of that that approach that the government's taking. We're filling the void that was left by the Howard government, and we're seeking to do so. Can I say, with respect to my own portfolio, um, there are, of course, and it's announced, um, it's been announced by the government, there'll be 450,000 vet places over the course of the next four years. 175,000 of which will be vet places that will target people who are not in work, who are looking to enter the workforce, or who are, mar who, or who are marginally attached to the workforce. That's something that. Um, um, I'm very happy to be working. Uh, uh, to be happy to be working in that area. It is a critical area because it provides the wherewithal for job seekers to um, have the re requisite skills to be uh, uh, in demand by employers who are crying out for labour. Um, and can I say, um, can I say, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there's a series of comment, uh, reports that have been outlined. Uh, in recent times that have gone to the problems that beset the country as a result of the previous government's inaction. Firstly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, um, the, uh, Vecchi had um, made the point that the work for the Dole schemes were deficient in many respects. Indeed, uh, Vecchi, um, Vecchi did indicate uh, as recently as last week um, uh, that the work for the Dole scheme should be overhauled or even scrapped. Um, because it does not give the unemployed useful skills 
Um, that, was their, that is certainly one of the contentions in the submission they provided to the government um, as a result of the review that we are undertaking to look at the effectiveness of employment programs uh, and, indeed, employment services generally. Um, Vecchi were clear that that program is deficient in providing activities that would lead to employment. Um, in fact, I'm aware of occasions in which uh, job seekers are, uh, are having greater difficulty finding work because they're undertaking um, uh, nonsensical activities in some of the Work for the Dole programs. Now, I've been to a number of Work for the Dole programs and I've seen some elements which I'm happy with. Um, I'm not, not particularly keen on certainly other elements because there seems to be, um, there seems to be a lot of contrivance when it comes to the activities for job seekers. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly keen to, uh, to maintain any elements that will provide uh, the uh, participants with work skills or work, or, or, uh, um, work experience that provides uh, them with the greater capacity to find work. Um, but Vecchi does have a point. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, Vecchi has a point when it, makes it, when, when it suggests that there are areas which are seriously deficient and where some of the activities would not lead in any way uh, to improving the, li the likelihood of a job seeker finding work. Um, I can also um, point to comments made uh, with respect to this particular area um, from the BCA. Um, the BCA has uh, made it very clear that the previous government neglected the, the, um, neglected the skills crisis. They had been warned time and time again by all sorts of bodies, not least of all the Reserve Bank of Australia, but indeed employer bodies for the last decade have been warning the previous government about the, the, the growing skill shortages in this country, effectively saying they must attend to this. Now, that was, of course, that, that particular plea by that, that employer body and other employer bodies um, fell on deaf ears because the government, of course, did not, did not uh, seek to attend to that particular problem. Indeed, the author of a recent article um, in um, uh, a daily newspaper, um, uh, who is, in, uh, is Mr Greg Gailey, who is the president of the Business Council of Australia, says, and I quote, uh, said and I quote, more than ever, governments need to focus on fiscal policies and broader reform agendas in areas such as infrastructure, education, skills and workforce participation that collectively enhance the nation's capacity to grow. Uh, but recent federal budgets have not kept pace with the, ec the, with the economy's structural needs. Instead of focusing on policy settings that invest in those areas of the economy that drive long-term growth, Recent budget spending had, has remained fixed on driving even greater demand and consumption in, in the short term. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the BCA president is quite right in identifying the failures by the previous government to attend to those matters. And this bill today is about rectifying that problem. This bill is, is part of the solution um, that will be undertaken by this government in attending to uh, this, particular, uh, this very important area of public policy. Um, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So I'm very happy today to be, to, to be speaking to this matter. It's, it's very important that we get this right. Um, the establishing Skills Australia will be um, uh, certainly one of the first steps um, of many that this government will take as part of a comprehensive approach uh, to confronting and dealing with the skill challenges <coughs> of our nation. And indeed, if we establish the, uh, when, when we establish Skills Australia, we'll be helping to ensure that this nation can maintain its prosperity, improve its productivity, because that's been, in recent times at least, that's been in decline. And we, I think, um, need to do that as a matter of urgency. I do, uh, I do recognise the comments made by the Shadow Minister, who, whilst making some uh, criticism, you know, criticism of um, uh, the bill in, its, uh, bill in, in some areas uh, welcome the fact that there would be some attention to this skills area. Um, has indeed asked some questions about the composition of Skills Australia, which I think are legitimate questions that should be, uh, which are to be raised, and I think uh, those answers will be forthcoming. And I think that's a, a reasonable thing to be putting uh, to the government as to whether, in fact, the, the uh, the uh, seven personnel on this, on, on this statutory authority are indeed in keeping with the criterion which is set down in the bill, uh, and I'm confident that will be the case. Um, 
And, um, I guess the areas of disagreement, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that we say on this side that the, the previous government just did not, um, did not focus on this area. It dropped the ball. As the editor of The Age said in February, uh, only a few weeks ago, the, the, the Howard government dropped the ball on the skills agenda. Um, it, looked, it turned to other things. It turned to matters that uh, one of which was, uh, I guess, its own survival. But I guess it would have had a better chance of survival, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, if in fact it had um, att attended to the things that ordinary Australians need. And what ordinary Australians need, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a job um, or the skills um, that are necessary to be, um, to be uh, attractive for a prospective employer. And as the Minister for Employment Participation, I will want to ensure that the programs that we um, that we have out there for job seekers to, to participate within are in fact effective, that the training is meaningful, um, that, the, um, that the employers are engaged and with, with the government um, indeed and with other bodies to, to, to make sure that we match um, the skill needs with the skills. It is no point. There, there is no, I understand the, the argument that was put by the Shadow Minister that if somebody doesn't want to undertake a particular skill or attain a uh, uh, form of education or acquire a particular skill, um, it can't be a forced upon people. I understand if, <clears throat> if someone is so uh, averse to acquiring a particular skill, it's not, it's not easy uh, to suggest that they do so. Um, but, but equally, I think it's critical for us to ensure that um, that job seekers are focused on skills that are in demand, because it's going to be futile um, in terms of the vocational prospects of job seekers if we don't ensure that what, they're what, what skills they're acquiring has something to do with the real world um, and something to do with the demands of employers um, in, in this country. So, um, so uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a very important um, uh, debate to be had in this chamber. Um, the bill in itso itself, I think, is critical because it's going to set the path for the way in which the government will be advised as to the, um, the skills that are needed in this country. It's seeking, in a better way, I, I would argue, to anticipate uh, the skills required. And I accept, again, that it's, you cannot precisely anticipate all skills that are needed, but I think the previous government could have done more uh, in this area and ensure that there weren't so many employers crying out for, um, for um, people with the requisite, requisite skills. And um, there are other ways, of course, uh, that employers... There are other ways, um, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that employers um, uh, can, of course, seek to have um, the, the right uh, labour with the right particular skills. Um, they have the, the capacity to, um, to uh, attract um, labour from overseas. Uh, that mechanism that was used by the previous government, of course, there will be a, a similar mechanism that will be used by this government. Um, there are other areas of policy that will attract people back into the workforce. So, of course, you can have um, some incentives that will have second, um, second income earners coming back into the workforce or working longer as a result, for example, of the tax cuts that, that will be <coughs> announced, well, that have been announced but that will uh, take effect. Those tax cuts will, of course, increase the likelihood by increasing the incentive for, for example, second income earners to come back into the workforce or, or certainly work for, for longer hours. Um, there are other areas you can change so people stay other areas of public policy that you can, you can change that will um, encourage people to stay longer in the workforce. Um, but my primary focus is to ensure that those people that are unemployed or underemployed, who, want to, who can work and who want to work, and indeed in many cases who are compelled to look for work, um, are provided with proper <coughs> targeted training in order to fill the skills need. And, and on, that basis, um, on that basis, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would, um, I would commend the bill uh, to, to the House and, um, and hope that the uh, opposition accede to this particular, this particular bill and the reasoning behind it. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. To this I call the honourable member for Casey. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I just will take a brief moment of the House to support the Shadow Minister and Member for Boothby's early remarks on behalf of 
the opposition, as he said, we give this bill qualified support, uh, but we do so in a way where we think there are a number of pitfalls and potential flaws uh, that the government, a new government, should very much take heed of. Let me first of all, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, deal with uh, some of what the previous government did. I mean, over a 12-year period, we had record apprenticeship funding and record apprentices growing from 1996. And as the member for Boothley outlined, we introduced a range of incentives and initiatives to promote trades and apprenticeships. And as he rightly outlined, many of those, a great many of those, nearly all in fact, are being scrapped as the price uh, for Skills Australia. But let me first deal with some of the substance as the member for Boothby did and deal with the remarks of the previous speaker. Uh, forecasting of this nature is notoriously difficult. I know the previous speaker acknowledged that. Uh, he needs, I think, to also acknowledge that the track record of this is not good, not just in Australia, but anywhere in the world. I mean, that is a fact. Uh, no one's done this well throughout the world, and to put all of the eggs in one basket with this new body is certainly ambitious. If it works, everyone will be happy. This is not a, a political point. But that needs to be recognised very much up front. As the member for Boothby said, this seven-person board will be critical, uh, who the personnel are, how that works, how they interact with the industry schools councils and how all that plays out on the ground where it really matters. And of course, as he also said, uh, creating places of itself uh, looks good and sounds good, but creating a place does not mean that place will be filled. And in that sense, um, it will very much need to be the slickest and smoothest bureaucratic operation this town has ever known, if it's really going to work in the way those opposite hope it does. Now, of course, uh, as I said earlier and as the Shadow Minister outlined in great detail, this body is being created uh, at the cost of a number of key initiatives and incentives that were introduced by the previous government. The work skills vouchers are being scrapped. Business skills vouchers uh, are being scrapped. Uh, the Australian technical colleges are being scrapped. Uh, there are a range of other initiatives that were introduced that are also being scrapped, including the living away from home allowance and, as we've seen in the first days of this government, the incentives for apprenticeships in the agricultural and horticultural area, uh, $47.7 million worth of cuts. Uh, we point out in this debate that those uh, cuts are not in keeping uh, with the government's pre-election commitments at all. Uh, that has been acknowledged by those in the agriculture and horticulture sector. Uh, it was pledged by the previous government that none of the incentives whatsoever or subsidies, or subsidies would be uh, reduced or scrapped. We note that, for the record, the government itself should at least acknowledge that. It can't hide that fact. It can't hide the fact that what was in its pre-election policy is completely at odds with the Minister for Finance's early action, and that is something that the agriculture and horticulture industry are becoming well aware of. Specifically, we refer to the $800 to purchase toolkits and the contribution of up to $1,000 towards their fees. So, on the one hand, those members opposite claim that nothing was done by the previous government, yet their abolition of all these incentives is necessary for the creation of this body <laughs> to do all the things it hopes it will do. Now, you can't have it both ways. Those range of incentives were there to provide resources uh, to people wanting to take up a trade and wanting to take up an apprenticeship. They are extended to uh, the agriculture and horticultural area. They are extended in a number of other ways, as the Shadow Minister outlined. But uh, those opposite should at least acknowledge uh, that they were all there. Uh, they're abolishing them all, and they're abolishing them all because they have one single solution, 
which they are sure will work. Now, we are giving this qualified support. We have our doubts. I would say to them opposite. Um, advice is good. I do not speak disrespectfully uh, of the advice they are getting from their departments. But uh, quite often uh, it is worth having a, an open mind in these things. And we won't know for quite a period of time whether this is working. And this is the only shot in the locker for those opposite on this important area. So I'd urge them, as they implement it, um, to implement it very carefully and, as the Shadow Minister said, ensure that the, those who are appointed to that body are of the best calibre. They do include the good mix of representatives that are required. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I want to address also some of the other initiatives that those opposite have mooted, uh, particularly in the pre-election period. Uh, the trades training centres in schools in particular is another plank, I suppose, of uh, their approach to skills. I'd urge those opposite to re-examine this. This will not work. There are 2,650 secondary schools across Australia. And I know that the now Prime Minister, when he was Leader of the Opposition, stood here at this dispatch box in his reply to the budget and promised to create a trades training centre in every single one of those 2,650 secondary schools. It sounded good. It was designed for a budget night reply, but it wasn't designed with any deep policy thought in mind. This is the government's alternative to the Australian Technical Colleges. The Australian Technical Colleges, of course, were created to make up for the failure by previous state governments, and I say Liberal and Labor, who did this country a great disservice in abolishing technical schools. Uh, I don't say that in any partisan way. Uh, there is enough blame to go around from those decisions of governments in different states 20 and 30 years ago. And because the state governments today won't acknowledge that fault, the federal government set about establishing Australian technical colleges. We'd established, I think, 23 heading towards 28 and pledged another 100 during the election campaign. Leave aside the election promises and what were popular and what wasn't. The reason uh, the previous government didn't say we'll have a trades training centre in every single school is because, in policy terms, it was clear it wouldn't work and it can't work. If those opposite backflip on this policy, I will applaud, not criticise. Mm -hmm. It will not work. And for those ministers responsible for this, you will be explaining this away for a long period of time. The technical colleges were established so there was a scale of things. These were real dedicated colleges and there are some that exist today. There was key business input, both at the board level, in the establishment, creating a clear link and a pathway into the job fields in those particular local communities. And that local community input is critical. There is no group of politicians or bureaucrats in Canberra that is an expert on a particular local community and the job prospects that are going to be there in the next two, three, five or ten years. And getting industry involvement in the creation of those technical colleges and having them part and parcel of the board of management and having a scale of things and a scale of investment so that the students attending them actually got the best possible trades education was the motivation behind it. And those opposite in their heart of hearts know that. Uh, their policy was created for television consumption and to get through an election campaign. It was not created to help fix the skills crisis. And when you think there are going to be 2,650 trades training centres, Trades trading centres in name. 
with an investment of between half a million and 1.5 million. On average, I think 900,000, the shadow ministers said in earlier remarks in this House and in the media. Anyone with the most paltry knowledge of trades will know that he's not going to buy very much. It will buy the Trades Training Centre sign to hang on the workshop, and those opposite will dutifully go around and open these centres. Uh, it will buy some equipment. But if you look at the hospitality industry, which, with, with which I'm familiar, it's not going to purchase much. It will purchase an oven, uh, not a good one, not one you'd get at a proper Australian technical college. And then, of course, you'll have these small centres, many of which will be you know, glorified garages. But then what happens if the school decides its trades training centre is going to be in hospitality? And a significant number of the school population want to do automotive. They'll be studying in the kitchen or they'll be going to another school. Now, I appeal to those members opposite. This won't work. This is over a 10-year period to put a small investment spread across 2,650 locations. Now, look, 20 and 30 years ago, we all agree, unless I'm mistaken, that it was a mistake for state governments, both Labor and Liberal, to abolish technical schools. That's what existed, and I've heard members on both sides of this House say that was a mistake. The reason there weren't small-scale facilities at every single secondary school was precisely because they didn't give the scale necessary. That's why the solution is to right what was wrong and to go back, go back to the way it was, where roughly if you take suburban Melbourne, as the member opposite and I are from the great state of Victoria, when we grew up, and I think we're about the same age, he just looks a bit older than me. <laughs> and he, he, he declares uh, in line with the new government's approach that he's wiser. Well, that's, that's, that's good. He can, he can make, some, make, some, make some remarks on that at another time. But roughly speaking, you had two or three high schools for one technical school, all in one community. Now, we know that the bureaucrats are advising the government that this policy can't work. We know that. We know that there is all sorts of pressure to water this down and to try and get them to cluster in as many numbers as they can. Now, those opposite should recognise that whilst their policy was popular, this is not going to work in a practical sense. And as I said, if they backflip, we will applaud. The shadow minister and I will applaud that. And look, uh, the new member may wish to interject. It will only prolong me in my remarks, and he'll learn from his whip that actually you're trying to move through this rather quickly tonight. So um, I'd, I'd advise him to get back to his emails on his computer. <laughs> now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we want to see improved trades and apprenticeships. As we said, we'll give qualified support to this bill. As the Shadow Minister said, taking away those incentives that actually provide funds for people in a real, tangible and meaningful way uh, is a mistake. And I'd ask those opposite, uh, as they go forward, to consider that and consider their trade training centre policy, which is not going to fulfil its objective. Yeah. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. To this, I call the honourable member for Throsby. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I will return to um, some of the comments made by the member for Casey um, in uh, 
in terms of the debate about this bill. He did stray from the topic quite considerably, and I guess there will be opportunities at different times to return to the issues um, that were canvassed in relation to um, trade centres in the secondary school system. But the bill before us tonight um, has come to the chamber as a priority piece of legislation. Uh, it was decided to fast track the creation of Skills Australia uh, to do a number of things to help lift the productive capacity of our economy by dealing with the very severe skill shortages that exist. And it seems the member for Casey is still finding it hard to acknowledge uh, the profound problem that we have in terms of those skill shortages. And of course, in trying to address that uh, systemic problem, that uh, in so doing, we hope that it will also help in uh, the commitment we have to fight inflation. Uh, as um, the member for Gorton indicated in his contribution, the outcome of this legislation, we hope, will lead to the provision of some additional 450,000 training places. And with a sense of urgency, as I understand it, the first 20,000 of these places will be coming on stream by April the 4th. And very importantly, too, over the four-year period, up to 65,000 additional apprenticeships will be supported. So I think that gives you a sense of the urgency and the dimension of the problem that um, the minister and this side of the chamber are trying to comprehend and deal with. And you only have to look at report after report from a range of employer organisations um, to heed the warnings, and the alarm bell should have been ringing uh, a long time before. But over the period of the life of the Howard government, it seemed all we had was knee-jerk reactions, uh, ad hoc decisions, but really a failure to grasp the fundamental problems uh, that we have in the economy. Uh, according to even recent AIG reports that I looked at, um, they still talk about the fact that one in two firms are still experiencing difficulties obtaining skilled labour, and yet one in five young adults have not completed a Year 12 or a Certificate three vocational qualification. So I think it would be wrong to um, see, uh, as the member for Casey did, that this was our only response to the issue of uh, apprenticeship training and upgrading of skills and the school shortage. There will be a, a whole raft of complementary initiatives and programs that will be undertaken by the Rudd Labor government. But this is a very important area because the government's own estimates um, show Australia facing a shortage of more than 200,000 skilled workers over the next five years. That's a huge problem that we are contending with. Uh, it's a big challenge, made greater by the fact that, according to the AIG group, nearly 90 per cent of all available jobs now require a post-school qualification. But as we know, and I know in my own electorate, around half of our current uh, workforce lack these qualifications. So there's a great need to also upskill uh, the existing workforce uh, in higher levels of skill attainment. And these skill shortages, I know in my own region, span right across uh, our regional economy from unskilled work, uh, jobs through the managerial and professional occupations, but very importantly uh, in the skilled trades we have a major problem throughout Australia. And it's a problem that the government really, the former government really didn't comprehend in terms of the magnitude of the issue. And as the member for Gorton made very clear, the Reserve Bank had, um, had been warning of the consequences of skill shortages for more than a decade. And it continues to talk about the capacity constraints that the skill shortages uh, are creating in our economy and the interrelationship between capacity constraints and um, the uh, inflation genie being out of the bottle is one thing that is really of concern to us all. Um, the member for Casey um, resorted to the usual obfuscation that, um, that members of the Howard government did when they were on this side of the chamber. I, mean, I think he made reference to the record level of apprenticeships under the Howard government. Well, the fact is, of course, that uh, the Howard government and its ministers were very adept at obfuscating the issue of just what an apprenticeship was and combining uh, apprenticeships with traineeships to inflate the figures. Uh, in fact, I think our record under Labor prior to the Howard government stands up pretty well. Um, over, uh, the 11 years that the Howe government was in office, the average annual number of traditional trade apprenticeships um, was about 120,000. 
This compares to the 137,000 annual average traditional trade apprenticeships under the previous Labor government. So, in fact, we had a better record uh, than was occurring under the Howard government, and despite the fact that they were constantly berating the, the op then opposition uh, as being an opposition that really had uh, lost sight of the importance of traditional trades training and uh, the apprenticeship system. Well, the facts tell quite a different story, and I think um, it would be wise for uh, the member for Casey and the shadow minister to have a look at the record of the Howard government. Um, we also know that uh, when uh, the Howard government was first elected, there were substantial cuts to the TAFE and vocational system. They reduced um, Commonwealth investment by about 13 per cent in the three years uh, to, uh, to the year 2000. And after that, despite the huge unmet demand and thousands of people being turned away, um, the allocations increased by roughly about 1 per cent between 2000 and 2004. So I don't think the record is as the member for Casey has tried to portray this evening. Um, I, I said earlier that the member for Casey used the um, resort to obfuscation on the issue, um, and I can remember them saying that you know 544,000 people completed apprenticeships over the last four years of the Howard government. Well, the truth was some, somewhat quite different to that. Of the 142,000 apprenticeship completions in 2006, um, the apprenticeships, as they were determined by the government, including traineeships, less than half of those, or just 56,000, were in the traditional trades. So they have got away with a lot of obfuscation and a lot of inappropriate criticism being directed to the then opposition about our lack of regard for the area of uh, trade training and apprenticeships. And the member for Casey um, got up and made a virtue out of the Australian Technical Colleges. Well, really, when you look at the half a billion dollars spent on a standalone network of Australian technical colleges that at best will only produce 10,000 graduates by 2010, you have to wonder um, what the merits are in the duplication of services and the wasteful expenditure of taxpayer funds that we saw invested in these colleges. And when the member for Casey talked about the issue of scale, well, let me tell you, down in the Illawarra, the scale was very small. Um, I think, right? I think if this is, I hope I'm absolutely correct. I think the projected enrolment for the first year of our college was 50, and they didn't make that. And in 2008, the projected enrolment of 191 students just won't be met. And yet, the Rudd Labor government, in honouring the contracts that were entered into, we're about to spend up to 13.6 million in building a brand new building. Uh, for this small number of students, and I don't think uh, one can justify that at all. And I think the, um, how, uh, the, um, uh, the Howard government's belief that somehow these ATCs were the centrepiece of their uh, attempts to deal with the skills crisis ha has been found very wanting. So, in conclusion, I just want to say, in relation to this bill, um, that I'm very delighted that um, the minister has brought this bill to parliament very early in its sitting. It uh, establishes the urgency that we have um, in dealing with this huge problem, a problem that's been building up over the last decade, a problem that came as no surprise to anybody, a problem that was talked about by employer organisations, by uh, the ACT, by a whole raft of people, including the TAFE directors. We all saw it coming and the government's response was too little, too late. And uh, when the member for Casey be bemoans the fact that some of the programs that had been instituted are not, not going to continue into the future, I guess the reason for that would be that many of those ad hoc responses were not sufficient to deal with the endemic problem of skills shortages. So this new body, Skills Australia, will provide the Rudd government with high quality advice about current, emerging and future skill needs in Australia. It will have industry as its focus and we will try to identify um, priority skills and training needs. Um, the Skills Australia will also provide advice on the allocation of skill training places and uh, those training places will be allocated according to industry demand. So I think it is a great initiative. I commend the Minister for and the speedy way in which he has managed to bring this legislation 
to the parliament. It shows the urgency of the problem, the fact that we are really serious about it, and uh, we believe that this new authority will provide our government with strategic advice about current and future school needs so that our policy response and programs can do much more to address the gap between the demand for and the supply of skilled labour uh, and skilled workers, which were sadly neglected by the former Howard government. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. To this I call the honourable member for Riverina. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, look, I rise this evening to support this bill that's in front of the House. I think it makes sense. Anything that looks at enhancing and increasing opportunities for employers and, uh, and young people in rural and regional Australia, um, I, I welcome and I'm only hopeful and, and uh, optimistic that there will be an intention behind creating um, this uh, Skills Australia to, uh, to ensure that it is for all Australians, that it is governing for all Australians, including those in rural and regional areas. Now, I've spoken many times in support of measures by um, the previous government um, in alleviating the skill shortage, particularly that continues strongly in my electorate. And, uh, and I've made it my point to continue to point out um, when everyone was focused for nine years, when everyone was focused on university degrees, I was focused on a, uh, an apprenticeship and a trade and a certificate. And uh, I will not change that point of view simply because that is the majority of Australian opportunities. Um, as I've said before in this House many times, um, we can't all be chiefs. There has to be some Indians and it's, very, it's vitally important. That, um, that our young people in our electorates are given opportunities to live and work and um, enable them to own their own businesses within the electorate of Riverina as a result of having done an apprenticeship through um, some trade or form. Now, I have an ongoing issue with employers being able to, unable to find local skilled workers and uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult. More and more, of my employers are having to source skilled workers from overseas. They don't actually want to do that. They don't want to go into the expense of doing that. But in order to secure the employment that is currently with the local tradespeople and, and the local businesses, um, they really, in order to get their productivity gains up and to meet their forward contracts and their market, they do need to have more workers. So they are forced at this point in time, many of them, to go overseas and look for those skilled workers under the skilled migration program. So the establishment of Skills Australia, in my understanding from reading the bill, will enable the government to receive um, quality advice about the current and emerging and future skill needs of Australia. Now, that's a bit questionable because I'm not sure that, um, that anybody has ever been able to uh, forecast or anticipate um, what skills um, are going to be available and required. And particularly, I hark to uh, the intergenerational report that uh, the former treasurer, Peter Costello, um, was master of, and I look at that and see the the, the difficulties that school that the new body will have in forecasting and anticipating um, the, the the needs for the future. Um, today we talked about a lot about carers, and we talk a lot about um, um, you know the elderly people and aged care um, in in this house, and I'm very concerned for um, the disability sector because I wonder when you have such a small amount of people entering the workforce between 2020 and 2030, how on earth we're going to actually get the people with the skills and, um, and uh, the training to be able to care um, for um, the needs of the disabled and the elderly. So it is a very big issue and hopefully um, this, this Skills Australia will um, have the adequate expertise um, in, that, in that body in order to uh, project or to make provisions for the future. Now, I would urge the minister to ensure an adequate representation of rural and regional people, an adequate representation of a cross-section of rural and regional industry, 
because you know we we are every bit as entitled to have our views and and, and issues reflected um, when decisions are being made and these forecasts are happening. So, in supporting the bill, I would urge the minister to um, to ensure the makeup of this body um, includes adequate representation from rural and regional Australia. Now. It is my understanding that Skills Australia concept has received wide support from the industry, but again, I want to ensure that there is a strong rural and regional business effort or input at all level. And I'm not quite sure; it's not been clear as to the relationship that will um, be formed between Skills Australia and the National Industry Skills Committee, which I think is a a, uh, a, you know, is something that needs to have some very careful thought. Additional places, of course, must be met with incentives to encourage people to undertake training in areas of skill needs because supplying additional places just doesn't automatically ease the skill shortage. You actually have to put incentives into place in order that, uh, that businesses, operators and others will take, will take up um, um, the uh, opportunity. If you look at actions to date, there has been no activity um, from any Labor government, and I don't signal out this Labor government at all, but I talk about primarily New South Wales, the state that I hail from. There's been no real action to date on behalf of, uh, of the Labor government um, to, to ensure that, uh, that there is incentives put in place. In fact, I'm very concerned about the current Labor government in their first 100 days, and I have to be critical about this because it simply does affect um, the people that I represent. And, uh, and it's like I'm, I'm not standing here just to be critical of a government purely for the sake of being critical. I think I have grounds and basis to be critical about the cuts that have been made um, already. Um, and that is the incentive program for agriculture and horticultural trainees. Um, and I really think that to cut the apprenticeship incentives for agriculture and horticulture program, which was a $47.7 million assistance scheme designed to encourage workers back into our agriculture industries by providing $800 grants for toolkits and up to $1,000 to help with training fees, um, is, is really very, very sad and doesn't send a very good and clear signal as to the commitment and the understanding of the needs and issues of rural and regional youth um, who are looking to enter into the workforce. It's very important that we should be encouraging our young people to stay and work, and I try to encourage them to stay and work in the Riverina. And I've worked tirelessly with, C with Charles Sturt University, with Riverina TAFE, to give our kids opportunities in exciting career pathways. We now have veterinary science in Charles Sturt University. We have um, dentistry in Charles Sturt University. We have clinical sciences in Charles Sturt. We have pharmacy in Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga. And this, these are the sort of, of career options that many young people want to follow. So if you introduce them into a rural and regional university, you are more likely to get rural and re regional kids staying and working um, in regional areas. I've worked the same with TAFE, and we've got some fabulous joint programs um, and joint diplomas and joint degrees happening with Riverina TAFE and also um, with Charles Sturt University. So, to, to see this assistance scheme um, actually scrapped now was just very, very disappointing and, uh, we, in order that we can keep strengthening our regions. I'm concerned that the opposition doesn't really understand um, the needs of rural and regional areas um, and the support that rural apprentices opposition require. I'm sorry. I'm concerned that the Labor Party. I'm sorry that the uh, the government. You're dead right. I'm so used to it. Um, it takes a little bit of undoing. I'm concerned that the uh, the government doesn't understand the needs of rural apprentices um, through their and their needs for training. And I think that unless we do something really serious 
um, and continue with the incentive programs to ensure young people can remain in rural and regional Australia, then um, there will be a price to pay. And the price to pay will be for all Australians, because it is absolutely imperative that agriculture should be considered as one of the fundamental needs and requirements in, um, in, for the Australian people. So we have um, some significant issues that we need to confront, and I'm, as I said, I, I'd like to bring about um, some some statistics that I'm not quite sure where the member for Throsby got her statistics from, um, you know, with respect to the former government's approach to apprenticeships. But most certainly, um, in my electorate, in 2006, um, there was 3,750 apprenticeships in, the river, in training, full training and employed in the Riverina electorate. Not fudged figures not smokes and mirrors and cloaks and daggers to get those numbers. And when I, in March 1996, there was 1,420 apprentices, 1,420. Now that's well and truly over double in that period of time. And as a, person, a private enterprise and small business, or medium enterprise business myself, and as a, a prolific trainer of apprentices, I know, I know the difficulties that I had in the past years prior to the Howard government's election in getting any, any incentives or um, any recognition for training apprentices. It was simply all about university degrees. Those who wanted to do TAFE or those who wanted to do the admirable trades and service apprenticeship in any area were simply considered not worthy. And I raised it in this House against the government that I was part of in over, in, since 1998, since my election in 1998. And um, I, I was very concerned about the way in which parents were considered um, that they had been unsuccessful if their child wasn't doing a university degree. If you went out and you were at the barbecue at the, or the dinner table, the barbecue stopper was if you said somebody asked you what your child was studying in university and you happened to say, my son is um, a panel beating apprentice, that was the drop dead barbecue stopper. Let me tell you, you can't tell me that your son was, you know, has, has not gone on to university. The emphasis on parents and the peer pressure on parents to send children to university regardless of whether or not it was really their forte was quite strong. And you had a lot of young people in universities doing degrees that eventually ed to, led to no better employment prospects. And, yet, uh, and so we saw the decline of apprenticeships over that period of time. And it took some time before the former government picked up and run with this issue that they needed to address. And, uh, but thankfully they finally did, and I congratulate this government for continuing um, on in this pathway. Um, I am pointing out that I would hope that um, there is consideration, though, particularly for those rural and regional people who make up such a, a, um, a, a great part of the nation's prosperity and GDP. Now, um, I also am, I wanted to just raise the issue um, of um, the fact that we have had, uh, through the state government, we've had um, a Adrian Pickley, the member for Murrumbidgee, um, has issued a press release um, and stating that there will be an announcement of a trade school in Griffith. And I congratulate the New South Wales state government um, for putting a trade school in Griffith. Um, because I was always seeking a technical college um, in the Griffith area, because I think it's one of those areas that desperately, desperately require um, some sort of functional um, area where kids can uh, concentrate on a valuable trade um, to enter into. So I do congratulate the New South Wales State Government, and hopefully we'll see that school opened in 2009. And, uh, and Surely the construction of that facility um, will be on track. So I am in supporting the bill um, that we have here today. I say to the minister, um, well done for, for pursuing the skills that the Australian 
workers require. I say also well done. Um, I'm very proud. I, I don't stand here and accept criticism um, and lethargy um, uh, accusations at the, last, at the previous government because I think that our track record on vocational education and training genuinely speaks for itself. You can't fudge the truth. You can make percentages and things, and you can allege percentages and smoke and mirrors, but you simply cannot fudge the truth. The truth is there to be known, and, uh, and there is further growth that can take place um, with Skills Australia, I'm sure. All that I'm asking the minister to ensure is that the committee or the body under, that is, will be Skills Australia is, has an adequate representation from rural and regional Australia because uh, we are so certainly entitled to, um, to have um, access and support as well. So in, uh, in supporting the bill, um, I just urge and encourage the minister to um, ensure rural and regional Australians are um, included and that we do govern for all Australia. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. To this I call the honourable member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, the bill before the House establishes a vital element of Labor's skills strategy, Skills Australia. This will provide the Australian government with independent, high-quality advice to assist with better targeting of support for the workforce development needs of businesses and workers across the country. Skills Australia will be comprised of seven experts drawn from a range of backgrounds, including economics, industry, academia and training providers. The legislation establishes the operational arrangements to support the independent body, including provisions relating to conflict of interest issues, arrangements for the appointment and service of members, remuneration of members, procedures about conduct and arrangements for working groups to provide it with the capacity to investigate issues deeply, drawing on a wide range of stakeholders. This, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, is sorely needed legislation. We now have a skills crisis of massive proportions. In vocational education and training, on the former government's own estimates, Australia faces a shortage of more than 200,000 skilled workers. 200,000 skilled workers over the next five years. By the year 2016, that will be 240,000 skilled workers. Now, this skills crisis has been building for a decade. Indeed, the Reserve Bank warned the previous government as far back as 1997 that a skills shortage was one of the capacity constraints in our economy adversely affecting our economic growth. The previous government ignored the warnings. They simply weren't interested. Indeed, they attacked the TAFE system. They slashed funding to TAFE, which is the largest single provider of training in Australia. Back in 1997, they reduced the Commonwealth investment in TAFE by 6.6 per cent for the following three years to 2000. This had damaging flow-on consequences for TAFE, including that TAFE has not been able to adequately meet the demand for training. Indeed, over the life of the previous government, more than 325,000 people, 325, people were turned away from the TAFE system. Now, I want to make a couple of remarks about the importance of, of TAFE to underscore what a debacle this was. In 2005, there were 1.64 million students in the vocational education and training system in Australia, more than one in four persons aged between 15 and 19, indeed more than 10 per cent of all working age Australians. Of those, 1.26 million, that's to say 77 per cent, studied in TAFE. Since 1997, enrolments in the vocational education and training area have grown by over 13 per cent, and in 2005, TAFE provided 304 million annual student hours of vocational education and training. Now, clearly, from these figures, TAFE is a vital public asset which is the engine and heart of the whole vocational education and training system. TAFE plays complex and multifaceted roles 
in the development of Australia's educational skills and skills base, in strengthening industry, in the achievement of broader government objectives and in the social cohesiveness of communities, particularly in regional areas. During the Liberal years, in real terms, vocational education and training funding decreased, especially in relation to the growth in the system. Commonwealth government funding to TAFE declined by 24 per cent between 1997 and 2004. Now, at the same time, you had the introduction of Australian technical colleges. Uh, they were introduced at a cost of $343 million over five years to the Australian taxpayer, which was in the process of rising to more than $580 million in uh, real funding, with further electoral promises made in 2007. Now, the previous government promised that these technical colleges would address the skills shortages and provide vocational education and training to young people, which the former Prime Minister claimed was otherwise not available. Now, this was simply not true. This is exactly the role which TAFE carries out. And the previous government's hostility towards TAFE was very damaging to this nation's best interests. Uh, the technical colleges which simply duplicate the TAFE system. They were set up as a private provider in competition to the public system, the TAFE system, which has been literally starved of growth funding by the Howard government. And indeed, the Senate Estimates Committee found uh, the ATCs to be an outrageously expensive way to train apprentices compared to the TAFE system. The bottom line is that TAFE is and must be a major player in addressing skills shortages. A serious funding shortfall has shown itself in the form of higher class sizes, reductions in TAFE courses and cuts to student services. There has been a high level of unmet demand for vocational education and training courses at a time when we need those potential qualified and skilled people in the Australian workforce. In my state of Victoria, the TAFE teaching workforce has an average age of 53 years. There are serious skills shortages in the TAFE teaching profession where there is a need to attract, recruit and retain expert industry professionals into the profession. There is clearly a need to address professional development in this teaching workforce as a priority. We need qualified plumbers, accountants and the like in TAFE and we need them to have teaching qualifications to address literacy and numeracy difficulties in the general population. I do want to make mention of the particular problem uh, which concerns casual employment in TAFE. And I thank uh, Gillian Robertson and Rob Stewart from the Victorian branch of the Australian Education Union for the information that they have provided to me and no doubt to others on this issue. A 2002 study estimated that more than 50 per cent of TAFE teachers in Australia were casually employed, with a figure as high as 70 per cent in some states. Now, casually employed teachers are often only paid for the hours that they teach, and so they're not able to cover a great deal of the other work as they're, that their teaching generates, such as administration, managing student issues, student counselling and so on. This casual employment undermines quality. Uh, they often work large amounts of unpaid time to manage the workload generated by their teaching. They're neither funded nor encouraged to participate in the professional life of their TAFE. They're most often not encouraged or funded to participate in their own professional development. Many casually employed teachers in TAFE report unmanageable levels of travel as they attempt to cobble together enough work to survive. Now, it is under underfunding which forces TAFE employers to use casual employment. Indeed, many TAFE employers acknowledge the unacceptably high levels of casual employment and point to government underfunding as the cause. This effectively means that TAFE teachers, whether casually or securely employed, are carrying the burden of underfunding. Indeed, casual employment acts as a disincentive for experienced industry teachers coming into TAFE. Most industries report that poor working conditions and low salaries are a disincentive for those working in industry to take up, take up TAFE teaching. Indeed, in trades areas particularly, people nominate the inability to get secure employment 
as a major reason for not pursuing uh, teaching in TAFE as a profession. These are very serious issues and problems, uh, and I hope that this government is able progressively over time to address these very important issues. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, over the years I've taken uh, a big interest in unemployment because of its impact on the community that I represent, and uh, I've come to the conclusion that unemployment nowadays is all about education and skills. If you've got the education, if you've got the skills, then you'll get a job. But if you haven't, best of luck. So I think it is regrettable that the path we've gone down as a nation is to import skilled migrants to meet our skills needs rather than putting a decent investment into our own young people in the form of skills and education. If you look at tertiary, I've talked about what's happened in TAFE. We've seen the same thing in tertiary education with undergraduate, domestic undergraduate commencements essentially flatlining during the area of the previous government. Uh, at the same time, we had undergraduate commencements by overseas students uh, dramatically increasing uh, from a government which preferred overseas students because they paid full fees. But on the other hand, cutbacks in federal government support for the universities, cutbacks in federal government support for TAFE, and therefore a move to import our need for skilled labour, essentially outsourcing our demand for skills and training. This has led to a growing addiction to skilled migration, which is indeed up from 24,000 back in 1996 to over 100,000 now, so it's quadrupled. Uh, I think this is a short-sighted approach. Uh, I think that the answer lies in training young Australians in providing proper educational and training opportunities. I commend the government for introducing this bill and for its attention to skills issues, and I commend this bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Werriwa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as a parent, I've got to say there's probably little more important uh, than your, your child's future, and it's often been said in this place that uh, uh, that education uh, really is the key for our economic future, but also it's the key for our kids' future. Um, and clearly, uh, this is. Uh, this is something very important to, to us all. Matter of fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that's probably the single motivating force for why members would uh, be in this place representing their electorates, or at least I would have hoped so. Um, we clearly acknowledge that uh, there's nothing more important than the future growth of our economy, and uh, and to do that, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the things that we must do is ensure there's adequate supply of skilled labour. Um, the Skills Australia Bill 2008 is a tangible response to this need to provide this country with a supply of skilled labour. Uh, it's the first response, Mr Deputy Speaker, in 11 years to address the economic constraints imposed uh, on our uh, productivity, uh, which is caused by a, a distinct lack in a supply of skilled labour at present. Um, this, uh, this bill before the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, is part of Labor's uh, five-point plan in addressing uh, those inflationary pressures on, on our economy as we see it presently. And one of those major things at the moment is the uh, economic restraint supply uh, imposed by the, uh, uh, by the, the limit of skilled labour available. Now, I, I've actually seen this up close and, and personal, if you like, Mr Deputy Speaker, having had two sons which are both tradesmen. Now, one, one of my boys, Mr Deputy Speaker, works in the construction industry and the other works in the mining industry. Look, uh, having uh, someone work in the mining industry over recent time, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know uh, the actual effect of the skill shortage there. Now, just uh, without putting too fine a point on it, Mr Deputy Speaker, the money that's been pl uh, applied in that industry is it's certainly very big. Um, it uh, certainly attracts a lot of young people. Uh, my son obviously comes from the outer metropolitan areas of Sydney, but working in, the, in very close to your electorate, Mr. I might add, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Blackwater, he works side by side with a lot of young fellows uh, out, of, uh, out of Melbourne, out of Launceston, out of Hobart, out of every other uh, 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 mainland city. Now, he works here as an electrician. And the reason uh, why it is uh, very, 
the, the schools that are in, in short supply in other areas uh, in, our, uh, in our economy, particularly in the, the skilled trade areas, because there's so many young people now working uh, in the mines. Now, what's occurring there, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, the mining companies can afford to pay the money, but uh, if you're uh, uh, living in out, out of metropolitan areas of Sydney, or indeed any other areas, and I imagine Emerald's no, uh, no different, Mr Deputy Speaker, to try and get a PowerPoint fixed or try and get uh, tr uh, essential trade work done is, is very, becomes a very, very difficult exercise. Now, the reason why all this came about, Mr Deputy Speaker, was because some 11 years ago, with the election of the Howard government, it saw fit to wind back a commitment to uh, trade-based training. It saw fit to wind back by about 6.5 per cent or 6.6 per cent a reduction in Commonwealth investment in TAFE. What we saw, Mr Deputy Speaker, over that period since 1997 is some 325 people, young people turn away from TAFE. These were the young people who would have been our tradesmen, who would have been our electricians and our carpenters for the future, who never got their start. And this is the same government at that stage when they were winding back their investment in those areas, Mr Deputy Speaker, saw fit to, to uh, abolish the Australian National uh, uh, Training Authority because they thought industry will take care of all that. We don't have to worry about that. They'll do that themselves. Lo and behold, Mr Deputy Speaker, that was just a failed judgment on the part of the uh, Howard government because, quite frankly, uh, what we now see now is a direct product of years of neglect uh, uh, in respect to the attention of uh, our skilled labour in this country. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is not simply the member for Werriwa standing here uh, and now saying it. Uh, this is something that's been put to the Howard government at the time uh, since 1997. It was put to them by the Reserve Bank of all people, who indicated the need, uh, the economic need, for government to address the mounting skill shortage uh, as it uh, was being observed throughout the economy. It was put no less than 20 times, Mr Deputy Speaker, over a decade that government need to actually act and do something about uh, looking at the deplorable state of, uh, of uh, skills development within the Australian economy. And as a consequence, as the member for uh, Wills correctly pointed out, as a consequence, Mr Deputy Speaker, it left industry with no alternative but pursuing short-term uh, fixes to the skills problem by relying on uh, 457 visas, the temporary import importation of labour in this country, to do the work that should have been performed by uh, Australian labour. Mr Deputy Speaker, that should stand as a... Uh, it should not stand as a, a something we should take credit. Of. It should actually demonstrate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, we can't take a, a short-term fix, as the Howard government would have it in those days, to look at uh, an issue of uh, um, financial debt by, by deciding to ca uh, cut off funds to the what can actually generate job growth and uh, economic growth uh, within the country, and that's precisely what occurred. So, but uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, what was probably more disturbing, apart from the, the 20 warnings that were given by the Reserve Bank, apart from um, uh, abolishing uh, the Australian National Training Authority, but what was more disturbing, Mr Deputy Speaker, was the, the comments by the then uh, uh, Minister for Vocational and Further Education, Mr Andrew Robb, when he, when he admitted, quite frankly, uh, at an industry forum, what he said was this, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've got a problem with skill shortages. Uh, I mean that we, uh, we, we knew it was coming, but has arrived with force, and now it's, uh, it's going to get worse. That's not bad commentary from a minister who's responsible for skill development. Mr Deputy Speaker, he could hardly claim to be prophetic. Uh, of course they knew there was a problem. There was uh, 20 warnings to suggest that from, uh, from the Reserve Bank. And, uh, and uh, he was right in one respect. It is going to get worse unless it's going to be addressed. And that's what this bill is designed to do, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is a, uh, a tangible response um, uh, to, uh, to addressing the skill shortage. It is the first response in 11 years, uh, but it's, it's certainly one which actually uh, addresses, uh, first and foremost, vocational education. It, is, it has regard to, for instance, uh, what the ACCI and Sir George Bank 
in their annual surveys been saying over the last three years. The prime uh, economic uh, uh, constraint in the economy at the moment has been the school shortage. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this bill uh, will, will uh, establish um, uh, the uh, Independent uh, uh, Skills Australia. It will be responsible for providing advice uh, to the government, uh, advice on the needs of, uh, of uh, schools as, and, de and skills development. It will work uh, very closely with the industry. As a matter of fact, uh, it will be as an independent statutory organisation. It will consist of a range of members, seven members in fact, from, uh, drawn from all backgrounds, including uh, economic industry, uh, academia and training providers. It will actually take a very focused view on the provision of skills in this country. It will look at not what's required, simply it's here and now. It will address, Mr Deputy Speaker, what is going to be uh, required in our projected uh, economic growth into the future. It will do, Mr Deputy Speaker, what the Howard government failed to do, is to plan ahead. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this, this organisation uh, will be the key organisation to provide advice on the allocation of 450,000 skilled training places uh, over the period of 2007 to 2011. These are crucial established uh, training positions, Mr Deputy Speaker, if we are serious about addressing uh, the economic uh, constraints in our economy as it stands presently. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Rudd Labor government is committed to tackling the skills shortage and tackling it head on. Uh, we understand the urgent need to increase the supply of skills uh, of our workers. Uh, we will ensure that investment is targeted where it is really needed and we will ensure that the results of this achievement is made in line with the, uh, with the, the current demands of industry uh, and also with the, projected, uh, uh, with the projected position of industry over the next decades ahead. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a far-reaching uh, bill in terms of what it seeks to establish. This will be uh, as visionary as when the Australian National Training Authority was first introduced under the Hawke administration. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, will uh, seriously address um, the, uh, not only the skill shortages in this country, this will actually be uh, laying down the foundations to give skill development a real future in Australia. The question is that this will be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Canberra. Uh, thank you very much, Mr uh, Acting Deputy Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to speak to the Skills Australia Bill of 2008. This bill represents the first instalment of Labor delivering on its election commitments to address the skills crisis that is restricting our economic growth and fuelling inflation. Delivering on another election commitment, this bill will allow for the establishment of Skills Australia. Skills Australia will be a statutory body and will provide independent expert advice relating to the nation's workforce skills and development needs. It will be steered by a chair and six other members drawn from industry, economics, academia and educational backgrounds. Skills Australia will advise the minister directly. The bill outlines the constitution and membership of Skills Australia, including the chair and six other members to be appointed by the minister. Skills Australia will present to the minister an annual report, which the minister will table in this place. The creation of Skills Australia represents a significant shift in skills and training planning in this country. Gone are the days of the Howard government, narrow and failed voucher system which was driven by the supply of labour. Skills Australia will make sure that Australian government policies to address the skills shortage are driven by the real and emerging demands of industry. Of course, we need to ask ourselves, how do we get to this point? where skill shortages are one of the biggest impediments to economic growth through gains in productivity. Addressing the skills crisis is a top priority for the Rudd Labor government, unlike those opposite who chose to ignore those 20 warnings from the Reserve Bank over those past years that skill shortages were limiting economic growth and driving up inflation and therefore interest rates. Those opposite reduced funding for the TAFE system denying more than 300,000 Australians the chance to gain further vocational education and training during the life of the previous government. I know I don't have to look too far myself to see the impact the skill shortages are having on our economy. I just need to look at my own electorate of Canberra and the ACT more generally. In the ACT, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, 
currently at 2.1 per cent, and we have the highest number of job advertisements proportionate to the workforce of anywhere in Australia. We have the nation's highest workforce participation rate at almost 73 per cent, and here in the ACT we actually have far more jobs advertised than there are people unemployed. Whilst this is a great position in one sense for the ACT economy, it highlights the impacts that those skill shortages are having on local businesses. As I talk to employers in my electorate, they constantly state that the skill shortage is their biggest impediment to growing their business. As the Howard government sat on their hands, state and territory governments have been quite active in taking steps to identify skill shortages and ways to fix them. Here in the ACT, the ACT Labor government has established the ACT Skills Commission, which released its interim report in October of last year. And I congratulate the ACT Stanhope government for taking this significant step and getting on with the job of trying to attack the uh, skill shortages in our community. I note that the interim report has been well received here in Canberra by business groups, unions, training providers and the broader uh, community. The interim report of the ACT Schools Commission has been released, and I commend the Canberra Business Council and its CEO, Chris Peters, for his organisation's positive contribution and his leadership through the business com community to addressing the impacts of the skills shortage here in the ACT. Of course, the skills crisis is a national problem, and it requires national leadership from the federal government and, ultimately, a national solution. Establishing Skills Australia is an important first step in tackling those skills shortages. The Rudd Labor government will be funding the creation of an additional 450,000 training places over the next four years. Unlike those opposite, we on this side of the House recognise that we can't afford to sit back and allow this lack of, atten of attention to continue. No, we believe in swift, swift action to address this skills crisis which is why we will have an additional 20,000 training places available from April this year. Now, that is a real immediate change. From next month, an additional 20,000 Australians will be able to access vocational training. These places will be directed at those people who are currently outside the workforce. This will mean another 20,000 people with newly attained skills can enter the workforce on completion of their training. This will make a huge difference to employers around the country and in my own town of Canberra. We will also be supporting 65,000 apprenticeships over the next four years. Now, Mr De Acting Deputy Speaker, I have in my hand here the skills in demand list for the ACT provided by the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. It makes for some fascinating reading and clearly shows the breadth of the skills crisis in my community. In the ACT, we have critical shortages in all engineering trades, all automotive, automotive trades, all electrical and electronics trades, all food trades and almost all construction trades, bar one, stonemasons. We also have serious shortages in professions and in information and communication technology centre sectors. This means that vacancies cannot be filled for occupations such as architects, metal machinists, locksmiths, welders, sheet metal workers, motor mechanics, panel beaters, spray painters, electricians, refrigeration and air conditioning mechanics, computer programmers and other IT specialists, roof tilers and even brickies, through to butcher, baker and cabinet maker. The list goes on and on. It really makes one wonder how on earth a government of 12 years could allow this situation to develop. It's only with real, direct and timely action that we can begin to address the skills crisis left unaddressed by, for so long by this former government. I'm very pleased to be part of a government that is taking swift action, definitive action, on this critical issue. The establishment of Skills Australia is the start. It will lay found the foundation for continued positive action from the Rudd Labor government to address the skills crisis. And I'm looking forward to both the establishment of Skills Australia and a turnaround in this deplorable state of affairs led by the previous government. The question is, this bill will be now read a second time. I call the Parliamentary Secretary for Disability, Disabilities and Children's Services. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to start with what we all agree. And I think that every inaugural speech from both sides of politics has extolled the virtues of education and skills, and they're all correct. 
Learning has real power. The acquisition of skills, be it a certificate three or a four-year apprenticeship, can have the power to change a life, to transform and diffuse technology and to assist the rise and rise of consumer wealth. For all of us here who love education, the influence of skills is not news. Imagination, innovation and entrepreneurship flow from a fertile and well-trained mind. But an educated, skilled nation cannot simply wake up to find itself highly skilled. Knowledge is a process of accumulation, not instant genius. And our nation and our people more than ever need the persistent and consistent promotion of skills. The notion of one job and one organisation for life is no longer relevant to the fluid and transient 21st century. The requirement for labour skills and talents will rise and change with market trends. Jobs once thought safe will evaporate. In our new century, our workers must be able to rapidly adapt to a changing work environment and have to be supported in their need to train and retrain and to be students and apprentices again to acquire multiple skills for multiple careers. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think one of the real capacity constraints facing our nation is, an under, is the underdeveloped talent of our workers. Australians have innate talent, there can be no doubt about this, but they need leadership and they need skills training to develop their abilities. One of the most important things that we can do in this place is to help build an individual skills, giving them not, not only what they need to have a satisfying working life across many careers, but giving them the wherewithal to contribute to our society and our community to their full potential. Corporations, governments, indeed nations who support and build workers' skills will in turn build their own competitive edge, ensuring their future success in the global marketplace. Yet one of the major failures of the Howard government was its cavalier leave-it-alone attitude towards the future prosperity evidenced by their neglect of skills formation in Australia. Australia has not trained enough new or existing workers to keep up with the demands on our economy and indeed our workforce. There's an unprecedented demand for our resources across the world. Mineral and energy resource prices are at all-time highs. Our iron and steel and alumina and aluminium exports are contributing to building and shaping the future of the world. But the previous government has sorely neglected the need to remain globally competitive and, that, and the sustainability of our prosperity. Twenty times in the last three years, the Reserve Bank warned that capacity constraints, including skill shortages, were driving up inflation. Indeed, the Minerals Council estimated that projects in excess of $100 billion were under threat from capacity constraints, including lack of skills training. Substantial growth opportunities, particularly in regional and remote parts of Australia, may be lost. It has been left to Labor to restore the legacy left by the previous government. Skills Australia is a key plank in the government's five-point plan to fight inflation and to secure higher living standards for all Australians. Labor recognises that our economy is constrained by limits to its capacity to sustain higher growth without inflation, in a large part because of a lack of skilled workers. The minister outlined in her second reading speech the depth of these skill shortages, in particular in the mining and construction sectors. Whilst in the last five years there were 54,000 new jobs created in mining, there has been a five-fold increase in vacancies in this sector, and we see delay and mothballing and increasing costs of many projects. And indeed, by 2015, there will be a requirement for another 70,000 people in the resources sector. This is work that Labor needs to solve. In my own electorate of Maribyrnong, over 7,000 people work in manufacturing. That's the single largest industry employing constituents in my electorate. Policies which invest in the skills of the people of Maribyrnong will also in turn secure a competitive future for manufacturing. Policies are particularly relevant in my electorate about skills training because there are more technicians and trade workers, machinery operators and drivers than any other collective group of occupations in the seat. Investment in skills creation is fundamental to the next wave of economic reform. As the minister indicated in her second reading speech, Skills Australia is the first step of many that this government will take as part of a comprehensive approach to secure a prosperous future which maximises workforce participation and productivity. Having people outside of the workforce is a waste of the national economic potential. International research shows that without substantial and significant upskilling in the workforce, our relative skill level will be lower than our international competitors in the future, affecting our future performance economically. The Productivity Commission revealed that the surge of productivity growth in the 1990s was by far the major factor behind average income acceleration in that period. And indeed, much of the high productivity growth through skills development and high performing industries in the 90s was passed on to the consumers in the form of lower prices at the time. 
The legislation establishing Skills Australia sets out the objectives of the new statutory body, which are to provide for expert and independent advice in relation to Australia's workforce skills and development needs. What this will do is target what the government is doing in line with what industry is demanding. Industry demand and the analysis of the workforce skills needs across industry will be at the heart of the skills training program. I'm also pleased that Skills Australia holds the promise of developing and maintaining relationships with the states and territories and with the relevant authorities there and others interested in workforce development across all of our workforce. Labor's focus on new training places, the extra 450,000 training places over the next four years, and with many of these training places leading to higher level qualification, such as Certificate 3 level or above, will enhance the quantity, the quality and the depth of the skills for our workforce for years to come. The consultative and cooperative approach adopted by this bill and the Skilling Australia for the Future policy shows a government's commitment to working constructively to align skills development policies and training with industry priorities. I applaud this support for up to 65,000 apprenticeships over the next four years under the Skilling Australia for the Future policy. Apprentices play a crucial role in building Australia's skills base. And acquiring new skills will help lift the participation rate and lower the unemployment rate for 15 to 19 year olds in particular. After all, people with higher qualifications have higher rates of participation and employment, and their working lives tend to extend longer than those without qualifications. But this Skilling Australia pro proposition is also vital to lifting those outside the social and economic mainstream into employment. Under the Howard government, the Australian training system insufficiently helped those who are outside the workforce re-enter it. Australia's record on training those without employment is in fact poor. Under the previous government, Australia spent 0.04 per cent of its gross domestic product on training those who weren't employed. We were the fifth lowest in the OECD, a shameful result. There's an estimated 526,000 15 to 24-year-olds not engaged in full-time work and study. Skilling Australia provides the opportunity to potentially rescue a lost generation to ensure much more engagement in the workforce. Plus, there's another 544,000 people who are underemployed in Australia who, with greater access to skills training, will be able to participate more fully and satisfactorily in the Australian workforce. Enhanced vocational training is critical to delivering a genuine full employment economy where existing jo workers' jobs are secure and where those outside the workforce have the wherewithal to participate more fully. That's why I'm particularly pleased at Labor's commitment to allocate more than a third of the additional new training places to people currently outside or marginally attached to the workforce to equip them with the skills that they need to gain employment. And indeed, the remaining places will be targeted at training people who are currently employed, who are currently employed but need to upgrade their skills. In my capacity as Parliamentary Secretary for Disabilities, I've become acutely aware of the impediments to entry or re-entry to the workforce for people with a disability or mental illness. Rudd Labor certainly recognises the merits of certified training in assisting people on income support payments to acquire skills and gain lasting employment. Our government understands that those with a disability or mental illness should be given the vocational and employment opportunities that they deserve to gain and retain work. As I said in my first speech to this House, it will, not do, it, will not, it will do this not so people with disability receive special treatment, but so they receive the same treatment as everybody else, the rights which are theirs with the dignity that they deserve. The government's commitments under the Skilling Australia of the Future and other policies, such as Labor's national strategy for mental health and disability employment, being chaired by the Minister for Employment, Participation and myself, will contribute to the government's social inclusion and gender. This legislation enhances the lives of people in many ways which we can only begin to appreciate. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe that the Rudd Labor government understands that Australia will be what it knows. And I congratulate the minister on this bill and commend it to the House. The question is that this bill be read a second time. I call the well, the Honourable Member for Cornwall. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, tonight I rise to speak on the Skills Australia Bill 2008 that's currently before the House. This bill highlights the determination of the Rudd government to tackle Australia's worsening skills crisis, a crisis that has been compounded by a decade of inaction under the previous government and one that has significant economic and social implications in limiting Australia's ability to meet its future challenges. 
The purpose of Skills Australia Bill 2008 is to establish an independent statutory body, Skills Australia, whose role will be to provide the government with high quality advice about the current, emerging and future skills needs of Australia. The establishment of Skills Australia is an important part of this government's commitment to safeguard Australia's long-term prosperity. This includes making sure that the right conditions are in place to guarantee Australia's continued economic development. And among other things, this depends heavily on our capacity as a nation to produce a skilled workforce and to lift Australia's flagging productivity rate. It also requires a more sustained focus on social inclusion, a term which describes a society where all Australians have an opportunity to participate fully and meaningfully in the workforce and in community life. The establishment of Skills Australia will help to identify specific skill shortages in our economy. It will also help identify and plan for the relevant pathways to address these shortages. Comprised of seven members drawn from a range of backgrounds, including economics, industry, academia and training providers, its mandate will be to match more closely the range of skills training available in Australia with the needs of our changing economy, especially when it comes to those areas where skill shortages are most acute. Skills Australia will help industry and business plan for a future where people with the necessary skills and training will be available to take them forward. It will help us inform young people of job market openings and optimum training options. It will help us advise existing work workforce participants who are looking to retrain or take advantage of new pathways or indeed return to the workforce following redundancy or other interruptions to their working lives. And it will help schools, universities and TAFE colleges tailor the courses they offer to suit the needs of both students and local employers. We know that Australia faces a shortage of more than 200,000 skilled workers over the next five years. Within eight years, that figure is likely to reach 240,000. The need to combat Australia's skills crisis has never been so immediate or as pressing as it is now, Mr Deputy Speaker. This crisis has been building for a decade but the previous government simply ignored all the warnings. The net result is that today's skill shortages have already started to hold this country back. The situation was made worse by the Howard government's decision to slash funding to the, to the TAFE sector, the largest single provider of training in Australia, and the abject failure of its Australian Technical Colleges program. More than 325,000 people were turned away from the TAFE system during the years of the previous government. Skills Australia will provide important information to this government, which is committed to turning the situation around as quickly as possible. The commitment to matching up the demand for skills and training with an increased skills capacity in the workforce will benefit the whole nation, but it will particularly, Mr Deputy Speaker, be important for the people and industries in my electorate of Corwell. Currently, large numbers of the people I represent in Corwell depend on the manufacturing industry for their jobs and well-being. Indeed, statistics for the northern region of metropolitan Melbourne, of which Corwell is a part, show that employment in manufacturing accounts for over 60,000 jobs. Many of our local industries, however, face an uncertain future. A number have closed altogether. Others have drastically reduced in size and made long-serving workers redundant. Others are busy restructuring and downsizing in a desperate bid to stay viable. We have many experienced and well-trained workers who face employment uncertainty, while we have an economy limited by a lack of people with the necessary skills for the future. We have an obligation, Mr Deputy Speaker, to avoid the terrible waste of such a situation. A complete lack of interest at the national government level in local manufacturing over the last decade in procurement policies which favour homegrown manufacturing, in nurturing innovation or actively encouraging research and development has left local industry exposed to the onslaught of global com competition with little to defend itself. Australian manufacturing has a proud tradition. We can't compete with low-wage countries when it comes to old-style mass production. Where Australia's future lies is with high technology creation and innovation. We need to utilise the brains and creativity of our community, and that's where skills development and training become crucial, Mr Deputy Speaker. We can compete internationally by investing in skills and training, by looking to new products and new markets and new methods of production. And to do this, we need specialised skills, we need targeted training, and we need creative minds and forward thinkers. One such innovation that the Rudd government will nurture is the development of green cars. Automotive manufacturers in Corwell will benefit from a $500 million green car innovation fund. 
This measure will help generate $2 billion in investment to secure jobs and tackle climate change by manufacturing low emission vehicles in Australia. Corval has a number of companies in the automotive sector. If we can match existing industry and existing skills with a properly targeted program for skills development and readiness to meet the growing demand for environmentally sustainable transport, we will achieve a great deal for the future of our local and national economy as well as our, as well as our, our air quality. It is precisely this sort of integrated policy development that we need in the 21st century. In Cornwall, we also need housing and infrastructure and a range of human services, all areas which suffer from the crisis and skill shortages. And yet we have higher than average unemployment, underemployment and not enough training places for people who want them. Here is a typical picture of mismatch between supply and demand, between willingness to participate and the opportunity to do so. Most importantly, Mr Deputy Speaker, Corwell's manufacturing history means that we have a plentiful supply of the most valuable asset a healthy economy needs, namely our people. The people of Corwell, like so many other multicultural urban communities of working people around Australia, are resourceful, hardworking, resilient and very adaptable. We have a diverse community with an enormous range of existing skills and great potential for the acquisition of more skills. We speak a wide range of languages, surely one of the most overlooked skills in this country, especially in an increasingly globalised economy. We have a wonderful TAFE college, the Kangan Batman TAFE, which is giving its students excellent training and support to enter the workforce as well as practical experience in the workplace. We have, we have Victoria University's Sunbury campus serving tertiary students in that community and beyond. And our local schools in Cornwall are producing some wonderfully bright, enthusiastic, ambitious and dynamic young people. In fact, I recently hosted a reception for the highest achieving VC students of 2007 in my electorate. Looking around at the kids in the room that day, I felt proud that in this part of the world we're producing Australia's future leaders, thinkers and creators. A number of schools in my electorate have introduced some very innovative programs to give their students every possible chance of going out into the world with the intellectual tools to engage with technology, inquiry, knowledge and problem solving. The Rudd uh, government is committed to encouraging such programs and to boosting the federal government's investment in education. The work of Skills Australia in identifying short and longer term needs in the economy is just one component in the overall plan to reskill Australia. Investing in Australian schools to ensure that today's students are able to successfully tackle the challenges of a rapidly changing workforce is another complementary component. Providing our children with a world-class education system is crucial not only to their future successes but also to Australia's ability to compete globally. The National Secondary School Computer Fund is one such component of the government's plan to meet this challenge head on enabling schools to provide their students with new or upgraded information and communication technology, as well as improved access to high-speed broadband internet, is central to ensuring that students develop computer literacy, greater independence in learning and problem solving, and fam familiarity with up-to-date technology. These skills will form an important foundation for students who, mo who move on to more specialised education, training and work. Trades training centres are another important initiative that this government is introducing. In 2001, the Northern uh, Melbourne Area Consultative Committee initiated research to identify the causes of skill shortages in Northern Melbourne. One of the major findings of this research was that most schools were aiming to prepare students for university education, but were failing to adequately cater for those students who were not considering a university pathway. These students were not receiving information or exposure to opportunities in trades, training areas aligned with regional industry needs, such as manufacturing, engineering, furnishing, construction and the automotive sector. This lack of information was compounded by negative perceptions about the nature of jobs available in these industries. For instance, many students and their parents still saw trades jobs as menial dirty and often dangerous, despite the enormous changes in computer and other technology, safety and career prospects in so many of the trades. The new trades training centre supported by this government, in partnership with the states, will have a major impact in reducing skill shortages across Australia. In Cornwall, this policy provides us with a unique opportunity to establish a number of trades training centres in strategic locations across the electorate and to align these centres with the skills base sought by regional industries in areas like manufacturing, engineering, construction and the automotive sector.
By building stronger partnerships between local industry and local education providers, a core aim must be to make sure that these training centres are relevant to the local context so that students in Cornwall who do not opt for university have the sort of skills and training that local employers are looking for. This is one way to ensure the long-term viability and success of trades training centres. It also means providing strong employment opportunities and a seamless transition to apprenticeships for local school leavers, whilst at the same time making sure that local industry has access to the skills they need to grow. I congratulate the Minister for introducing this important bill to the House, and I commend this bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Put the question of the, the Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank everybody who spoke on the Skills Australia Bill 2008 uh, and spoke in the course of this debate. Obviously, whilst I don't agree necessarily with every comment made by every member of the House during the course of the debate, I thank all members for their input. And I think the large number of speakers from the government side show just how seriously the Rudd Labor government takes the skills agenda. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Skills Australia Bill 2008 will establish Skills Australia, a statutory body that will provide the Australian government with independent high-quality advice to assist us in targeting government investment in training. It will give the Australian government advice that we can use to assist businesses and workers across the country. Skills Australia is a key plank in the Australian government's five-point plan to fight inflation. This is a plan that addresses both the demand side and supply side pressures on inflation. Establishing Skills Australia is the first of many steps this government will take as part of a comprehensive approach to overcoming the challenges our nation faces in securing a prosperous, productive future for Australian working families. Skills Australia will provide advice on the causal factors and impact of future and persistent skill shortages. Skills Australia will be comprised of experts drawn from a range of backgrounds, including economics, industry, academia and education and training provision. It represents an intellectual as well as a financial investment in the skills agenda. Skills Australia will play a pivotal role in boosting productivity and participation in the economy by providing high-quality advice to the government. This will ensure that policies can be directed towards closing the skills gap the gap between demand for and supply of skilled workers. Our Skilling Australia for the Future policy will increase and deepen the skills capacity of the Australian workforce and ensure demand for skills and training is better matched to training opportunities. The Australian government's plan for our future skilled workforce will help close the skills gap in the Australian economy in three ways. First, we will fund an additional 450,000 training places over the next four years. The government will take the advice of the Reserve Bank of Australia, the advice ignored by the former government, and we will act seriously and with urgency to make 20,000 of these new training places available from April 2008. These initial places will be directed to those outside the workforce and will help many Australians gain employment and stimulate workforce participation rates. Secondly, we will ensure that most of the 450,000 places lead to a higher level qualification, such as at Certificate 3 level or above. Thirdly, and most importantly, we are placing industry demand at the heart of the skills training system. The Australian government will align skills development policies and training delivery with industry priorities and position the training system to better meet the needs of individuals and in industry. New training places under the Skilling Australia for the Future policy will be therefore allocated according to industry demand. Mr Speaker, these measures, combined with other initiatives being progressively announced and implemented by the Australian government, represent a significant investment in addressing skill shortages, reducing inflation and securing a prosperous future for all Australians. I commend the bill to the House. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to establish Skills Australia and for related purposes. 
Order is leave granted for the third reading to be moved immediately. There being no objection, leave is granted. The Deputy Prime Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to establish Skills Australia and for related purposes. The Deputy Prime Minister. Um, I move that the House do now adjourn. Order. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The member for Hindmarsh. Uh, I understand the opposition. The member for here. Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to look at this parliament on its ninth day of sitting of the new government. We've had three disasters already. The first, uh, first day of sitting, we sat till two o'clock in the morning. We all know about the disaster of the first Friday sitting, and here we are on the ninth day of sitting, and we're already two hours late from what would be our normal time. So if the government can't actually manage the parliament, how do we expect it to manage the, uh, the $1.1 trillion economy of the state? But, uh, Mr Speaker, I speak tonight of a far more important uh, issue in my electorate, and that is the devastating impact of declining water access and quality on the Narang Peninsula. And to make it a bit easier for those opposite to understand where the Narang Peninsula is, is basically on the east side of Lake Alexandrina uh, in South Australia, uh, and uh, Meningi would be the nearest uh, uh, town of uh, some significance that they might understand where we're talking about. More than 40 farmers along the Narung Peninsula are facing going out of business this year um, as water in the lower lakes drops below sea level. In fact, uh, now it uh, as I believe it's about two feet below sea level, uh, and if it wasn't for the barrages uh, that were instituted um, some 80 or 90 years ago uh, along uh, the, uh, the area down there, uh, that whole area would be uh, immensely salty now. And this is a result of what's happening with the whole Murray-Darling Basin. Um, the problem not only is the saltiness of Lake Alexandrina and Lake Albert, which is a, um, what might be called an offshoot of Lake Alexandrina, um, we've also got uh, having uh, we, we actually have the problem of access to the water. Whereas in normal situations over the last 100 years, a simple pipe, not very far out, uh, often a few metres out, and they could access water for their stock and, in some cases, irrigation. Well. Irrigation basically hasn't been a possibility there for some time uh, due to the lack of water. We've now actually got farmers crawling out in silt uh, up to knee high, in some cases um, waist high, uh, up to three kilometres to, tr to try and get access to water for their stock uh, and also for their households. And in fact, um, many of them now have got no access to water and, and their uh, households or for their stock. So, as a result, um, they are losing uh, the ability to farm in that area. Carting water is an option for some landholders, uh, and they have been forced into that, but at $1,000 a day for freight and no emergency water carting, water carting assistance from the state government, most have been forced to drastically destock. Uh, and the fact is that it's very hard for them to live uh, if you haven't got water. You cannot live in a household without water. Several proposals have been submitted to state and federal governments on how to resolve the Lower Lakes issue, including a River Murray-Wellington Weir proposal and, most recently, to pipe water from Lake Alexandrina into Lake Albert. Now, this is robbing Peter the Pay Pool. Um, what that's going to achieve, I'm, I'm not sure. It won't actually achieve a better access to water. Uh, and in fact, it's going to have a detrimental effect on Lake Alexandrina. Not so long ago, we had about 22 quite large dairy farms on the, on the Narung Peninsula, and now there are only eight, and I suspect um, before long there will be zero. South Australia simply cannot afford to lose primary industry in this region. Last month, a month I met with 40 or more irrigators and farmers desperate to get some answers. They told me of having to take pipes 
uh, up to three kilometres offshore of Lake Albert and wade through these dangerous thigh-high silt to do so. Uh, unfortunately, the state Labor government and the federal uh, Labor government are not doing much about this at all. In fact, uh, when asked the, uh, the Minister for Climate Change, a uh, senator from that other place, said that she would not likely to uh, get to that area before the end of the year and, and uh, even then could not guarantee it, even though this is in her own state and a mere 150 kilometres away from Adelaide. So uh, Minister Wong's ignorance has resulted in Victoria gaining key concessions to the detriment of the management of the Murray-Darling Basin and, in particular, South Australia. Meanwhile, the Lower Lakes is in a desperate Order. plight. The medium flow. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise to speak uh, tonight on behalf of some of the wonderful volunteer groups within the electorate of Hindmarsh, which I represent. Um, I recently had the pleasure to hold a lunch in my electorate office in honour of some of these volunteers who freely give their time day in and day out to assist their peers and the wider Hindmarsh community. Uh, these individuals, Mr Speaker, are constantly devoting their spare time to others and the community groups they represent. These individuals include, include people such as uh, Pam Nader and Jean Lunig from the Lockley Senior Citizens Group, Betty and Malcolm Bollenhaven from the Active Elders Group and Rhonda Tully from the Australian Retirees and Pensioner Association from Glandor. Uh, I want to spend just a couple of moments uh, recognising the work that all of these wonderful individuals perform uh, on a daily basis. Firstly, the Bollenhagens give their time to support senior members of the Active Elders Association. They spend countless hours organising uh, uh, events, uh, they organise outings, they assist members in small projects around their houses. And uh, the Active Elders Association is also involved in a paper recycling program that is not only environmentally friendly, but it also raises uh, much needed funds for their association. And I've seen them all working tirelessly on uh, a few working bees that I've uh, had the pleasure to go and, uh, and visit on those days. Secondly, uh, Rhonda Tully, a magnificent woman who performs a similar role for the Australian Retirees and Pensioners Association at the Glandall Community Centre by raising funds and organising activities for the association's members. And finally, Pam Nader and Jean Lunig of the Lockley Senior Citizens. Uh, they run various projects for their members and have uh, devised an admirable program that unites young students from the Lockleys Primary School and a local nursing home, uh, bridging young and old. Projects such as these bring together individuals who may feel themselves socially isolated for a number of reasons and benefit from the social contact. Overall, volunteering all over Australia has contributed to the involvement of thousands of individuals in community-based activities. Now, volunteering brings together uh, individuals of all different backgrounds with diverse interests. The volunteers I've mentioned here today are only but a few of the many extraordinary individuals who come together to freely contribute their skills and time by helping others. And, uh, Mr Speaker, there is no doubt that as a society we rely on, uh, in fact, we rely very heavily on the economic and social contributions of these wonderful people who give their time freely and at no cost. At the moment, the work that volunteers contribute free of charge is worth billions of dollars to the South Australian economy. Volunteers keep the wheels on in a range of community and not-for-profit organisations, but it's not just the financial value of what you do that is so important. It's also the personal touch, um, which is of real value, the time taken to listen to someone's troubles, uh, the friendship in a smile or the generosity of spirit that comes with a cup of tea. Uh, and these are the things that you just cannot put a dollar value on. And it's uh, uh, these uh, small personal touches and the knowledge that you're changing or touching people's lives in very modest but very, very important ways. And these are the things that uh, keep these volunteers coming back to voluntary work, such as the people I mentioned earlier, week in, week out, year in and year out. The lunch that I mentioned in my electorate office was a small acknowledgement from my behalf of the tireless contribution of these people and of the uh, volunteer work that they do. Today I want to say that these individuals and all other volunteers within the Hindmarsh community, that they are the bedrock of the Hindmarsh community. Each of the small acts of generosity they carry out, however modest or simple, 
have laid the foundations for a stronger, better community. And I want to say that in my four years of being a federal member of parliament, I've greatly benefited from the wisdom, warmth and friendship of our older citizens. Uh, without the incredible number of volunteer hours that so many people contribute each and every week, not only would hundreds of organisations cease to exist, but the lives of thousands of South Australians would be substantially diminished. And, Mr Speaker, tonight I devoted this speech to those individuals like Pam Nade and Jean Lunig from the Lockley Senior Citizens Group, Betty and Malcolm Bollenhagen from the Active Elders, and Rhonda Tully from the Australian Retirees and Pensioners Association, and all the other volunteers around Australia who give their time to their, to the, uh, to their uh, areas and their communities. And I think we should all value and honour their contribution to the uh, Australian community and the efforts and the work that they put into caring for others and ensuring that they do their bit um, freely Order. of, uh, Order. Uh, freely the of uh, their time. The time has expired. The member for Groom. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm pleased to return to the parliament today and I come on the back of a very strong wave of community anger, uncertainty and fear from my electorate about the Rudd Labor government's refusal to rule out slashing the lump sum, pay lump sum payment to members of my community who need it most. Within the hours of the first reports last week of the Labor government's ruthless razor gang setting its sights on the $1,000 and $600 payments to carers, my office was inundated with calls from concerned locals. Mr Speaker, in the days since the phones have kept ringing, I've been sent emails, people have personally come into my office and I've been stopped in the street by people terrified that one of the major lifelines to them is about to be unceremoniously snatched away by an uncaring and inexperienced government. I'd like to be able to allay their fears, those of my constituents and their carers, but the shameful truth is that the Prime Minister, even today, uh, where the buck stops, has refused to provide any surety and clarity by failing to explicitly state his position on any future assistance for some of the most vulnerable and deserving members of our community. Mr Speaker, it's very well for the Prime Minister and his merry gang of axe-wielding budget slashes to speak of reviewing spending and keeping a close eye on inflationary pressures, but that is uh, something that should be done not at the cost of driving fear and uncertainty into the homes and hearts of the nations and of my electorate's hard-working carers. This is an unthinkable in fact, a shameful act. Perhaps the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance and Deregulation should cut back on their clandestine and conspiratorial gatherings where new targets are primed for the Razor Gang and instead rejoin the real world where carers do unending work 24-7 uh, to the good of not only their close friends and relatives but to the community. Yeah. Mr Speaker, perhaps those who don't value carers in this community, like the Prime Minister, should speak to the people in their own electorates and judge for themselves whether funding for carers is as expendable as uh, the Prime Minister would like to think. My electorate has a very large group of carers, many of whom come together in fellowship of support at community gatherings. I have been able to visit some of these and I have heard firsthand their stories. I'm in no doubt that the bonus to recipients of carers' payments and allowances is well deserved and a vital supplement for the household budgets where a family member is in need of permanent care. Mr Speaker, it is especially so for those carers who perform their duties with unassuming anonymity. These are people who give up their time and sometimes their careers and social networks to care for family members, whether it be their parents, their children or members of their extended family. They are people who perform their duties without expectation of reward or recognition, and often many people in the community may not even be aware of their extra responsibilities. But just as their work is done away from the public spotlight, that does not mean that carers' needs should be swept aside by this callous government. Carers give their time in the fair belief that they will not be left scrambling to feed or clothe or support themselves or their loved ones. This is exactly what this government has done by creating uncertainty about future funding arrangements. The Prime Minister has created an environment of unease in which carers and now seniors are left wondering what their futures will hold. 
These question marks are adding unnecessarily to the stresses of households that already have more than their fair share of pressures. There can be no taking back the, uh, up, the emotional upheaval of the Rudd Labor government and what it has inflicted on these families in the past few days, but at the very least, the Prime Minister should bring this cruel guessing game to an end. Here, here. The member for Carrio. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. The love that a parent provides for their child is about as fundamental to the human condition as it gets. A sense of self-worth is about as important a gift as any parent can give to their child, and providing security to their children is the most important obligation that any parent has. These three things, Mr Speaker, love, worth and security, are at the essence of a healthy childhood. They are the building blocks of a life. And yet for half a million Australians who grew up as wards of the state, in children's orphanages, in children's homes and in other institutions, these three things, love, worth and security, were denied. And this represents for them an unimaginable abuse. This abuse did not start with the state. It started with parents, either through neglect or circumstance, who were not able to provide for their children, or perhaps for the worst form of circumstance, where there were no parents in the first place. For Leonie Sheedy, who was born in 1954, it was a case of her mother having left the home, her father being unable to cope with four young children, which led herself and her two older sisters and later her younger brother to grow up in the St Catherine's Orphanage in Geelong. Large institutions looking after wards of the state, people without parental advocacy, are by their very nature, or were by their very nature, harsh places to grow up. Parental love could not be provided across 100 kids. Self-worth was a distant concept, and these places were not secure. Indeed, they were places where abuse could happen, and it did. For Leone, she was not the victim of any physical or sexual abuse, but she did shed the tears of pain of separation from her parents and ultimately her two older sisters, who both left the orphanage at different times while she was there. Whatever all of that meant for the children who grew up there in their later adult lives, and the consequences have been many, drug dependence, depression, family breakdown, homelessness, prostitution and suicide, their scars are only matched by the scars upon our own nation. Because ultimately, as a society, we are not judged by the tallness of our buildings or the wealth of our richest. Rather, we are judged by the care that we provide to our most vulnerable. And there are no more vulnerable than orphan children, and in their case, we did not provide enough care. This is a very difficult issue. There was no malice of intent here in terms of the public policy. Indeed, to this day, we still remove children from their parents where there is serious risk and it's right to do that. But there are two ways in which public policy in those days did fail the people who grew up in institutional care. Firstly, the threshold for removing people from their parents then was far lower than what it is now. The significance of family relationships in the development of a person was not understood in the way that it is now. And secondly, putting these kids into large institutions was a recipe for disaster. That public policy has now changed is the very reason why these people should now be acknowledged. Leonie Sheedy went on to become instrumental in the Care Leaves of Australia Network, CLAN, and through her courage and determination, and the determination of many involved in CLAN, there was the agitation for the Senate inquiry which ultimately led to the forgotten Australian report. Senator Andrew Murray who himself was a Fairbridge child migrant, has been the main advocate for the forgotten Australians in this parliament. And of course, Senator Murray's term in this parliament will expire in the middle of this year. And so Clan have approached me to be the new advocate in this parliament on their behalf, a job that I take as one with giving great responsibility and indeed for me a great sense of privilege. The reason I was approached was because Geelong had an unusually large number of orphanages in the area, indeed the largest of any centre outside a capital city. And so as a result, 
there are a large number of forgotten Australians who are now constituents in the electorate of Corio. And while I will not be able to match the advocacy of Senator Murray in this parliament, born of deep personal experience on his part, I do hope that I can play some role in ensuring that the forgotten Australians are properly remembered. The question is the House to now adjourn. The member for Gray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I rise to my feet this evening to try and bring to this House and the people of Australia a, uh, an unfortunate byproduct of what I think was um, a very well-meaning decision um, by, uh, by FISANS, the uh, Food Standards Australia in New Zealand. Um, the, the decision by FISANS for the um, a mandatory addition of folic acid to um, bread making flour from the 13th of September 2009 has been planned for all the right reasons and the best intentions with the aim of reducing neural tube defects which affect around 900 pregnancies a year. Neural tube defects causes conditions such as spina bifida and encephaly, horrific debilitating diseases which all of us um, would, would, would do anything we could to reduce and to abolish if possible. However, it has been brought to my notice by a small mill in my electorate and uh, a flour mill and the Flour Millers Association of Australia that the, uh, the industry has severe doubts about its ability to deliver on the technical, uh, technical requirements of this addition. The, um, the specifications are that two milligrams per kilogram of folic acid between two and three milligrams. There is, a, there is a minimum amount and a maximum amount which should be delivered into this flour mix. And it was deemed that uh, because um, we are already adding thiamine to, to bread flour at a rate of 6.4 milligrams per kilogram, it was deemed that uh, it would be easy to add it into this mix and, uh, and uh, that all would be pretty much right. But the unfortunate thing is with thiamine there is no upper limit. And the flour millers tell me that uh, in the ease of application, because there is no damage with, with adding too much thiamine, they, um, they always add a bit extra. And in the, uh, in the, in the process of flour making, uh, there is often overruns, there's, there's misbatches, there's things which don't quite measure up to specky, so they blend those back into the overall flour mix. Now, if you've already added your thiamine and then it comes back at nine milligrams per kilogram, it's not going to be detrimental to anyone, probably doing more good than harm. But in the case of folic acid, if you, if you follow this process, um, you will find that you go over the three milligrams per kilogram. And there is some medical evidence around that this is indeed a harmful rate of folic acid. So um, the Flour Millers Association was asked to respond to the committee as into what the application costs of this would be. And uh, they felt as though they were a little rushed at the time and didn't fully understand the implications of it themselves. They, uh, they come up with figures um, which come, amount to about half a million dollars per flour mill. Um, and even if that is feasible, that means there's a very uneven impact because there are some very large flour mills in Australia. There's about 28 in this scoping study. And then at the very other end of the agenda, there is this flour mill in my electorate, which is the smallest in Australia and produces about five tonne of flour an hour. Now, the Cummins flour mill, situated in Cummins on Southern Air Peninsula, a 77-year-old family company, um, as I said, producing five tonne an hour, with a, employing eight people in this small community, uh, the estimated cost, should this even be technically feasible, is around about $150 per tonne of flour. Now that's going to put them right out of the market, and uh, the uh, manager, owner manager there, tells me that uh, if he has to raise the price of his flour by $150, that will be the end of them. Now Cummins uh, is a is a, in an EC declared area. Uh, it's had bushfires in that area of Southern Air Peninsula, and and I would be the first to admit this should not impinge on on a decision on, on, on public health, but it, but, it, but it is a difficult situation. Um, I'm advised there are as many, nine, as many as nine mills in Australia as classified as small, which will be, uh, which will be affected by this legislation. But what the, um, what the uh, Flour Millers Association of Australia is, is seeking at the moment is a 12-month is a um, um, moratorium on the, on the implementation of this, while a full review takes, takes place. And I think this is probably not an unreasonable request. On top of that, um, 
There is some evidence coming out which uh, the flour millers have all, all also brought to my association, uh, to my attention. I mean, uh, that um, the industry is pointing to the United Kingdom government's deferment of a decision on the mandatory addition of folic acid following conflicting reports on its health benefits, including links to uh, colorectal cancer. Now, I am in no position to comment on the, on the, the, the veracity of these claims, but. I think uh, in the light of the fact that uh, this appears to have some severe economic ramifications, certainly an unintended consequence uh, for these very small Order. mills, that it's, it's probably the a fair request. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Member for Blaxlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise tonight to welcome the implementation of two important election commitments that will assist the people of Blaxlin, the re-establishment of the Commonwealth Dental Program and the establishment of the Teen Dental Program. They are two steps in a long journey that will improve the dental health of our community. There is no clearer indicator of socio-economic status in Australia than the state of people's teeth. They're not my words. They're the words of Tony Vinson, the CEO of the Health Issues Centre. They're words that ring true, particularly in the electorate of Blaxlin, and they ring loud and clear because of the neglect of the last decade. A recent study by the National Advisory Committee on Oral Health found that children in low socioeconomic groups experience twice as many incidences of tooth decay as those in high socioeconomic groups. In the decade since the Howard government abolished the Commonwealth Dental Program, the public dental waiting list has skyrocketed from 380,000 to 650,000. Average waiting times have increased fourfold, from six months to 27 months and hospitalisation rates for children under five with severe dental problems have increased by 91 per cent. Mr Speaker, our public dental health system is ailing. Last week I toured Westmead Dental Hospital in Sydney's west and met with dentists at the coalface of the crisis. Under the Howard government's watch, the dental workforce has been allowed to run critically short. By 2010, there will be a shortfall of 1,500 dental staff in our public system. Only 10 per cent of the dental workforce is in the public system, but they're required to treat almost half of the dental population. Their task is made more difficult because they're also treating those with the most severe and complicated problems. Mr Speaker, in its first 100 days, the Rudd government has introduced two new programs to start addressing the crisis in dental health. In 11 years, the Howard government introduced one program and only expanded it in its dying days the dying days of a government fearing electoral defeat. The Rudd government's programs will allocate half a billion dollars over three years. Over the same period, the Howard government's program only paid out $2.6 million. That's half a billion dollars compared with $2.6 million. The difference in dollars and the difference between the two parties is stark. The re-establishment of the Commonwealth Dental Program means many more people will now have access to dental health people like Michael Cross. I met Michael during the election campaign. He had been waiting since July 2004 for a set of dentures. 30 per cent of Australians cannot afford the cost of private dental care, and Michael is one of them. He has been forced to wait with 650,000 other Australians on the public dental waiting list. Michael told me that life without a set of decent teeth has been very tough. It affects his ability to eat and make friends. I brought his plight to the attention of the local media and we've been able to get him a new set of dentures. He tells me they've changed his life. People want to talk to him. Mr Speaker, there are a lot more Michael Crosses out there. The sad story of dental neglect starts young in my electorate. A few weeks ago I visited Old Guildford Public School. The principal tells me that during a, nat a nationwide school dental audit she was handed a list of names of children who needed urgent dental care. The list was three pages long. Twenty children on the list needed to go under general anaesthetic to have their teeth fixed. The principal, Kay Campbell, asked the dental nurse if these children were in pain. The dental nurse told her they are far beyond pain, children as young as five years old. In my first speech, I told the House I believe education is the great equaliser in an unequal world. But it's hard to concentrate in a classroom when you've got a toothache or an abscess. In the last 10 years, the rate of tooth decay amongst five-year-olds has jumped 21 per cent. The Howard government failed these children. Our job is to help them. Our dental health system needs a government with vision, a government that understands real health and social benefits of investing in dental care. 
I'm pleased to see the Rudd government is heading in that direction. The place to start is with prevention, a healthy kids check when kids start school and the teen dental program. The objectives are worthy, but the test of all good policy is not in their design but in the outcomes they produce. How many Michael Crosses it helps. How many children at Old, Old Guildford Public School will need urgent dental care in five years' time. We can make a difference for places like Blacksland, we can educate our children and we can make sure they are healthy enough to be educated. Thank you. Order. The question is the House to now adjourn. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 9am tomorrow.